Okay, so don't put that ugly face in there. I know. Yeah. Let's see your ugly face instead. So what we can also do is give you headphones. So that you, that's your camera. All these other people are going to be talking. That's you going to be talking. And then we got headphones right here. I probably ought to have the headphones. You can probably hear better at the headphones too. I <laughs> can. So what do I do? I just wait for her now? Just wait. The meeting isn't starting. It's just like a regular meeting. Yeah, but didn't she say she had to do something? I don't know what she said, but you're good. This is the meeting. You want some cereal or anything while you wait? Well, I'm thinking about it. Are we some cereal? I'll get it, yeah. How do I know when they're going to call me? They're not going to call you. They're just going to start the meeting at 930. So you're live right now. Everything's good. Let me make sure. Everything's good. God, I wish I could do something. Shit. Let me just say In detail. Each commentator will be called by name. Are you a commentator? Yeah. Okay. And given three minutes by timer to comment. Oh, yeah. Huh. What is, what's wrong? So they're saying once you get done with your... God, this is fucking stupid. They're saying once you get done, once, once your comment is complete, yeah. they ask that you disconnect from the Zoom meetings. So, see, they don't want... Excuse me, Michael? Normal. Just to let you know, your mic is on. Yeah. You might want to mute yeah. yourself. You're doing the YouTube live stream and continue to watch. So I go up there and disconnect at the X, right? Um, so this. File a complaint. No, it's not file. You're going to watch this. Watch open meeting. Today's the eighth, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh Look at me, two pandejos. The baddest. <laughs> so, maybe I should take off. They don't have themselves on mute. Very working, man. So, when, when, um, when you're when you're done speaking, where is this I don't, know. I don't care to hear the rest of the meeting. Oh, you don't hear it? Okay. Because it's going to be in the paper tomorrow. Where, okay, where is you? Okay, if you don't care, then we're good. If you do care, if they tell you to disconnect, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to disconnect. But if they tell you to disconnect, you hit that X there. Yeah. And if you want to keep watching it after you disconnect, you go to that tab right there. And there's okay. the line. Does that God. make sense? Yeah, you kids with these computers. What is that noise? That's you and me talking like a minute ago. Oh. I have no idea why that's going. So I sit here and wait. Yeah. I guess that's the commissioner deals or something. I guess. And how do I know this whole thing will light up? It'll be different people. And then uh, they call my name. They'll call your name. Yeah. Is the headphones working? You want me to get volume up? No, the volume's good, I think. Can you hear? Yeah. The, the YouTube channel is fucking us up. It's, it's videoing us for like a minute ago. I think that's going to fuck you up, to be honest. It is? I think it's like a minute. I think it's like a minute previous feedback. You don't want to watch the meeting anyway, right? Pardon me? You don't want to watch the meeting anyway, right? No. 
afterward. Okay, if you don't want to watch the meeting. I think there's a feedback loop. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got to I got to go out and work on a house. I know. I came up with an easier way to plumb that thing. Really? Yep. The vanity? Yep. Take that top off, take it out in the living room and plumb it out there on a sawhorse or something. How about now? Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Hello. Good morning. I'm going to mute you um, until it's your turn to speak. Okay. Thank you. I just wait. Yes. Until you're called on by name. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, well, how much you. time are we talking roughly? <clears throat> because we've had so many people sign up, I believe that the chairman is going to announce that you have one minute to speak. One minute instead of three? Yes, sir. Oh boy. Okay. How much time okay. we are we how much time is it before I'm waiting roughly? Um, well, the meeting will start at 9:30 and public comments will start shortly thereafter. We have quite a few people signed up, so it depends on where you fall on the list. Okay. I thank okay. you for your time. Thank you. Me. She's telling this other guy that he has one minute to speak. Beg your pardon? Can you cut these down if you need to? Yeah. Hello, Sarah Valencia. Good morning, Mr. Grogan. Good morning. Can you tell me how much time I have to speak? Yes, sir. As I was just telling the other gentleman. Um, feel, okay, hold on. We're going to have a, Come in, an sir. announcement. Come in, hold on. Let me. Because there's so many people um, that have signed up for comment. So, um, I believe that everything's going to be limited to one minute. I just sent out an email to I'm everyone ready. who signed up for public comment. Whoa, I've got my ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Testing one, two, three.
see, I know, you know, not to, you wouldn't, you know, but hopefully there's not a way to accidentally do anything, but right and can show you the program you can do that. Uh -huh. So yesterday really burned me out, and I, I, today I kind of freed up my schedule just to catch up on some other things. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is June. Good morning. Good morning, June. Do we have all commissioners here? I don't know, but I'm here. All right, the important ones are here. <laughs> Okay, Jeff, you're saying we can all leave, you'll handle it? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> if you can split into three, you could be a quorum. Steve. There's enough of me to do that. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's too self-deprecating. Come on. <laughs> uh <clears throat> Aguilar, are you here? Yep, maybe not. <clears throat> I'm going to give it one more minute and then uh, we'll get started. I believe Commissioner Vicente Aguilar is on. Oh, okay. She may be muted. Commissioner, are you going to talk to me? Sarah, did you mute her accidentally? <clears throat> So we're gonna get I this may have accidentally treatment today. There she is. Mr. Charman, can you oh. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we can now. Mm. Welcome everybody to a momentous day and a very busy one. And um, Mike, would you please uh, the meeting's called to order and Mike, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Hall. Here. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Here. Commissioner Fishman. Here. Commissioner Bird. Still present. Commissioner Maestas. I'm here. We have five commissioners present that constitutes a quorum for purposes of the Open Meeting Act and taking action. 
Okay. Um, Mike, I'm going to give you the Pledge of Allegiance again because you flubbed up a little last time and you need practice. <laughs> so we're going to go, remember the word under God visible. Indivisible. See, I gave you some coaching. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the republic, republic. Stands. one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible and with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. I salute the flag. I salute the flag of the state of New Mexico, Zia symbol of perfect friendship among united cultures. I think that's it all, right? Thank you, Michael. Well done. <laughs> I was waiting for the praise. <laughs> and what I said, well done. Fine job. <laughs> Other commissions, would you please Outstanding. Weigh in? Okay. Yeah, we knew an attorney could get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you're back in the fold. Uh, consideration and approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Mike, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Bird. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. The agenda is approved by a vote of five to zero. Um, so we're on to presentation and discussion of the fiscal 21 audit. Uh, um, and um, I guess we should go to our chief of staff to kind of lead this. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. It's nice to see everybody this morning. Uh, I'm gonna turn it all over to the uh, commission's uh, external auditor, uh, here in just a second, uh, Zlotnick and Sandoval. Uh, as the commission knows, uh, our FY21 audit was recently uh, completed by uh, the audit firm. And uh, this is the time of year when we generally present, present the results of uh, the audit to the commission and any, any findings uh, from our FY21 uh, audit. So with that, I think I saw a ban on earlier not sure who else is here, but uh, I'll turn it over to them to, to go through uh, uh, the document and uh, the results of our, of our most recent audit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Rick Sandoval from Zlotnick Laws and Sandoval, or Zlotnick and Sandoval, sorry. And uh, we were the auditors for the audit of the PRC for the fiscal year ended June 30. 2021, uh, the audit was completed timely and the uh, state auditor has released the report. So that's the reason why we're here today to discuss the results of the audit. What I wanna do is I understand that the commission uh, members have all received a copy of the report. I'm gonna highlight uh, some things and, and make the required communications that we have to share with you by standard. First off, what I wanna say is, obviously the PRC is responsible for a system of internal control that allows for it to be able to record and report the financial activity of the commission. And with that, uh, when we do an audit, we check in on that. our internal control structure and then there. we decide whether we uh, want to look at individual transactions or whether we want to look at a sample of transactions. So the financial statements that in this report and the related footnotes are the responsibility of the management uh, of the PRC. Uh, we did, as part of our service, assist the staff in publishing this report. However, it's important to note that the responsibility is with the management. As uh, auditors, we have the responsibility of issuing an opinion on the financial statements. 
And the opinion is based on our work, uh, based on the audit evidence that we gather. Um, we look at, as I indicated earlier, your internal control system. And we use that for planning the audit. <clears throat> okay. Richard, you're on mute. Sorry, I I guess maybe somebody muted me. Did you did you hear anything I said? <laughs> we lost you for about 30 seconds there. Okay. So what I was saying is we have the responsibility of issuing uh, an opinion on the financial statements. And that opinion is the page you're looking at there. And again, what we do is we provide reasonable assurance on the balances that are reported by the PRC. And the reason I say reasonable is because we don't look at 100% of the transactions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you, if you heard that, uh, we take a sample of transactions or we may look at account balances that are maintained by the PRC. Your responsibility as management and ultimately the commission is to maintain a system where the reporting of the financial activity of the PRC can be relied on. And that's what we use in our audit testing. And as a result, we issue this report and issue an opinion. The opinion is unmodified. In other words, we're reporting that the numbers present fairly the financial position of the PRC and the financial activity for the year. The additional um, reports that we issue, the second one is on the internal control system, and that is on page 54. So, if you can scroll down to that, that is a report on our consideration of the internal control system. We don't issue an opinion on it. All we're saying is we considered your checks and balances to help plan the audit and to do our work. And we're gonna to get to that here pretty soon. So we don't issue any assurance on the internal control system. That's a whole other, um, engagement, but we do consider how you do business in order to allow us to plan for the audit. So as a result of doing um, assessment of your internal control structure, we do have some issues that come up during the audit. And this is the report here that I mentioned. Again, it's our consideration of the internal control system. We're not giving you an opinion on the internal controls that you have in place. What we have is we consider it, if we come across transactions that we believe uh, have to be reported to you, then those are communicated in the form of a finding. And in this case, <clears throat> we did have some internal control issues and other matters that are required to be reported. What I'd like to do uh, as you're scrolling down, if you'll hold there for just a minute, there's actually a summary of the audit results that begin on page 59. So if you'll go down to page 59, it's a good summary of what I've been talking about. If you'll stop right there. It's, it's called findings and question costs, and it basically breaks it down into several sections. That first section under the financial statements is what I had mentioned earlier, that first report we looked at, the auditor's report on the financial statements is unmodified, okay? In terms of looking at the internal control, uh, we didn't find any material weaknesses. There were no significant deficiencies that were identified and we didn't have any material non-compliance. In other words, something that would have a financial impact on the financial statements of the PRC. Because we did uh, conduct a single audit, because you receive federal awards, there is an additional report that we issue related to the work that we did 
on the federal grants. And the type of report issued on that is uh, a non-modified report. In other words, what we're saying is that you complied with the requirements of the grant in all material respects. There were no findings related to the federal awards. Um, and you'll note that following the middle of the page there, the audit findings under the Code of Federal Regulations, we didn't have any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies related to your process or federal awards. We also didn't have any material non-compliance related to those federal awards. Uh, no known or question costs related to the, to the federal grants and no likely uh, or known fraud. Uh, and those are noted uh, A through H there. The uh, major programs that we look at are basically the pipeline safety program and the threshold for those programs are, is 750,000. So it did qualify for us to look at a single audit and take that approach. This next page you're looking at is a summary of findings. The headings across the top basically tell you uh, the status of any prior year findings, and then the headings uh, describe whether there are significant deficiencies, material weaknesses, material noncompliance, and then other noncompliance and other matters. And you'll see an X next to those that we reported, meaning that they were limited to other non-compliance issues or other matter issues. Last year, uh, right under the prior year findings heading, uh, so we had a standby time finding that was resolved this year. The payroll files finding was resolved. The monitoring of cell phone, again, that is a PRC policy. Uh, that has been repeated. And you'll note that it's listed under other matters. Procurement violation, that again is repeated and modified. Uh, and we'll highlight that here in a minute. That is considered an other non-compliance issue. Mr. Sandoval, this is Commissioner Hall. Yes, sir. I was just wondering if you could make that uh, document appear a little. Oh, never mind. I fixed it. Thank you. Never mind. I apologize for interrupting. Not a problem. The uh, Public Money Act uh, that had to do with making sure the deposits were uh, in the bank or the state treasurer within a 24 hour period. That uh, the timeliness of the reversion back to DFA that was resolved. Uh, Commissioner Travel that was resolved. So a lot of action was taken on those, which is a good sign. And then the capital asset disposition, again, this is having your uh, furniture, fixtures, uh, the fleet of vehicles, all of those. <clears throat> um, there was still an issue with that. That's repeated and modified. And then the refunds of travel advances, that was resolved. And also the grant tracking uh, was resolved. Um, the current year, we had one that was new and it has to do with the temporary salary increase um, that was essentially paid. This but is it unbelievable. Didn't... Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so the current year finding was a temporary salary increase that we believe uh, should have gone before the commission for approval. Um, and that's, that was our recommendation. So if we can scroll down to the, the first finding, um, again, I'm gonna highlight, I've kind of highlighted what these uh, involved. In the particular case that caused this to be a repeat finding, uh, it had to do with uh, payments to academy instructors Basically, DFA requires that if you pay someone over 5,000 for the year, that there be a contract uh, uh, basically drafted for that. Uh, the staff didn't anticipate that it was gonna cost that much, uh, but it did. 
And our recommendation is that anytime you enter into that kind of an arrangement that um, you have a contract, if it's anticipated, that cost will exceed 5,000. The responses from management are included. Um, if you've had a chance to view those, they're at the bottom of each finding. If we can go to the next page, please. The capital asset disposition again, uh, the staff is working with the contractor, Duff and Phelps, to get that asset listing updated and purging any items that they can't find. Um, and this was an issue last year. That's still a work in progress. Uh, the staff is still working with the contractor to get that asset uh, listing cleaned up. And that's the reason why this was a repeat finding. If we can go to the next page, the cell phone, uh, again, uh, it, you have a policy that says you will monitor cell phones. We didn't find any evidence that that was happening. And I guess our recommendation is that you either do the monitoring or um, if it's gonna cost more than, than the benefit you gain from doing it, then we uh, ask that maybe you consider revising your policy. So uh, that's what that audit uh, finding covers. If we can go to the next page, please. This is the temporary salary increase um, where we had an individual that was basically had different duties uh, within the PRC. Uh, the attempt to give this temporary increase was to compensate the individual for taking on other duties. Um, and again, the issue was that we believe it should have gone before the commission for approval and we didn't have any evidence that that had happened. So that essentially covers the audit uh, findings and what came out of the um, audit in terms of internal control issues. Um, again, based on the summary of findings that we just went over earlier, you'll note that uh, the PRC did make uh, significant progress in clearing up those prior year findings. And we believe that some of the issues we've spoke about, um, you're able to address those and get them cleared up as well. In terms of uh, the actual environment in which we worked in, obviously we did um, a significant amount of work remotely. We did have access to records and uh, the staff was very helpful in being responsive uh, to our inquiries. Uh, one of the things that we do at the end of the audit is we have management provide a management representation letter. And in that letter, it basically covers the issues I spoke about, that you maintain a system uh, to be in compliance with laws and regulations, that you have a system in place to be able <clears throat> component to uh, be able to provide these financial statements at the end of the year. And uh, we did receive that letter. And <clears throat> basically it says that you provided all that we asked for. And if it, if there were issues that came up that had audit uh, impact, you shared those with us. So we thank the staff for being helpful and being responsive uh, in order to get the audit done on a timely basis. Uh, with that, that's kind of a, a highlighted summary of the results of the audit. I stand for questions if you have any. Um, Carl, this is Steve, the chair. Uh, could you put yourself on mute? We're getting some sounds through your speaker there. And, um, yeah, with that, um, commissioners, do you have questions, comments? Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Bird. Thank you. Um, so on the one issue with the temporary salary increase, that was approved by the commissioners in a closed executive session. So you would not have public record of that occurring. Because it was a, it was an employee 
issue, we did it in closed session. Mr. Chairman, I and members of the commission, we're happy to go back and take a look at the agendas again. I don't, I don't think we we were able to identify that on any commission agenda, uh, but we're happy to, to take a look at that. But and uh, Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, but any action taken in executive session needs to be disclosed when the commission. My understanding needs to be disclosed when the commission comes out of executive session. So uh, <clears throat> we'll go back, uh, Commissioner Byrd, and, and look at the minutes again. And as, as I said, look at the agenda, but we weren't able to identify any commission action on that temporary salary increase. And it was a retroactive uh, temporary salary increase. I think the temporary salary increase may have been uh, acted on by the commission, but Mr. Sandoval can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the issue with the audit finding uh, was that subsequently uh, we went back and kind of uh, backdated that temporary salary increase, and that was not approved by the commission. That is correct. It's that backdating that was the issue identified in the audit. Okay, and that may be. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Props. You're welcome, Commissioner. Thank you. Whoops. That was it for Mr. me, Mr. Chair. Okay. Other commissioners? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Besante Aguilar. On the same issue that Commissioner Bird spoke of, um, I would like the chief of staff to contact the commissioners individually because um, we can't disclose confidential information, but if you can please give us a call individually, that, that way we have a clear understanding. Thank you. Yeah, you have to do that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay, other commissioners? Um, I have a comment. First of all, um, I'd like to um, thank Annette Reynolds, um, you know, who's been around this last year and uh, has been responsible for a lot of the accounting and uh, want to be sure she gets credit for all the things that we've improved and, and fixed uh, from the last audit. And uh, Richard, uh, you and your folks as auditors are great because you're collaborative and it's all about improving. And we really appreciate your constructive approach. Um, and also, um, our, I want to say thanks to our former interim chief of staff, Jason Montoya, who obviously for much of that time was, was supervising in that. And um, I just want to be sure um, our folks on staff get credit for the, the good work that they've done um, and uh, uh, and for their willingness to collaborate with our auditors along the way. Um, any other comments from the commission? Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner Maestas. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Richard. Um, no specific comments, only general comments. I'm you know, I'm really proud of the significant progress that we've made uh, since the last audit. Uh, so this is, I think, a remarkable uh, turnaround in addressing a lot of the previous findings and any recurring findings that have uh, no longer continued. And so I, I think this is part of our combined effort to improve this agency. And uh, when it comes time to handing it over to our replacements, the appointees, uh, this this agency will be uh, will be in better shape, uh, and I think ensuring that the agency is an effective steward of uh, public monies I think is a big plus going forward. So um, I, I want to thank the you know kind of the current administration and the previous administration, but this is really really good news and a great way to start off this meeting. So that's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hall, did you have something? 
Well, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to also uh, state that this is this is a a much improved um, report than we had uh, last time, and I I really wanted to commend staff and everyone who was involved uh, with the uh, improvements of our of our. Uh, of our agency and certainly uh, the chief of staff and people who work with them and uh, everybody who's just trying to uh, improve their performance. So I am proud of our agency too. And I, I, uh, I'm i glad we'll be able to, uh, I, things like this make me feel that we will be able to hand over a much improved agency to the new commission. So thank you. Okay, um, Wayne, do you want to wrap up uh, Wayne and Richard for us? Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Commissioner, just uh, thank you for those comments. Appreciate them very much. Uh, Commissioner Fishman, certainly echo your appreciation for all the hard work that Annette uh, has done on our audit, particularly over the last year. It, mm -hmm. it has been a collaborative effort and I uh, want to thank uh, Zlotnik and, and Sandoval they're very good to work with as well. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate that collaborative spirit and we'll continue it. Thank you, Ms. Joan. Okay. And just one final comment. Uh, though you were only there for a short time of that year, of, of the fiscal year, um, uh, you and um, Renata have been obviously working with the auditors to get to this report. So I want to be sure to say thank you to both you and Renata for uh, kind of bringing the whole process home. And um, uh, thank you, Richard. It's always a pleasure working with you and uh, improving with you. Thanks. Yes, and thank you folks for the opportunity to be of service to the PRC. Okay, um, we're on to public comment and um, we have um, 39, I'm told by Sarah, uh, 39 folks who wanted to comment. For all I know, it's grown. Um, but I, uh, we do have certain rules uh, and procedures around public comment. Um, and we're gonna have to make some adjustments today. So uh, Mike, um, would you please take us through the rules just so everybody knows what they are and that when we make modifications, we're not, uh, uh, we're being as fair as we possibly can. Mr. Chair, uh, this is Sarah. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mike. Um, I just wanted to let you know, the record button was pushed earlier, but my computer just blinked and it looks like it came off. So I'm gonna try to hit record again. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, Mike, uh, walk us through the public comment rules. So Mr. Chairman, commissioners, for, the, for purposes of the public uh, information, the commission adopts an open meeting policy uh, in accordance with the Open Meetings Act um, at the beginning of each, of each calendar year. Um, and so the open meeting policy that was adopted by the commission for 2021, um, and it's pretty much substantially, changed, substantially the same as it has been for a number of years has a provision that addresses public comment and specific to the issue that we're talking about today, which is um, the need to accommodate uh, the public's interest in providing uh, public comment and the ability to conduct this meeting and get it done today. Um, we have a provision that says, and I'll read it, it states that the portion of the agenda allocated for public comment at any one open meeting shall be limited to a maximum of 30 minutes for all persons wishing to provide comment. The order of speakers will be based on the order in which speakers sign up, but public officials may be taken out of order. If a speaker is not present at the time he or she is called to provide comment, that speaker shall forfeit their opportunity to speak. Public comment by an individual or entity shall be, shall be limited to no more than three minutes unless the commission acts to extend the period. If the number of individuals on the sign-up sheet desiring to provide comment would exceed the allocated 30-minute period, the chairperson may limit individual remarks to a shorter time period. 
individuals represented, represented by or representing a common organization or association may be asked to select one individual to act as spokesperson to speak for the group. Individuals who sign up to comment either fail to do so or choose to speak for less than their allotted time may not cede or yield their time to another speaker. Written comments of individuals who cannot be physically present may not be read aloud at the meeting, but may be submitted to the commission. I would also uh, point out so um, ahead of time that if any of the proposed commenters who have signed up are parties to the action, to the to the actions that are in front of the commission, the cases, um, they are prohibited from providing public comment. And that's because obviously they have an opportunity to present their case through the uh, case proceedings. Um, so with that in mind, um, the commission has the ability to adjust um, its normal practice uh, to provide for um, a different uh, period of time uh, for public comment to be provided. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I think you're muted. Thanks, Michael. Um, so what I'd like to do today, given the uh, long agenda we have today, um, I'd like to limit public comments. I will limit public comments to one minute. Um, I know that's hard, but just get to the core of your message as, as best you can. And um, uh, we'll work with that one minute timing and I will be very firm about cutting you off. Uh, Sarah, you're gonna get the clock on the screen so people can see how they're doing? Yes, Mr. Chair, I have that ready to go. Okay, terrific. So with that, let's, uh, let's get started. Okay, and um, I just had one other request. If everybody could stay muted until it's your turn to speak so that there's no disruption um, since it is a, small, a shorter time period, that would be really helpful. So you'll hear this when your time is up. And um, did everybody hear that? I don't know. Oh. Okay, well, I guess you'll just see the clock counting down and I'll hear the noise. Um, <clears throat> so I'll let you know. Um, the first person that we have is Ralph Arianis. Are you on the call? Okay. Next is Bobby Basold. Bobby, are you on the call? I am. Okay, go ahead. Um, my name is Bobby Basold. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I am a rate payer with PM. And um, I do not support the merger. I want to begin with that. Um, however, I have a few issues that came up um, recently because uh, my husband and I are working with an electrician, and the electrician said that. Um, the merger is already a done deal, and he was told this um, at a meeting um, some time ago. He also told us that um, all of his calls to PM are being rerouted to Cincinnati, Ohio, and, um, and also that a number of engineers have been forced into early retirement. And I'm extremely concerned about this, and I, um, you know, this is not. Uh, public record. This is just something that is kind of under the radar. So I ask you again to oppose the merger on the grounds that this is a greed based company corporation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Um, and Sarah, let's go on. Yes, sir. the next person is Darren Lewis. Darren, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Okay, you have one minute. Thank you very much. Uh, I first want to start off by saying that uh, I am definitely opposed to this merger. I'm a professional services financial advisor in the uh, Albuquerque area from District 1, and I represent myself and several small business owners. There is serious concern amongst the, many of the small business owners that this is going to be a monopolistic situation that is going to take over 
and do nothing but create an, an more enormous amount of confusion, frustration, and financial burden upon sm the small businesses who, who have already experienced and suffered an enormous amount uh, against the, the odds over the last couple of years. Finally, I, I want to say this. We have the resources on our own. We have the resources of R&D. We have the resources of being able to continue to do and provide the services that we need from, from an eco-environmental standpoint. And I implore this commission to please not let a monopoly take over and control us. Thank you. How do I keep getting muted? Anyway, thank you. And um, uh, Sarah, next up. Yes. Next up is <clears throat> Andrew Cloutier, if he's still on the call. Andrew, are you there? I am here, thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, uh, members of the commission. Thank you for your op the opportunity to comment. I'm a Roswell lawyer. I represent KWAL Inc., which owns a ranch directly south of Klein's Corners. Uh, if the commission is inclined to allow Avangrid to present additional evidence, we would request the courtesy of being able to present evidence as well. Avangrid leased lands directly west of my client's ranch to build its power lines. We believe we have significant, important evidence that reflects that Avangrid is not a good neighbor and would not be a good corporate citizen in New Mexico. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And commenters, thank you for uh, adhering to the time limits. You're doing great. Sarah? <clears throat> Next up, we have Ms. Janice Wright. Janice, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Thank you. Great. You have uh, one minute. Okay, good morning. I have lived in New Mexico for most of my life. I support the PNM Oven Grid merger. I feel with Oven Grid's knowledge and investment, New Mexico will be able to maximize its efforts in renewable energy, which is so important. The merger will also bring us closer to being 100% carbon neutral and will provide a bright future for the youth of New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah, next. Next up, we have Paul Gibson. Paul, are you on the call? One more call for Paul Gibson. Okay. I am here. Oh. I, wait, I'm here. Okay. I had a problem getting my mute off. Okay, Mr. Gibson, go ahead. You have one minute. Thank you. My name is Paul Gibson, and uh, I am a PM customer, and a uh, Joe Maest Commissioner Maestas is my commissioner. I ask you not to reopen this hearing and to vote no on this deal. If you reopen the hearing for oral arguments, all you will get from this proposed partnership is more half truths or complete falsehoods and promises of more treats if you just trust them. But as multiple commissioners noted last week, all the treats won't make up for a merger structure is fundamentally flawed and would promote bid rigging and price gouging. Since your hearing last, The Guardian published a report of a new federal lawsuit charging Avangrid and Iberdrola with price gouging, bid rigging, and racketeering in New York, Connecticut, and Maine, precisely the kind of behavior that the hearing examiner feared in rendering his decision. She closed with this statement that even if the joint applicants agreed to auctions, he could not support this deal as it would be impossible Thank you, to Paul. regulate a partnership with such wanton disregard. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to be I had more, straight. but I was prepped for three minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry that we had to cut it to one, but thank you. Um, okay. Sarah. Next, next on the list, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, we have Ben Shelton. Ben, are you on the call? I am. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, go ahead. My name is Ben Shelton. I'm the political and policy director for Conservation Voters in New Mexico. And I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak in support of this merger today. The docket shows robust debate about the role and importance of addressing climate change and how that impacts the public interest in particular. Some of the elements of this agreement can have a real impact when it comes to positioning New Mexico to deal with the threat of climate change. Um, stuff like more aggressive timelines for renewable portfolio, standard compliance, RTO membership, these are really impactful tools that will result in true benefits for New Mexicans, even those not in PNM service territory. Um, but what I'd like to speak 
about today is a real threat to the public interest as it relates to the climate, and that is time. We don't have it in New Mexico. The public interest requires climate action now, not in a few years or the next time a potential buyer comes along that looks correct. The climate benefits of this proposed agreement will make a difference for every New Mexican that are in front of you today. The, we, don't, we are not going to be served as a public by a wait and see approach. The opportunity to act is here and now. Please don't pass it up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, next. Hello, hello, can you hear me now? Hello, this is Ralph Arianas, can you hear me? Hi, Ralph. Hi, I, I was not sent the link for the for this meeting, I was sent the web page. Can, can I speak right now? Mr. Sarah, you're, it's, you're in control here. Okay. <laughs> Um, go ahead, Mr. Arianos. So you have one minute. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, PRC Commissioners, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ralph Arianos. I'm the Chairman and CEO of the Hispano Roundtable of New Mexico. We are a coalition of over 50 organizational partners with a combined membership of over 50,000 members statewide. We represent the true voice of the Hispanic community. Today, the Hispano Roundtable of New Mexico stands strongly in support of this merger. The Hispano Roundtable of New Mexico and the Hispano community is very concerned about the comments made by PRC commissioners who have basically made up their minds to vote against this merger without us being heard. This raises very serious concerns. This is clearly unfair. In fact, this whole process to date has been biased, tainted, and in fact discriminatory against the Hispanic population of New Mexico, who has the strongest stake in this process and all the negativity has been generated by one person from New Energy Economy and Retake Our Democracy. Okay, they have okay. thank you, time's up. Thank, thank you. you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Our yeah, next commenter ahead. is Sterling Grogan. Mr. Grogan, I see that you're here. Yes. Okay, you may proceed with one minute. Okay, my name is uh, Sterling Grogan. I'm an ecologist with graduate degrees from Cal Poly and UNM. I'm a PNM ratepayer, and Mr. Maestas is my commissioner. Between 1974 and 1988, I spent 14 years working in, in environmental matters at the Navajo Mine, the San Juan Mine, and the La Plata Mine. Um, my understanding from uh, public information and my own observation is that there are already significant environmental liabilities associated with the cleanup and remediation of the Four Corners power plant, including possible contamination of soil and groundwater um, from uh, uh, pollution by coal ash. It's my understanding that PNM's application for quote unquote abandonment of Four Corners will not cause the reduction or cessation of coal burning and hence the continued buildup of tons of coal ash um, I think that fact alone should cause the commission to determine that abandonment is a net detriment and contrary okay. to the public interest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. Chair. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, our next commenter is Michael Mulcahy. Mr. Mulcahy, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay, you may proceed with one minute. Uh, Michael Mulcahy, 57 years as a resident of New Mexico. Um, do electrical work, and I've had experiences with this company that we're going to merge with, and they were bad experiences, and I put an application in for electrical work on my house in upstate New York, and it took three weeks to process it, and they lost the permit, and I was talking to somebody in Boston who had no concerns for anybody in upstate New York. So it dawned on me that what I'm reading and watching in this, this hearing is that this is another version of outsourcing. And we all know about the frustrations involved in outsourcing when you have a problem and you're talking to somebody in another world or another state. And final, I ask, don't sell out to a foreign country, perhaps where they have the value of selling out to somebody else. Please don't do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Folks, you're doing a great job to our with our one minute. Really appreciate it. I know. I know it's difficult. Um, Sarah, go ahead. 
Okay, next we have Randy Royster. Randy, are you on the call? One more call for Randy Royster. Okay, next on the list is Rob Durham. Mr. Durham, are you on the call? I am. Okay, Mr. Durham, you have one minute. I believe all the negativity that has been generated about the merger is done simply by one person and their organization, Retake Our Democracy, which she founded. They have done things like put together an organized Kill the Merger playbook. I will read the merger playbook so the commission understands the lengths that these groups will go to, who want not only to kill the merger deal, but also want to kill PNM and allow a public takeover of the utility. There is no groundswell of grassroots opposition to this merger. It's all been manufactured by a small but loud elite minority. I quote, we are taking no chances and are developing a communication strategy to ensure that we provide an avalanche of calls and emails that are personal and persuasive. This is no time to rest. We are so close to a remarkable victory. This gives instructions on what to say, what to write, what to communicate to the commissioners. Okay. Minutes up, uh, but thank you. Point taken. Um, Sarah, next. Next, Ralph Mims. Mr. Mims, are you on the call? Yes, I am. All um, right, you have one minute. My name is Ralph L. Mims. I am the economic development consultant for the city of Rio Communities. A company that is willing to bring 150 jobs with an average salary of 88,000 committed to funding at least $25 million for economic development projects is huge for our state. We, do, we need to really consider what's at stake and improve the PNM average grid merger. As an economic developer working in a rural community, economic development financial resources for economic development projects is vital to bring jobs and economic vitality vitality development to our underserved rural areas. That's it. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Sarah. Next we have June Parsons. I saw her earlier. June, Thanks. are you still? Okay. Great, you have one minute, June. PRC commissioners, my name is June Parsons, resident of Rio Rancho, Sandoval County, PNM rate payer. Joseph Maestras is my commissioner, and these are my own words as a concerned citizen. Thank you for all wow, the proactive and effective well work you are doing now. to seriously address New Mexico. Excuse me. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, so could we, yeah, thank you. Restore the clock so for June there. Um, go ahead, June, you've got 50 seconds. Please make sure everybody is muted if you're not speaking. Thank you Go for ahead, the proactive and effective work you are doing to seriously address New Mexico's role in contributing to our global climate crisis and to address the health and economic harm climate crisis causes to New Mexicans. However, there is much you still need to do quickly to seriously diminish New Mexico's contribution to climate crisis. I believe it is unconscionable for any of us to knowingly and unnecessarily enable continued extraction and operations that enable the continued use of highly polluting coal, which the proposed PNM abandonment would do. In addition, I believe it is morally unjust to penalize New Mexicans who are economically challenged and cannot afford personal internet access to support commercialized company related computer applications. I implore the PRC to please deny PNM's proposed abandonment of Four Corners Coal Plant. This deal ensures that coal pollution will continue indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Next, we have Rebecca Jasso Aguilar. Or Yasso? Yes, thank you. I'm here. Okay. Good morning, Honorable Commissioners. My name is Rebecca Jasso Aguilar. I am a resident of Albuquerque and a PNM customer. I am here today again to speak against the merger and against reop reopening the case. And these are my own words. 
For lack of time, I will just address one point brought up last Wednesday by a gentleman in favor of the merger, who told the anecdote that 15 years ago, he had suggested Governor Richardson that Iberdrola should just buy PNM. He mentioned being offended by what he saw as a rejection of this merger on the basis that Iberdrola is a foreign company. Make no mistake. Those of us who reject this merger do so with arguments that clearly point to the shady practices of this company in the United States and globally. We are opposing a company whose modus operandi is buying politicians, corrupting democracies, and never benefiting consumers. We will reject partnerships with this type of company, domestic or foreign. We don't have the resources mm -hmm. to police them, nor should resources be spent that way. Thank you, commissioners, for your excellent job. Thank Please you. do not reopen Thank the you. case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, go uh, next. Next, we have Gloria Lemer. Gloria, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Okay, you have one minute. Good morning, commissioners, and my commissioner, Teresa Vicente Aguilar. My name is Gloria Lemer, and I'm a lifelong resident of San Juan County. I was a medical professional at our local hospital for 24 years, and my husband is a retired physician, having practiced in this community for 40 years. The San Juan Generating Station and Four Corners Power Plant and Coal Stacks can be seen from my home. I have toured the Four Corners plant. These aging polluted behemoths must close. I am not asking you to abandon these plants. I'm asking you to close these plants. They will finally shutter if the PRC finally stops allowing yeah. okay. to subsidize the owners and operators okay. with cost and then, recovery from ratepayers. Um, hang on a second here. Uh, folks, please, please put on your mute. Okay. Gloria, Gloria right. Judy, Judy, you're not muted. Okay, there she is. Yeah, and Gloria, okay, Gloria's got it. All right, let's uh, let's rewind the clock to uh, 30 seconds and resume with our speaker. Remember the plight of those impacted by uranium mining and tailings and the ultimate costs to human life and our earth? This is no different. Utilities should not be allowed to abandon and walk away. I witnessed the Gold King mine spill in our Animus and San Juan rivers and saw what abandonment without remediation of the mines upstream in Colorado did to us, while some reaped profits, especially with the movement to diversify our economy and to bring healthy outdoor recreation and tourism to our area, creating new jobs. It makes no oh, sense to okay, allow the coal stacks to continue Thank burning you. dirty fuel. Thank you, Gloria. Okay, uh, Sarah, next. Next is Margaret Bell. Yes, I'm on, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Uh, my name is Margaret Bell. I'm a citizen I'm of New Mexico. I live in Albuquerque. Um, and on the Four Corners Coal Plant Abandonment case, I am asking the commission to reject the recommended decision on Four Corners, deny PNM's abandonment application, and find that PNM's costs incurred at Four Corners were imprudent. Allowing PNM to offload the Four Corners coal plant to the coal plant owner will increase deadly climate pollution by prolonging the life of an aging and dangerous plant, which is the largest single source of climate pollution in the state, and saddle consumers with a cost of some 100 million that the commission deferred a prudence ruling on. This is a really bad deal for consumers, local communities, and our climate. In our mega drought stricken state, we must not prolong the life of such a highly polluting plant. Therefore, I'm asking you to reject and deny PNM's abandonment application. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. <clears throat> Next, we have William Garcia. Mr. Garcia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I had the privilege of serving as New Mexico Cabinet Secretary for Economic Development from 1991 through 94 under Governor King. In addition, I've been an executive with both U.S. West and Intel in Rio Rancho. I support the proposed merger and the reopening of the hearings based on the following. One, the state is committed to carbon neutral energy production by 2045 in the Historic Energy Transition Act of 2019. This commitment anticipates and needs significant capital investment. This proposed merger gives us a company that can leverage its size and scalability to accomplish that energy goal. 
And it, its worldwide network gives us the added ability to tap into emerging ideas and technology. Commitments to rate stability and service quality are in the agreement. Finally, this isn't a one and done deal. The PRC will continue to have the ability to regulate the new company going forward and hold the company to all of its commitments in the merger. And it should. Thank you. I encourage the PRC to support the merger. Thank you very much. Um, and Sarah, next. Yes. Um, <clears throat> next, we have Athena Christodoulou. I hope I'm saying that right. Athena Christodoulou. Yes, sorry. Hi, my name is Athena Christodoulou and I'm a retired Navy engineer as well as a technology entrepreneur in Albuquerque. I looked at two areas, their leadership diversity and technology focus. The Avangrid management team has only two women among nine men. In 2020, that's deplorable. And will New Mexico even have a seat? A local board only addresses dividends and not strategy or direction. Now, I'm also concerned about the tech focus. As a New Mexico Solar Energy Association board mem member, I myself have gone fossil fuel free and letting go of the last bit of natural gas was the most difficult part. BNM's facing that same transition and Avangrid has not gone gas free and in fact is heading in the opposite direction with so-called green hydrogen. Two or three drops of white paint mixed with 97 drops of black paint and calling it white. That's the kind of scheme it looks to be. The new CEO of Avangrid is a Southern California gas experience and lover. Nothing must sidetrack us, slow us, or undercut our trajectory to 100% clean. No more distractions, period. This merger should not happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah, next. Yes. Next, we have <clears throat> Joey Atencio. Yes, I'm here. My name is Joey Atencio. I'm the business manager for Layuna, La Labor's local union number 16. We represent 2,000 members through the state, throughout the state of New Mexico. Our union has been active since 1915. As a supporter of the PM Avangrid merger, we have the following, or we have been following the PRC proceedings closely. As New Mexicans, it's disturbing for us to hear some of the com, uh, commissioners announce their intentions to reject the application during the middle of the proceedings, even before the full record has been established or obviously considered. The statement made by Chairman Fishman were especially troubling in my view, disqualifying from anyone with the responsibility to make an imp uh, impartial decision. Additionally, referring to the $300 million in benefits included in the proposed merger as trinkets is outright insulting. Job creation, economic development, scholarships, apprenticeship training, resources, customer rate benefits, resources for our Native American communities are all urgently needed in the state. Okay, These benefits are, thank you. I'm sorry, your time is up, thank you. Um, next we have Bruce Taylor. Bruce, are you on the call? Mr. Taylor? Yes, Next. I'm here. Thank okay. you. I apologize. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Bruce Armstrong Taylor. Uh, I am from the state of Maine. I see that Tony Buxton is speaking today, uh, and I will uh, give him a shout out as being a very thorough energy, utilities, and natural resources attorney. Uh, with a huge uh, history of sub subject matter expertise. So uh, I have no idea what he's going to say, but, uh, but I, I know him well. Um, so I serve on a United Nations Environment Program uh, workforce uh, focused on seconds. digital transformation. And I think that New Mexico has an unusual opportunity to create a very new way of looking at the energy economy inside the scope of digital transformation. I urge you to relook at the Avangrid Grid Iberdrola uh, acquisition. Okay. Time's up. Okay. Okay. Mr. Thank Taylor, you. I'm sorry that your time is up. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, Senator Trey Stewart is next, and I see him on the call. Yes, I'm here. Good morning, Go ahead, Mr. Stewart. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Trey Stewart, State Senator in Northern Maine. I'm the ranking Republican on the Energy, Utilities, and Technology Committee, and also a 3L at the University of Maine School of Law and hold an MBA from the University of Maine. I'm here to share the perspective as a legislator in Maine where Avangrid is currently operating through one of its subsidiaries, Central Maine Power. You've no doubt heard that CMP had a share of challenges in recent years navigating a new billing system sparked an investigation by the Maine Public Utilities Commission. But by collaborating with the commission and working hard internally to straighten out these issues with the system, these problems have been addressed and rightly corrected. Importantly, over the past 13 years, CMP has reinvested 99% of its profits back into the electrical grid in Maine, including new technology and grid automation to improve outage response and tracking, stronger poles and covered wire to prevent uh, tree damage that can cause outages, and new substations to enhance remote monitoring capabilities to enable more responsive operations. This level of investment is three times the investment CMP made prior to becoming a part of Avon Grid. Avon Grid and CMP are committed partners with Maine. Thank you, Todd. Mr. Stewart. Uh, appreciate your comments. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <clears throat> um, next, we have uh, Richard Luarkey. Richard, are you on the call still? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Richard Lewerke. I'm the president and CEO for Tomiao Ventures in Santa Ana Pueblo. Um, I do want to make my comments in support of the Avon Grid merger. Um, yeah, I believe that the, the, the approval of this merger uh, introduces the next generation economy building for New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico can be a leader in science, technology, engineering um, uh, uh, disciplines. The merger brings light to this opportunity. Um, an opposition to it could also be, mean that we remain status quo. Um, and I hope that we do not remain status quo. I hope that, you know, with the Pueblos and the tribes here in New Mexico that have supported this merger through the All Pueblo Council of Governors would also be brought into the fold and tribes not be an afterthought when it comes to economic advancement with technology, uh, science, and engineering. Tamiya Ventures strongly supports the public uh, or encourages the PRC to support the merger going forward and open the doors to the next generation of economic and community building. Thank you. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you very much. Sarah? Thank you. Um, next, we have Sandra Wheeler. Sandra, are you on the call? Yes. Um, my name is Sandra Wheeler. I live in Farmington near the Four Corners Power Plant. I strongly urge you to vote against PNM's sale of its share of the Four Corners Power Plant to the New Mexico Transitional Energy Company. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the scheduled closure is 2031. The NTEC says the plan does not extend the operating life of the planet, the plant, but it makes that extension possible. Uh, and that's exactly what NTC has previously said it wants to do because it is the sole owner of the power of the coal mine powering the plant and the plant is the mine's only customer. Uh, the Department of the Interior estimated that there is a, um, a previously uh, permitted but undeveloped reserves that would supply coal to the power plant for up to 25 years. That gets us to 2040 not during a code red for humanity. Please vote against this. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Sarah, next. Next, we have Bridget Dixon. <clears throat> Ms. Dixon, are you? I saw her earlier. I'm here, thank you. Oh, I'm Bridget great. Dixon. I'm Bridget Dixon. I'm the president and CEO of the Santa Fe Chamber of Commerce, which serves as a voice of business and represents over 700 businesses here in Santa Fe. Quite honestly, our job is to promote and support economic prosperity. Through its proposed merger with PM, Avangard has committed to more than $225 million in money going straight back to, to New Mexico. This includes an addition of 150 high paying long term jobs with a total economic impact exceeding $2 million right here in the land of enchantment. 15 million in contributions towards economic development and projects or programs. Therefore, we support the continued commitment to the New Mexico nonprofit organizations and the business community under this merger. So we are in complete support of this merger. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sarah, next. <clears throat> next. Uh... We have Nicole Waltermeyer. Nicole, are you on the line? 
Yes, I'm here. Hi. Please go. Hi, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Nicole Waltermeyer. I've lived in Las Cruces for 13 years and I'm here to comment on expanding electric vehicle access and infrastructure. I am an electric vehicle driver and I have one, we have one electric vehicle for our family of four. So um, in our daily lives, we're keenly aware of the need to expand infrastructure in our state. And I wanna thank the commissioners for passing a plan that does in fact um, do this while increasing accessibility and affordability for all New Mexicans. However, I do encourage the commission to rehear a small portion of this plan and make it more equitable. First, to remove the requirement that New Mexicans must have, have home Wi-Fi in order to qualify for charger rebates. This provision isn't present in similar plans like the EPE plan. Secondly, to please correct the rebate amount from the agreed upon um, back up to the agreed upon $2,000. The difference between $1,500 and $2,000 in rebate amount and rebates for electrical upgrades can make Thank a real you. difference okay, for our neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We got your point. Thank you. Sarah? Yes, sir. Um, the next on our, we have uh, speaker Seth Damon. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, good morning. Go ahead. Ade, my name is Seth Damon. I'm the speaker of the 24th Navajo Nation Council, and I just want to say thank you, commissioners. I'd also like to acknowledge our honorable commissioner, Teresa Pacente Aguilar uh, from District 4, who's not only my commissioner, but also for Eastern Agency and among our northern chapters, too, as well. Um, as, as I am a representative of the Navajo Nation, I just want to say thank you, and I we're here to say that we recognize this merger between Avagrid and PNM, and not we only not only recognize this, we are, are in critical support of this, and it's not only for this, but an opportunity for the state of New Mexico and for the nation. There are a number of benefits for this, not only including a 200 megawatt renewable uh, uh, generation site on the Navajo Nation that could be forthcoming, but also development for future ent entrepreneurship for uh, future um, placements in Northern New Mexico as well. As I respectfully ask the commissioners to give full process for this full opportunity to bring forth a legitimate outcome. I say thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Damon. You for your comments. Yeah. We're gonna Ms. move on. Thank you. Your timer is up. Yes. <clears throat> um, the next we have is uh, Honorable Delegate Mark Freeland. Mr. Freeland. Good morning, uh, commissioners and members of the PRC. Otto, um, our esteemed commissioner, Teresa Vicente Aguilar. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Freeland. I'm a member of the 24th Navajo Nation Council. I represent eight communities, four in San Juan and four in McKinley, Crown Point, Nahadishki, Tsehai, Vicente, White Rock, Lake Valley, Herfano, and Naizi. Um, this morning, I wanted to stand, of course, in support of this merger between Avangard and PNM. We think it's a real opportunity for the Navajo Nation, but more importantly, for the rural areas that I represent, I have um, a lot of specific needs and our area is a strongly disadvantaged area, particularly in the, in the eastern part of the Navajo Nation. So we encourage the commissioners to please give some strong consideration to the rural communities, especially our Navajo people who could benefit greatly from this merger, especially what the speaker had mentioned to the potential of a 200 megawatt substation for renewable energy. That's something we wanna look forward to is renewable energy development. Kealan Sago, thank you, God bless. Happy holidays. Thank you. And Sarah, next. Next, we have um, Honorable Delegate Ricky Nez. Ricky Nez, are you on the call? He may not be available at this time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Freeland. <clears throat> next, we have Pat Bryan. Pat, Brian, are you on the call? Yes, I am. I'm sorry for the delay. Okay, and you have a minute. Good morning. Uh, I formerly served as the first attorney to the Albuquerque City Council back in 1976 when Albuquerque switched the city commission former government to a mayor council. 
thereafter I was the city attorney Ralph Kirk. I counseled them then and I would counsel you now that it is critical that when you're acting in a quasi-judicial capacity, as you are here, that you must act impartial as impartial judges of this case. Fundamental fairness as well as New Mexico case law demands this. I well know that it can be damn tough for city politicians uh, to do this, but it's critical that you hear all the facts, weigh all the evidence presented before making your decision. I was concerned to see press reports that some members may have prejudged this process. Uh, in your positions as PRC commissioners, you have an awesome responsibility. You make decisions for all of us, and we need okay. you to do that as Thank you. your time Thank, Thank you so much. Next. Uh, yeah. next, we have Anthony Buxton. Anthony, are you on the call? I, I am on the call. I can't account for the fact. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You have one uh, minute. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for this privilege. I am a Portland, Maine energy attorney who has built my practice over the decades fighting with utilities, especially Avangrid and CMP. And I am here today because the truth matters. Uh, it is my view personally that Avangrid and CMP have been subjected to an unprecedented uh, character assassination effort in Maine uh, driving essentially from two sources. First, there is a very powerful effort in Maine for uh, public power to take over the two IOUs. Uh, and secondly, there has recently been a uh, hugely expensive referendum in which fossil fuel generators and nuclear generators spent between 30 and $50 million in a small state uh, advertising everything that they could conceive, conceive of that was wrong with Avangrid and CMP. Okay, Mr. Buxton, your time is up. Our time is up. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, uh, we have Pat, Pat Davis. Pat Davis, are you on the call? Uh, one more call for Pat Davis. Okay. Next we have Noah and the last name wasn't clear. Noah TP was that email address. Are you on the call Noah? Okay. Uh, Steve Conrad. Steve, are you on the call? Oh. There you are, Mr. Conrad. You have one minute. Oh. Oh. My comment is regarding asking the commission to rehear PM's transportation electrification plan so that residents aren't required to have wireless in order to get rebates for installing um, home EV chargers. I live in Algodonas, but I'm speaking to you today from the parking lot of Starbucks in Bernalillo because my home doesn't have access to Wi-Fi and our cellular signal is insufficient to support a Zoom call. I'm interested in purchasing an electric vehicle someday soon, but I find it unfair that PNM would not offer me the rebates available to others who have Wi-Fi. I understand their desire to obtain as much data as possible about charger usage, but rebate or not, they won't be obtaining my data. So let's say the PNM are able to obtain data from say, let's say roughly 85% of its charging customers. That proportion should be more than sufficient to understand consumer behavior with regards to charging. They won't be, they'll be gaining you, very Mr. little, if any. Okay. Thank Mr. you, Conrad, we got your, your point, we appreciate it. Thank got you. it, thank you. thank you. Okay, next is Katie Singer. Ms. Singer, are you on the call? Katie Singer? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Thank you have you. one minute. I'm a writer in Santa Fe and a PM ratepayer. Terms like zero emitting and carbon neutral are marketing terms, including when they apply to solar, wind, or electric vehicles. 
Solar, wind, battery, electric storage, and EVs each require hundreds of substances with international supply chains that guzzle fossil fuels and emit greenhouse gases and toxic waste at mining and smelting and chemical manufacturing sites. Whatever happens at those mines and factories impacts our world, whether we calculate it or not. Solar and wind need backup from fossil fuels or batteries. EVs need charging. They're not renewable. Solar panels, EVs, and battery storage and Wi-Fi are electrical equipment with five fire hazards that must be evaluated and mitigated by a licensed PE. In proportion to these problems, we need evaluation and mitigated mitigation by licensed experts. Show me, show me that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Singer. <clears throat> okay, next we have Jonathan Juarez. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have one minute, Jonathan. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Jonathan Juarez Alonso. I'm 19 years old. I'm from the Pueblos of Laguna and Asleta, and I'm here today as the policy lead for EarthCare, which has hundreds of members who are PM ratepayers. I'm here today to speak against this proposed abandonment application. And it's funny that the word abandonment is used. It's pretty accurate in this case, because my understanding is that this proposal will transfer PNM's ownership of the plan to NTEC, and that it includes a provision that prohibits a vote for early closure. So it's not closing the plan, it's actually help helping to keep it open. In this way, PNM is abandoning its responsibility to communities on the front lines of the climate crisis here in New Mexico, to invest its, to invest its own resources in reparations and transition and support not just ratepayers to ensure comprehensive cleanup to follow through on the climate commitments it claimed to be supporting when it pushed the ETA through our legislature to give back at all. PNM is also abandoning its responsibilities when it comes to imprudence. PNM should have never invested in this plant when it did six years ago. It okay. knew that then, but just wanted Are to get your, your time is Thank up. You. Thank you, Mr. Alonzo. Thank you. Um, Pat Davis messaged me and, and are you available now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you okay. so much, sir. Yes. Commissioners, thanks for making time for this. I've sat through enough public comment to know that it uh, can take a lot of time and patience and I'm grateful that y'all are giving the public a chance to weigh in. Uh, I'm Pat Davis. I'm a city councilor in the city of Albuquerque and also serve on the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority. Uh, I appreciate this and I'm uh, speaking in support of the merger. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I was not a supporter when we began this process in part because I thought there was more that could be done, but I can tell you um, that both as a member of the board and as a member of the city council, the state's largest utility consumer, um, we uh, are excited that to see that the companies come forward to address some of the issues um, and offer funds to help low income provider, uh, low income customers and rate payers deal with climate change, to help us meet our goals on long-term for sustainability that's so important to us at Albuquerque and the Water Authority. And quite frankly, lots of these jobs are high paying jobs that will come to us here in the city of Albuquerque uh, and particularly in my district. I think this is worth considering you, and it's our strategy. Thank you, there. Pat, appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, next we have Veronica Toledo Yang. Hi, how are you? Hi. Just fine, go ahead, you have one minute, please. Thank you. Good morning, relatives. My name is Yang. I come from the Navajo Nation in the Four Corners region. I was born and raised in the frontline community, Farmington. I grew up under the shadow of the Four Corners power plant and I am here representing Youth United for Climate Crisis Action. We are members from um, Northern New Mexico who are also repairs of PNM. I am also here on behalf of my people in the Four Corners region and Mother Earth. PNM's abandonment of the Four Corners power plant and transferring the shares to Navajo Transitional Energy Company to keep the plant operating is continued genocide to the earth and is currently causing death slash health effects of nearby communities. PNM, the, the Public Regulations Committee should not approve the exit P, to, to exit PNM ownership of the Four Corners power plant. PNM should pay for the cleanup costs and health bills from nearby communities that have Nearby communities have endured. The Public Regulation Committee should not approve the securitization of behalf of PNM and should deny the PNM's abandonment application. We ask that you please deny the merger. We cannot, cannot, we cannot continue letting PNM and other utilities get away with desecrating the earth, killing the people, and it starts Thank with you, <clears throat> Ms. Yang. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. All right. We have two more. Um, next is Marissa Russell. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, you have um, one minute. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Marissa Russell. I, I'm here to represent Youth United for Climate Crisis Action, and I don't support the merger. I grew up on the Navajo Nation near these industrial sites. I've inhaled the toxic air. I swam in the polluted water. I've witnessed my family members' health conditions worsen growing up. We already know that the Four Corners Power Plant has done devastating damage to the people and to the land. Why try to keep this industry running? <sighs> Why give the Navajo Nation this corrupt device to kill our people? Money isn't everything. It won't save your lives. Our lives are more precious. And to anyone who considers the approval of PNM's application shows that you don't care. You're selfish and inconsiderate. You don't care and, and you don't care about anything but the money. Our earth is dying. Why try to kill her even more? Where else are we going to go when all the resources are desecrated and polluted? We, are, we have the chance now to stop this destruction. So I urge you to stop, to not support this merger. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Russell. <clears throat> okay. Oh my God, that's so hard. Huh? Thank you. Um, if you've completed your comments, make sure you uh, at least mute yourselves. If not, um, exit the meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Carolyn Simmons is next. Ms. Simmons, did you yes. make it on the call? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Good. Good you morning. One minute. I'm Carolyn Simmons from Sandia Park, New Mexico. I'm just asking you to please rehear the PNM TEP case to allow people without wireless internet to receive charger rebates. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, anybody else? That's all that I had registered. Well, thank Sarah, you. Sarah, for... my name is Abbas Akhil. I had registered yesterday, but I didn't get an acknowledgement. Um, so, Sarah, let's uh, let Abbas okay. speak his piece. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, as you know, my name is Abbas Akhil, and I'm a constituent of Commissioner Hall's district. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. As an engineer, uh, I agree with Commissioner Meister's view that you continue to deliberate on the merger and see if this can be fixed uh, rather than just walk away and uh, make a hasty decision. I strongly recommend that you defer a decision till you have reviewed the exceptions that have been filed. I also strongly believe that this merger will allow PNM to start a grid modernization program quickly and also improve the resiliency of the grid of our state. Uh, US commissioners, of course, have the final decision and you also have the power to add stipulations to make this merger work for the best interests of the ratepayers of the state. Uh, let's enjoy the holidays and return with a fresh mind to make a decision that will affect us for decades to come. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank, Thank you. you Abbas. <clears throat> okay. Um, I believe Mr. we've completed. Mr. Chair? Yeah. This is Sarah. I just wanted to announce to the commenters that I sent the YouTube link for them to join to watch uh, if they want to continue to watch the meeting, but they should drop off of the Zoom call now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank Mr. you, Sarah. Chair. Great job of, of taking us through that and keeping it all under control. Um, we've got next the uh, introduction of special guests. Oh, Good morning, yes. I'm sorry, Sarah. Go ahead, Wayne. <laughs> I was just going to introduce you. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, good morning again, uh, commissioners. Uh, uh, again, it's nice to see you uh, this morning. I know it's already been a long day and it's going to get longer. So if Sarah wants to keep that one minute clock up, I'll try to, I'll try to keep my remarks under a minute. But it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our employee of the month for December, Danielle Jimenez, who no, needs no introduction, certainly to the commission uh, in kind of reviewing uh, her service here at the commission uh, in anticipation of this uh, award. I was actually surprised to see how, how short of a period of time she's been at the commission because she knows everybody. Uh, she knows everything that uh, is going on at the commission. She knows how to get uh, things done. And that's a, that's a real skill uh, to have for any employer. And I certainly feel fortunate to have her here in the chief of staff's office uh, as noted in, in the resolution on her nomination or 
for employee of the month. You know, she's not only provides support to me uh, and the rest of the agency, but she was incredibly instrumental in, in helping us through the move that we've uh, talked about uh, quite a bit over the last few months. But she's also always been willing to take on additional responsibilities, and, and including help assisting uh, you, uh, the commission, uh, with some of your your needs in terms of travel and other things like that. So I won't go on and on, Mr. Chairman. I, I know everybody knows Danielle uh, very well, uh, but she is truly an asset to the agency. We're lucky to have her. Uh, she, as I mentioned, has only been here a short time, but I hope she stays here for a very long time. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to the commission for, for your remarks. Thank you. Um, commissioners. Well, Mr. Chair, this is Jeff. Yeah, go ahead. Well, of course, just want to say congratulations. Well-deserved. Um, I know when we were there in person, she was, she was very busy and I suspect it has remained. Um, so I, I, I'm glad that she's gotten recognition for the hard work. And uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Hall, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I too would just like to say, I'm really pleased to see Danielle get this uh, recognition. Uh, she's been extremely helpful to me in numerous ways and, uh, and very pleasant and engaging as well. And I, I just feel she's a tremendous asset to our organization and I'm really glad we're able to do something uh, for her in this small way, at least to recognize and appreciate. So sure. glad, glad for this. Um, I'm gonna make a quick comment. Uh, uh, Danielle being her, on her effectiveness, uh, recently there was some work that uh, Wayne needed from me uh, to get moving forward. And uh, we've been busy as heck and I wasn't doing a great job of getting to it. And uh, Danielle was the uh, appointed person to gently nudge me into action. And uh, she just had a great way of doing it. Um, and um, a way of doing it that didn't create any tension or conflict or uh, real annoyance. She just had an effective way of doing, of going about it and uh, making me do a better job. And uh, I really appreciate it when folks can work that in that constructive way. Um, so thank you, Danielle, for that. And congratulations on this recognition. Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Maestas. Um, yes, I, I just want to also, you know, add to I think what's already been said about Danielle, I think uh, when Wayne came in, you know, I think he quickly understood that um, on top of all the technical issues regarding the myriad of cases that come before us, uh, having to also deal with administrative matters as commissioners and assistants uh, is challenging. And I think that he, um, he agreed to uh, enlist Danielle to kind of help us with travel and other admin issues. And I, I can just, from my perspective, um, that has been uh, a great change. And I want to thank Danielle for uh, her willingness to help in any way. I don't think she's ever, ever at least indicated to me that no, somebody else should do this or she can't do it right now. She's been so accommodating and and just, you know, on a more broader perspective, when you work in an agency that really has limited resources, uh, people have to, you know, kind of spring into action and be versatile uh, and, uh, and be team players. And I think that, that those two, um, I think those two notions epitomize Danielle. So anyway, this recognition is well-deserved. And Danielle, thank us. Thank you for helping us. Um, get through this busy time. Oh, uh, any other comments? Well, thank you, Wayne, and uh, congratulations, Danielle, and uh, uh, we really appreciate you. Um, the next item is a public hearing. What I'd like to do is take, we do have a uh, an extensive agenda. I think we're gonna end up taking the whole day here. And um, 
it's going to be <laughs> not an easy day, tough issues to, to discuss. Um, so I'd like to take a 10 minute break now and, uh, you know, at 90 minute intervals, um, take breaks to be sure we just don't totally uh, beat ourselves into the ground here. So what I'd like to do is come back at uh, 11.15 and uh, we'll continue from there. Okay, I'm not hearing any objection because you guys tend to speak up when you object, when you need to. So uh, we'll get back at 11.15, thanks.
I, I think I do. Oh, no. I, I think I do. Okay. So it's a 14, 13. Okay, uh, I'm going 1115. Is everybody here? Jeff? Everybody. All of us. <laughs> Me, myself, and I. Commissioner yes. Presente Avalar? Here. Okay, great. And Cynthia? I am here. Terrific. Okay. Um, so let's go on um, to our public hearing. Uh, 21 quadruple lot one, T-R-E-N, in the matter of the revocation of operating authorities for failure to comply with financial responsibility requirements. And um, I'm not sure who's going to take the lead here. Judy, you want to start it off? Um, yes. Good morning, Commissioner and members of the commission. This matter comes before you today as a public hearing regarding um, the matter of revoking motor carriers for non-compliance with financial responsibility. I will, at this point, hand it over to the Transportation Division. I'm, I, I'm not sure exactly. I believe it's Elizabeth Jeffries and Kevin uh, Bajorque who uh, will be doing of the direct testimony. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Elizabeth Jeffries. I represent the transportation division. And uh, we have provided. <laughs> we I'm sorry. That is a wonderful background in contrast to some of our other staff members. I, I just have to comment on that. I'm that, just mocking That makes Hans. me feel at home. Yeah. Yes, this is for so Hans. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my apologies for interrupting. No, it's okay. I appreciate your recognition. There, you can see Hans is there. All right. So we um, sent out notices to motor carriers regarding their need to provide a Form E, which is the proof of the financial responsibility that's required under Section 65-2A-18 of the Motor Carrier Act. And today we bring to you a list of non-compliant carriers whose failure to provide the Form E may now result in the revocation of the carrier's authority by the commission pursuant to section 65-2A-27. And I have with me today, Kevin Babu Horkis. Good morning. Yes. All right, and um, I believe we need to swear her in. Can we do that? Yes, and um, I would ask that, uh, 
Commissioner Fishman, Chair of the Commission, swear in the witness. Um, what am I supposed to do here? You solemnly uh, swear to tell the truth. <laughs> I don't the know what to do. Truth here. and nothing but the truth. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, I do. Um, Thank you. And I just got a message from Carl. Um, are we recording at this point, Sarah? I just want to make sure that we're recording this. Yes, it is recording. Okay, thank you. Uh, because we will have to have this trans, uh, transcribed, but thank you very much. Uh, please proceed, Elizabeth thank and you. Kevin. Thank you, Judy. So, Ms. Faber Horkis, by whom are you employed and what capacity? The New Mexico Public Regulation Commission Transportation Division, and I am a business operations specialist O. Okay. As part of your duties in that position, did you review the notices and forms for each of the motor carriers at issue in this case? Yes. Based on that review, did you prepare or participate in preparing the testimony in Exhibit 1 and the related attachments regarding the issues concerning these motor carriers? Yes. Do you have any changes or corrections to that testimony? Yes. RNS Trucking LLC owned earlier this morning and said that the company had been insured for months. However, I did not receive a current for me for this company. I did receive a certificate of liability this morning via email, which does prove the company does have insurance. The owner stated the insurance agent will get the form E to us as soon as Progressive Insurance mails it. Okay. If I were to ask you the same questions as are set forth in the testimony of exhibit one, would your answers be the same? Yes, for the exception of RNS Trucking LLC. Understood. Are your answers true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And do you adopt exhibit one as your sworn testimony in this matter? Yes. Okay, I'd like to move for the admission of exhibit one and the attachments into the record. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner uh, Fishman and members of the commission, I, I have a couple of questions uh, for Kevin um, at this point. Um, would you uh, be able to file in this docket a, a pleading when you receive the valid form E from RNS Trucking? Yes. And uh, would you at that point file a, a, a revised exhibit of non-compliant uh, carriers that deleted RNS? Yes. All right, well, thank you. That, that, that's all my questions. Thank you. At this point, um, the commission can conclude the public hearing and at the appropriate time on the agenda, I can propose an order for the commission to adopt regarding the public hearing and the petition. Okay. Um. So um, at this point, I basically am going to declare the hearing concluded. Yes, and, and we can go to the action, uh, the consent agenda, consent action items. Items, then the action agenda items. And when we get to uh, the action agenda items, this matter will uh, be proposed for a vote and an order. Terrific. Judy, um, could I just get confirmation that the exhibit was moved onto the record, that it was accepted onto the record? Yes, the exhibit is moved to the record. Thank you. And with that, we will close uh, today's hearing and we will move on to consent action items. Um, so, um, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, do I have a motion? 
Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, yeah. Is, so is there an amendment to this action item that's in consent? And if so, do we need to pull it from consent? Mm -hmm. uh, because of what we had, uh, I'm not quite clear what you're asking, Commissioner. Uh, Try it again. I, I believe uh, Commissioner Maestas is asking, is this, is this matter on the consent agenda? If it is, it would need to be moved to the regular agenda uh, to, okay. uh, to delete RNS trucking from um, the list of carriers. Mr. Chair, I'll move it. I'll move to remove it from the consent agenda. Second. Uh, Mike, please call the roll. Commissioner Fishman. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Bird. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Motion to remove that case and move it to the regular action item is approved by a vote of five to zero. Okay. And do I have a motion on the consent action agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. Mike, please call the roll. And read the. I'm just maneuvering my mouse for a moment. Um, yep. The consent action items find the removal of that case constitute case 21 00271 TRM in the matter of the application of FAITH, Behavioral Services and Wellness Center LLC, for a certificate to provide non emergency medical transport service. It's a potential order regarding the application for a certificate. Case 21-00274-TRM in the matter of the application of JP Moving LLC for a certificate to provide household goods services. With the, this is a potential order regarding the application for certificate. Case 21-00275-TRM in the matter of the application of Taos Limo LLC, DBA, Taos Limo, or a certificate to provide limousine service. It's also a potential order regarding the the application for a certificate um, and utility matter case 19-00106-UT in the matter of the applications for and program support oh, from the state. Whoops, please put on your mute, folks. Go ahead, Mike. Let's see, where was I? In the matter of the applications for 2020 broadband, broadband program support from the State Rural Universal Service Fund, it's a potential order regarding wind streams request for partial disbursements for Chama project and for UNIS project. I'll take the, ro the roll call. Uh, Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Hall. Hi, hi, sorry, can I mute? Hi. Commissioner Bird. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. Aye. Uh, consent action items are approved by a vote of five to zero. Okay. Um, we are on to Whoops, okay. Uh, is this the uh, consent item that I'm looking at or is this a separate set here? Uh, Commissioner, yes, this is the uh, transportation matter that we just had the public hearing on that was moved from consent okay, so that goes to first. regular. All right, so uh, 21 triple lot one, uh, quadruple lot one in the matter of revocation of operating authorities for failure to comply with financial responsibility requirements. Um, yes, and um, this matter comes before you today after the public hearing that was just conducted. Um, it is proposed to revoke all of the listed carriers that are on the, on the agenda for uh, revocation, except for um, RNS trucking, who you heard uh, just provided uh, proof of compliance, although not before me uh, this morning. 
In addition, since the publication of the agenda, Mark Moisa DBA Quality Towing number 56824 uh, did, did provide proof of compliance to the transportation division as evidenced on uh, their exhibit. And um, in addition, CP Oil Field Services LLC number 57060 also pro provided proof of compliance with the financial responsibility requirements between the date of publication of the agenda and the date of filing uh, transportation divisions exhibit. So with the uh, removal of those three carriers on the caption, I, I request that the commission adopt this order revoking uh, the listed authorities. And um, I stand for questions. Commissioners. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve the order. I will second. I will second. Oh, that's uh, Commissioner Vicente Aguilar gets on the record as the second. And um, if there's no further discussion, Mike, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Byrd. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. Commissioner, the order is approved by a vote of five to zero. Okay. Um, a lot of scrolling to do there. We're on to Regular action items. Terrific. Um, so we're looking at 21 double lot 172 UT in the matter of Southwestern Public Service Company's annual uh, 2022 renewable energy portfolio procurement plan and requested approvals therein. Uh, proposed 2022 renewable portfolio standard cost and reconciliation riders and application for an RPS incentive and other associated relief. So Elizabeth and uh, Judy, please take us through it. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of your long agenda today. <laughs> um, and I don't know if it's ever, I will try to be brief. Um, as the chairman has indicated, this is SPS's um, annual uh, renewable portfolio uh, procurement plan. Uh, and uh, along with that, um, of course they um, are required and did file the uh, next year plan for review. Uh, they filed for seven different things and um, the first six were uncontested. Um, as parties in this case, we had Occidental Permian, New Mexico Large Customer Group, CCAE, LES, of course, SPS, and we had the commission staff. With regard to those first six requests, um, and Sarah, am I, do I have control? I don't, I don't see my, decision on the screen. Yeah, you should, not, not visible to us. You should be a <clears throat> co-host, Elizabeth. Okay. Did you get that little? Let me open up my screen. Okay. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. And we're going to, there we go. Great, we can see it. All right, excellent. And if we go on to, too far, go to the summary uh, that begins on, on page seven. 
of, of those, um, yes, they did file their uh, concurrent annual report. Um, they're asking the commission to um, acknowledge and approve their uh, 2022 plan and, and the, as I've already mentioned, the 2023 next year plan uh, review, not approval. Um, they're asking the commission in this case to approve the proposed uh, 2022 rider um, that um, includes their projected cost. Um, also approved the reconciliation rider, which trues up um, last year. Um, and then also um, that they have in fact um, complied with the um, commission requirements to approve their 22 22, 20, 2022 plan, I'll get it, and approve the um, Solar Connect um, rate rider. And as I indicate in, uh, as you can see, uh, a substantial number of pages of the recommended decision um, goes through um, with the thorough filing by SPS with regard to uh, those six things. And the review from uh, Ms. Labra Tercero on behalf of staff uh, who uh, meticulously went through all of those things and ultimately recommended approval. Therefore, based upon the evidence in the record uh, and those items being unopposed, um, I did in fact recommend to you that the, um, those six items be approved. There are no new programs this year um, and they're continuing on with the, the prior programs. Just to give you uh, an idea of um, the uh, monetary impact uh, uh, for uh, that's that's being um, requested in the case. If you look at page twenty five, it talks about um, the the um, various numbers, and then you can see there. Um, $74,653,835 uh, are, uh, are the program claw, program costs. Um, and then if you go on to um, page 29, it's gonna have the information on the, um, the actual uh, RPS, um, and reconciliation rider uh, uh, there and there. And um, then just to put it all into context, if, um, if we look at page 31, uh, I'd like to give a real life um, example and based upon um, the information uh, provided um, by SPS, um, you can see um, that Mr. Luce's testimony indicates that if you uh, look at a residential customer uh, uh, utilizing um, 750 kWh per month, that'd be uh, approximately an 80 um, cent a month um, um, potential increase. And so um, those are all the things that everyone agreed to and that I found evidence to support. Um, and then there was one thing that SPS asked for um, that uh, was vigorously opposed. And um, I did not find that the financial incentive proposal uh, um, comported um, either with the renewable statute or with um, the commission's new incentive rule. And I guess uh, briefly, just let me say, um, as you can see in the summary, that what SPS um, requested uh, was an incentive 
um, which they can do, of course, um, under the Renewable Energy Act, um, that's section 62, uh, 16.4D. Um, and then also under the commission's new rule, um, the commission will recall uh, back in May, uh, the commission um, added a uh, financial incentive to its five rules, um, 17.9.572.22. And SPS's proposal um, in a nutshell is that they were um, offering to retire excess RECs or uh, renewable energy certificates um, early. And such early retirement um, would, according to SPS, have achieved um, an early compliance with the 2025 40% um, RPS um, requirement. And um, additionally, in, in, as part of that request, uh, because uh, as SPS admitted, they could not comply with the financial cost benefit analysis uh, part of the commission's new rule, um, they ask that the commission waive that uh, waive that requirement. Essentially, as as you can see uh, in in the summary, um, the first part of the commission's uh, new rule requires that a utility must acquire or produce, or pardon me, produce or acquire renewable energy to be eligible. Um, a renewable energy certificate, um, as the commission knows, is paper evidence of prior renewable energy that's been gener generated. And it is a way that utilities um, show their compliance every year um, by retiring uh, those renewable energy certificates. I did not find that retirement of already produced renewable energy um, to meet the rule 572.22a requirement that a utility must produce or require renewable energy to be eligible for, for the certificate, or pardon me, for the incentive. Uh, as the commission can see, uh, it's a paper exercise and uh, um, I, I did not believe that uh, Retiring RECs uh, comports either with a statutory um, requirement um, in 6216-4D um, that says upon a motion or application by a public utility commission, the commission shall, uh, or upon a motion by an application by any other person, the commission may open a docket to develop a financial incentives to encourage public utilities to produce or acquire renewable energy that exceeds the annual renewable portfolio standard. Um, so that the, the commission's new rule very closely follows the statute. And, and um, again, I, I do not believe that the evidence has shown that retiring RECs would comport with that. Second part of the commission rule provides that any um, proposed incentive uh, must be related to measures implemented by the company after the effective date of the rule to accomplish at least one of the statutory purposes. And again, um, these renewable energy certificates that they're offering to retire, um, that energy has been produced before, before the effective date of, um, uh, of, the, of the commission's new rule, which was May 4th. So again, I, I, I think that their um, incentive, or I found that their incentive proposal failed that also. Um, I, I believe what they were saying is that the actual act of retirement would happen um, after, um, after May 4th, but, but I, don't, I do not believe that's what the commission meant in um, section B. Section C of the commission's rule provides that the applicant um, has a, 
has the burden of proof uh, by a preponderance that the terms uh, and duration of the incentive meet the requirements of the rule. Well, they, they've already failed section A and B, and they admit that they failed section D, which is the, the cost benefit analysis. So if they fail three parts, they, they, can't, fa- they, they can't comply with, with the preponderance. Um, uh, part of, of the commission's rule. Um, and um, as far as getting a variance from a cost benefit, since they had already failed three parts of the rule, I, I, I don't think granting a variance, um, I think it's mo- that the point is, is moot. And uh, I don't think the commission actually has to consider granting them a variance when it would be a legal impossibility for them to comply. And, and that's, that's sort of the, uh, uh, the incentive uh, proposal and um, the evidence that, that I found uh, that, um, that recommends to you, uh, Commission, that you, uh, that you not approve the, the incentive uh, requested by SPS, but that you approve the other six um, requirements regarding their, uh, their plan and their reconciliation riders. And if the commission um, has um, any questions, I will um, attempt to answer those. Commissioners. Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Paul. Uh, I have no questions, but, and if there's no other questions, I would uh, like to make a motion to approve the order. Do we have and a second? Second. Commissioner Maestas seconds. Uh, Mr. Chair, commissioners, if, if I might, um, uh, all, no, all, although I uh, um, have indicated what I believe the evidence has shown, uh, SPS did not agree with me and, and they did file exceptions. Oh, so oh, thank um, you. You, you uh, m- <laughs> might want to hear from Ms. Amer on that. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, the proposed order would adopt the recommended decision in its entirety, right. which, as Elizabeth just said, granted that. SPS's application, except for its request for financial incentive. Um, SPS did file exceptions and we received responses to exceptions. And I will try to go through these as succinctly as possible. However, on November 23rd, SPS filed seven exceptions. Um, They first in exception number one, disagreed with the RD and stated that it established it will need to procure or acquire additional renewable resources as a result of its incentive proposal. And it was not speculative. Um, SPS argues that because of the accelerated retirement of Rex to exceed the applicable renewable portfolio standard um, that it will need to procure, it will need to accelerate the acquisition of additional renewable resources to maintain compliance. Um, And it states specifically, if they continue to retire Rex, minimal Rex of minimum amount of RECs required to comply comply with the RPS. SPS is projecting compliance through 2030 to beyond 2031 (coughs) using uh, planning and financial load forecasts respectively. However, if SPS plan to meet the 40% requirement three years early is approved, SPS is projecting compliance through 2026 and 2029. In other words, if SPS's plan is approved, SPS would be required to accelerate the acquisition of additional renewable resources 
to maintain RPS compliance. Uh, <clears throat> regarding exception number two, they state that the RD improperly and narrowly interprets the words produce or acquire, which is, as Elizabeth stated, the requirement of section 6216.4D. And um, exception number three is that rec retirement is the only mechanism provided by the legislature and uh, for and for the com to demonstrate that the utility has met and exceeded the applicable RPS standard. Exception number four is the RD's finding that the measures proposed are required to have been implemented after the effective date of the rule, May 4th, 2021, is contrary to law because the REA's incentive provisions um, predated the passage of the amendments to the Renewable Energy Act that were contained in the Envi and Energy Transition Act and also predated the amendment of the Commission Rule 572. Exception number five is the RD's finding that a financial incentive cannot be awarded when customers have already paid for renewable energy is wrong because the REA specifically allows for a, a financial incentive in addition to recovery of renewable energy costs. Exception six, it just is a disagreement with the RD on not meeting 572, rule 572.22 A, B, C, and E. And exception number seven is that um, it's request for a variance from section uh, D of 572.22 should be granted. Um, I basically arguing that um, 572 uh, D is not is not a is not a proper rule because it changed the scope of the REA, and it, um, in response to the exceptions on November thirtieth, uh, utility division staff, New Mexico Large Customer Group, um, Occidental Petroleum, and Louisiana Energy Services, all filed responses to SPS's exception, stating that they uh, would like the commission to adopt the recommended decision without any changes. So they all were in favor of granting SPS's application, but denying the financial incentive. Um, I, Instead of uh, telling you what each one said, because uh, they all did say, you know, essentially the same types of, of reasons that the RD was correct. Um, for instance, or in response to SPS's exception number one, um, they all state that it was speculative and projection that the incentive proposal of SPS would result in SPS uh, producing or acquiring an accelerated new additional renewable res uh, uh, resources in the future. Um, they, uh, they all argue that the RD correctly interpreted the REA, which specifically uses the language to produce or acquire, and that uh, a proposal to merely retire excess rate rex uh, is a paper exercise that does not achieve the intended outcome of the REA, which is to actually produce or acquire renewable energy. Uh, in, for one of the three things enumerated, and in this case, it was, it's for exceeding the RPS. In response to exception number three, um, they all stated that, of course, the rec retirement is the mechanism to demonstrate compliance with the RPS, 
but it's not the qualifying action or measure to receive a financial incentive. Rather, it goes back again to the words of the statute, which is to produce or acquire renewable energy. Um, in response to exception number four, um, it, it's been, it was stated that rule 572 is clear. Incentives must be related to measures implemented by the utility after the effective date of the rule. And um, in, speci in specific, I'd like to tell you what staff said, which is um, the statute is essentially trying to provide a carrot at the end of the stick to get public utilities to obtain more renewable energy supplies earlier than they would have otherwise under the applicable renewable portfolio standards. Per the plain language of the statute, the desired would-be behavior to be incentivized is the production or acquisition of renewable energy supplies. So in other words, it clearly anticipates um, something to be done, not, not simply retiring uh, wrecks that were banked. Um, lastly, um, in response to exception number five, all, all of the parties that submitted responses stated that awarding a financial incentive for the retirement of excess wrecks that have already been paid for by customers is contrary to the public interest. Um, the, they all agree that the RD was correct in recognizing that quote, charging customers an incentive for wrecks where customers have already paid for the generation of energy evidenced by those wrecks is not a just or reasonable cost to the rate payer. Regarding exception number six, uh, they, they concur with how the RD went through and showed that the financial incentive failed to meet 572.22 A, B, C, and E. And uh, they all agree that SPS's request for a variance is moot and contrary to the public interest because if you fail to meet the threshold statutory baseline requirement, which is to produce or require renewable energy in excess of renewable portfolio standard, uh, it, you don't need a variance from the rule because you've already failed to meet the, the stash, statutory threshold requirement. In addition, at one point, SPS argued that its uh, financial incentive complies with the RCT, but it, the response to that is that the RCT doesn't apply to a financial incentive. There's a cost benefit analysis in rule 572. In addition, the statute specifically says that the RCT only applies to meet the RPS, but has no application to the award of an incentive to exceed the RPS. And at this point, I stand for questions. Commissioners. I don't believe we have any questions. Uh, do I have a motion? There's a motion and a second on the floor to approve. Okay. We'll just take those motions from, well, let's, let's do these motions again after hearing the exceptions. So. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, I renew my motion to uh, approve the order as written. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, barring further discussion, Mike, please take the roll. Commissioner Byrd. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. 
Aye. Order is approved five to zero. Thank you, H.E. Um, Hurst. You made a very clear presentation and uh, commission really appreciates your thoughtful and concise summary of what's going on here. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, commissioners. Good day. Bye. Okay. Um, all right, we're on to the biggie here. Um, item 20.222UT um, in the matter of the joint application of Ibridola, uh, Avangrid, Avangrid Networks, NM Green Holdings, Public Service Company of New Mex Mexico, and PNM Resources for approval of the merger of NM Green Holdings with PNM Resources approval of a general diversification plan and all other authorizations and approvals required to consummate and implement this transaction. Potential order on certification of the stipulation and order on joint request for our oral argument. And I assume we're gonna take on that second item first. Uh, is that the case, Michael? Um, commissioners, I guess the question is, what I was thinking I would do is actually just present the recommend, uh, excuse me, present the exceptions that were filed without any recommendation from myself um, as to those exceptions. And um, then I suppose then it, being informed on that in, in the public uh, forum, um, you can then take up the uh, question of whether you want to entertain additional argument on those exceptions as, as they've been presented. Um, and based on that, you can decide whether you wanna move forward um, on the issue of issuing an order on the, certificate, the certification of stipulation. Okay, that makes sense to me. So um, I guess we'll go into presentation of the exceptions. Um, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, I guess what I, I'm gonna, oh, open with something that's uh, sort of a side issue, but it was, it's was it been raised in the public comments today. And I just wanted to uh, address this because I think there's been sort of some misperception of where this case is procedurally um, in terms of, and the commission's uh, review of the record and the commissioner's ability to comment on the record. Um, and I'm gonna refer back to, there's a case, Albuquerque, Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority versus the New Mexico Public Regulation Commission. And that's case 210 NMSC uh, 13, and it was issued in 2010. And in that case, um, the New Mexico Supreme Court addressed uh, claims by NIMIAC, which at that time now is NM area, but then was the New Mexico Industrial Energy Consumers Association. And they raised claims that the commission's commissioner's comments during uh, an April 24th hearing demonstrated, quote, that they had made up their minds about the merits of the present case. Um, in that case, the Supreme Court addressed um, allegations of that nature and stated that Quote, opinions formed by the judge on the basis of facts introduced or evidence, or excuse me, events occurring in the course of the current proceedings or of prior proceedings do not constitute a basis for a bias or partiality motion unless they display a deep seated favoritism or antagonism that would make a fair judgment impossible. Thus, judicial remarks during the course of the trial that are critical or disapproving of or even hostile to counsel, the parties, or their cases ordinarily do not support a bias or partiality challenge. And then they refer back to the comments that were made by, at that time, Commissioner King and Commissioner Jones, stating that the timing of Commissioner King's and Commissioner Jones's remarks indicate that they were based on the evidence adduced in the right case, as well as the direct testimony filed by PNM in the present case. 
Absent evidence to the contrary, we will not presume that these remarks were based on information obtained outside the course of the proceeding. So I just wanted to bring that up and also explain that procedurally, the evidentiary record in this case closed in, on August 19th um, of this year. It's been quite a while. Um, since that time, other uh, procedural events in this case, um, staff, uh, excuse me, um, post-hearing briefs were filed on September 21st. Response, the certification of stipulation, which is the recommendation of the hearing examiner who acts as a proxy for the commissioners in conducting the hearing, was issued on November 1st of this year. The exceptions were filed on November 12th, and the responses were filed on November 19th. Um, at this point, and I, should, I guess I should explain also that the exceptions are basically the response arguments of the parties to the recommendation that's issued by the hearing examiner. This has all been a public record for quite a while. The evidentiary record has been closed for a significant period of time. Um, so I just wanted to address that because there were a number of parties who raised, um, and it's been raised in the press um, by uh, some persons, um, alleging that the commission has acted in some way improperly um, by expressing uh, their opinions or, or, or views on matters of evidence that have been out since August of this year. Um, so based on that, I'm going to switch over to the exceptions. Mike, Mr. Chairman, if I would. Sure. So, so Mike, there's also been some comments in the press regarding a lack of due process. And I, you know, obviously you're alluding to that in discussing uh, timelines regarding closure of the evidentiary record and exceptions and so forth. But can you just clarify uh, or address you know, the perceptions that, um, that this commission and this agency or this commission is not uh, allowing for due process. Can you just briefly speak on that? Um, well, as I said, the, the evidentiary record in this case closed back in August. Um, and as, as I also said, the exceptions, the parties have had their opportunity under the commission's rules of procedure to present their arguments in writing to the commission. Um, those are arguments. And as the case I just cited uh, notes, um, comments on the evidence by the commission or you know, parties that are acting as judges, and this is consistent with court law as well, that comments on the evidence at the time it's being heard um, or after the close of the evidence is not improper by, by a judge unless um, there's some other evidence that there's some form essentially of animosity or deep seated bias um, by a judge. And, but commenting on the evidence itself that the parties have had their opportunity to present um, is, not, is, not a, uh, is, not a is not a violation of the party's due process rights. It's not prejudgment. And um, I, I basically wanted to provide that for the, uh, that law um, because I think comments on that um, to the press um, to create a, a perception that that the law provides otherwise, or that there's some uh, request that's pending to the commission to take additional evidence um, is incorrect. The record closed. Nobody is asking that this commission take additional evidence or open the evidentiary record. Um, they are right now. The only question is. Um, considering the arguments, and arguments are not evidence. Um, so, Mike, thanks you very much for clarifying that. I had a little note here to ask you to clarify the law uh, in relation to that that I was going to ask a little further down the road. But I think you're right to clarify that up front, and, and I appreciate your doing that. Um, we have not violated due process. We have not um, prejudged anything because we had a full evidentiary record in front of us this entire time. And um, uh, 
thank you for uh, citing a legal precedent and uh, making the law clear on this. Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner Hall. So, yeah, I would like to thank Mike, too. Uh, I was dismayed to see that um, our, our commission took hits in the press uh, for uh, essentially uh, stating our, our thoughts based on the record evidence. So I think it's really good to make it clear to the public that um, the evidentiary record was complete and had been complete for some time and uh, nobody's due process rights were being impinged upon. And I also wanted to just make a mention that I, I think maybe the public who don't usually listen into our, our hearings don't really understand our process, but I, in my opinion, we were embarking on our deliberation process phase uh, where we um, discuss cases in public, uh, unlike uh, what an appellate level court would do, which is in effect how we sit because our decisions are appealed directly to the Supreme Court. Um, but, and I understand from general counsel that we actually do have the option to deliberate in private. And I know we are, the commission used to do that, but they switched in uh, the, around 2000, middle of 2004 or five or something uh, for the purpose of just providing more transparency to the public. So, you know, our, our organization has made a, a choice to have our deliberations in the public eye. And it may be kind of shocking to members of the public who don't listen in on us much to hear us express uh, what they think is uh, an unfounded opinion um, when they don't know that it is in fact based on facts. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I would just like to point out that we're trying to be more transparent and this is our only opportunity while all five of us are on the bench to be able to express our opinions to each other. So, you know, unless we choose to go behind closed doors, which sometimes I think would be more profitable because we could be more efficient in our exchanges. We've taken what I think is a, uh, you know, a, uh, a more transparent approach for the public's benefit to have our discussions in public. And we have to be direct and we have to be frank. And when we have long agendas, we need to be efficient. So I think um, I'm, I'm proud of the way we interact uh, and I, I think it's very productive and I'm, but I'm very appreciative that Mike, as you say, found some, uh, found the, uh, you know, statement by the Supreme Court itself that uh, what we're doing is uh, essentially quite correct. So thanks very much. I'll stop there. Okay, Mike, you're, uh, you, you got the favor of a lot of commissioners already. So. You're on a roll here. Continue. Well, I'll probably lose that other one, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I I I on occasion I read what I've written rather than summarize it, and I think today I will do that so that it's clear exactly what um, is being presented to the commission. Um, the and uh, Mike, will you as you're reading, will you mind if we interject with questions as you go? Oh, yeah. I, I'm not shaving while I'm doing this, but <laughs> I'm not sure what that was. So um, I would also uh, point out, I'm just looking at who's here on the screen and I, I spot Ashley is present. Um, and I asked Ashley to uh, to attend this uh, this meeting because um, he has, obviously you've heard from him once, but you have the opportunity to clarify factual issues that he has um, addressed in his recommend decision here. But, so I will go through the uh, exceptions. Um, the first exception that I'm addressing is the joint applicants exception one and the signatories um, exception number one and two. And just by way of background, I'm gonna read to you um, who, the, who those 
two uh, party or those two groupings of parties are. The joint applicants for purpose of the public are Oven Grid Inc., Oven Grid Networks Inc., NM Green Holdings Inc., Public Service Company of New Mexico, and PNM Resources, which is parent uh, PNM's parent company, uh, together with Iberdrola SA, um, who is the owner of Oven Grid. Um, the signatories are the New Mexico Attorney General. Uh, these are the signatories to the June 4th stipulation, which was the subject of the hearing in this matter, the evidentiary hearing. Um, the New Mexico Attorney General, Western Resources Advocates, um, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 611, uh, DNA Citizens Against Ruining Our Environment, um, known as DNA Care, Nava Education Project, San Juan Citizens Alliance, To, I'm going to mispronounce this, To Nizhoni Ani, um, the Coalition for Clean Affordable Energy, uh, referred to as CCAE, Interwest Energy Alliance, Walmart Inc., Onward Energy Holdings LLC, the Incorporated County of Los Alamos, and MSR Public Power Agency. Um, just, I'm trying to find, okay, I'm not finding it, but, um, sorry, I just lost my screen here. The first, the first exceptions were filed by the, as I said, the joint applicants and the signatories. Um, the joint applicant's first exception disagrees with the certification on two basic grounds. Joint applicants first disagree that the certification statement that the majority of parties are not in agreement that the proposed transaction should be approved based on the totality of benefits and protections agreed to by the joint, by the joint applicants. Secondly, joint applicants disagree with the certification's ultimate conclusion that the potential risks of approving the proposed transaction outweigh the concrete benefits of the proposed transaction. On the first point, joint applicants assert there was a consensus among almost all of the parties that they support, or at least do not oppose, the proposed transaction based on the significant benefits set forth in the June 4th stipulation, as well as the additional benefits and enhancements agreed to by the joint applicants. Joint applicants assert none of the 23 of the 24 parties supporting or not opposing the proposed transaction objected to joint applicants agreeing to additional benefits and protections. The signatories similarly argue that the certification erred in stating that the original signatories to the June 4th stipulation no longer support the terms of that stipulation. The signatories argue that the post-hearing statements of position filed by each of the signatories on August 30th, 2021 demonstrate that each continued to support the June 4th stipulation. Differences related to the post-stipulation regulatory commitments that joint applicants made in order to address issues raised by non-signatories did not change that support. The joint applicants nonetheless go on to acknowledge that, quote, following the filing of the June 4th stipulation, negotiations continued among the parties for additional benefits and enhanced commitments to the stipulation. This activity apparently underlies the hearing examiner's observation that the signatories no longer support the June 4th stipulation. Sorry, I'm trying to pull my screen down. While joint applicants argue that those benefits and commitments, quote, were confirmed in the record by the joint applicants and certain parties during the evidentiary hearing, they also acknowledge that those benefits are not reflected in a consolidated written agreement that embodies all of these additional benefits and enhancements. In addition to affirming support and implicitly urging approval of what would constitute a new stipulation, modified through oral concessions during the hearing proceedings, but not reduced to a writing executed by the parties, joint applicants now and the signatories now further confirm that the joint applicants would accept the hearing examiners suggested modifications to the June 4th stipulation set forth as the modified stipulation attached as Appendix 2 to the certification. In their exception, the signatories likewise affirm 
quote, all of the hearing examiner modifications contained in Appendix 2 are acceptable to and supported by the signatories. In its response to exceptions, the city of Albuquerque also indicates it would accept the provisions of Appendix 2. Notwithstanding this, and al although not identified expressly as exceptions, several sections of joint applicants pleading express continued disagreement with certain Appendix 2 modifications. Specifically, joint applicants indicate continued dissatisfaction with the reliability metrics and automatic penalties in regulatory commitment number 36 of Appendix 2. While acknowledging that the goal of these provisions is to ensure that PNM's reliability does not deteriorate under Avon Grid ownership, joint applicants reassert that the Commission limit the application of these standards to a five year period and that the Commission should develop reliability standards and penalties applicable to all utilities. Joint applicants assert the Appendix 2 standards would be, quote, a discriminatory approach to quality of service that does not correlate with identifiable impacts of the merger. Joint applicants argue that, quote, PNM's reliability metrics over the, both the last five years and the last 15 years are consistent with or more reliable than those of other electric utilities operating in the state. And quote, no other New Mexico ut electric utility is subject to penalties for failing to meet the same or similar standards to be required of PNM. Yet joint applicants also assert, quote, imposition of the proposed standards could place PNM immediately in non-compliance and subject to substantial penalties that would not necessarily be tied to any degradation in overall service. Nonetheless, joint applicants go on to acknowledge that they would accept this provision if necessary. Joint applicants further note disagreement with regulatory commitment number 17 in the appendix two, requiring a majority of independent directors and PNM's board of directors. The joint applicants continue to argue that 23 of the 24 parties in this case did not seek this requirement and it is unnecessary due to, quote, other protections and commitments agreed to by joint applicants, including the authority of the three independent directors to make determinations regarding dividends, dividend policy, and compensation for officers and directors. Again, joint applicants indicate they will accept this provision if necessary. The second point of joint applicants' first exception is that the regulatory commitments accepted under the June 4th stipulation as augmented through testimony at the hearing and further augmented by their acceptance of the terms of Appendix 2, the modified stipulation, are sufficient to outweigh any perceived risks of the pro proposed transaction. Joint applicants devote almost seven pages of their exception to reiterating the benefits already outlined in the certification together with the additional concessions. So um, Mike, just a quick question here. Um, you know, as I'm reading this, and I've read through the exceptions as well, uh, it feels like through the exceptions, they're still negotiating terms of the deal. Um, am I correct? Uh, is that your assessment as well, or do you see it differently? Um, to the extent that they are indicating, um, I don't know if I would say negotiating, but I would say that they are uh, essentially signaling that they would accept the terms of the um, proposed um, modified stipulation that's attached as Appendix 2. Uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Yes, Chair? Go ahead. Go ahead. Just on your point, uh, well, and I, you know, I, I understand Mike saying it looks like they're signaling they would accept, but uh, it also signals, uh, you know, a certain dissatisfaction with those with those provisions, which, to me, is uh, a little unsettling. It's just a okay. That's, no that's, that's all I needed to hear. Yeah, and I, I yeah. think actually, uh, thank you, Mike. I think your assessment of it probably is a little more on point than where I was coming from. Thank you. Um, I think I'm on, okay, the signatory is without elaboration and CCAE also assert the certification erred in finding that potential, the potential harms of the proposed transaction outweigh its benefits. Um, 
The joint applicants argue that these commitments will, quote, uh, rather, quote, will provide more than 300 million in quantifiable benefits in the form of customer rate credits and funding, economic development funding, and funding for a wide array of other beneficial programs. Joint applicants point to 67 million in customer rate credits over three years, $10 million in residential COVID relief, $2 million to increase access to electric utility service for rural and Native American communities, $15 million for new low income energy efficiency programs, and a commitment that PNM will not file a new rate case prior to December 31st, 2022. Joint applicants also point to un- unquantifiable benefits in the form of economic development, environmental, and miscellaneous additional regulatory commitments they assert will, quote, provide significant benefits to PM's customers, the communities where PM does business, and the state as a whole. Joint applicants cite to the following econom- economic development commitments. Wait, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair. Can I ask Mike a question? On the previous, on your on your previous uh, paragraph, my paragraph fifteen. You know, how do they get the figure three hundred million? Do you have any idea? Because if it's three hundred million in quantifiable benefits, uh, maybe I didn't multiply by the years or something. I don't know. I don't understand. But those numbers that you recited don't add up to three hundred. Uh, I just wondered if any if you had a clue if that number is what that number is reflecting besides what is recited here um i believe there was there is some place where the where that calculation is is done off off at this moment i don't have that yeah to me i mean if we took a break at some point i could yeah uh, there, ashley do you have a thought on that oh yeah i meant I, ashley would know yeah uh, no, not off the top of my head. I don't have uh, okay. I don't where that came from. I mean, I, Mr. Chair, I added them up and it's like not even half of 300. So uh, just wanted to ask somebody where that came from. Anyhow. And I, I, I will mark that down as a question that I can sure. try and find. Right. Okay. And Ashley, if you want to look for that while I'm doing this, that would be helpful. Um, Let's see, where was I? 16, paragraph 16. Um, Okay, joint applicant cite to the following economic development commitments. 150 new full-time jobs within three years, no layoffs or wage reductions at PNM for at least three years, $25 million in in funding for economic development projects over 10 years, $12.5 million in funding for economic development projects by indigenous community groups in the Four Corners region, commitment for an avant-grid non-utility affiliate to work with the Navajo Nation toward the development of a renewable energy generation project of at least 200 megawatts, 1 million over two years to create or supplement a scholarship program in the Albuquerque Bernalillo County metropolitan area, $1 million to create or enhance in, uh, apprenticeships and local high schools and colleges, um, partnering with a gov- with governmental agencies to improve internet access in New Mexico by waiving rental fees for a three-year period for local government access to PNM owned wooden street light poles, lighting poles within one half mile of public schools and government owned or authorized low income facilities, providing Albuquerque park street lighting and completing construction of a PNM owned substation to serve a growing area of Southeast Albuquerque that includes the international, Albuquerque International Sunport. Joint applicants point to environmental commitments to foster sustainability and carbon reduction, including executive compensation incentives for meeting PNM's 2040 carbon reduction credit, creation of a chief environmental officer provision, a per, excuse me, position, Uh, environmental studies addressing infrastructure requirements of projected electric vehicle demands, decarbonization of commercial buildings and achieving a 1.5% annual incremental energy efficiency savings in PNM service territory, making efforts to join a regional 
uh, transmission organization by January 1st, 2030, and expanding the existing solar, uh, solar direct program. The joint applicants assert these benefits significantly exceed the benefits offered in any previous utility merger proceeding in the state's history, noting that the financial credits exceed those rate credits made in the last three acquisition merger cases approved by the commission. Those are the Amera acquisition for $8 million credit, TICO merger, $11 million credit, and EPE merger for $8.7 million. Uh, CCAE's separate exception likewise argues that the hearing examiner did not give sufficient weight to the substantial benefits of approving the proposed transaction. CCAE points to many of the same commitments identified in PNM exceptions. CCAE urges that customer benefits include low income and all customer energy efficiency program and investments, weatherization, arrears forgiveness, and electric energy access to service. CCAE points to environmental benefits, including a commitment and plan to accelerate decarbonization, aiming at a zero emissions grid by 2035, a full two, 10 years before New Mexico, current, New Mexico law currently requires, with a clear timeline and milestones, accelerating transportation electrification with low income access, grid modernization, building electrification with low income access, expanding demand response programs and joining a regional transmission authority, RTO. CCAE identifies just trans transition commitments, including, quote, applying shareholder funds to provide additional uh, assistance to workers and the community that is equal to, but not tied to the regulatory process of energy transition funds resulting from securitization with community involvement in the allocation of the funds and a commitment to expand the, new, the workforce in New Mexico to include renewable energy development and expertise. CCAE further ca characterizes the certifications concerns about the level of regulatory supervision that will be needed to ensure that Avangrid slash PNM adheres to its regulatory commitments, including complying with protections to ensure service quality and reliability um, is what of, excuse me, I, I kind of misread that, is the result of what CCAE characterizes as the elephant in the room. Without sp further specificity, CCAE asserts that the PRC, quote, has been operating over the past couple of years under difficult circumstances and a challenging regulatory environment, which has made the PR PRC's essential work challenging. CCAE states that it disagrees with the hearing examiner that the PRC is not up to the task of regulating an Avangrid owned PNM, but recognizes that proper resources and staffing for the PRC is needed for the PRC to do its job, including the implementation of the merger commitments, as well as the important laws the legislature has passed to combat cl climate change and commerce commence, excuse me, a just transition. Joint applicants further disagree with the certification skepticism about the purported financial benefits the proposed transaction would bring. The joint applicants continue to assert that the merger will improve PNM's credit metrics and credit rating and therefore save customers money due to PNM's lower cost of borrowing and PNM's greater access to capital for utility investments and operations. Joint applicants point out that Avangrid will extinguish all of PNMR's debt and improve PNMR's credit met metrics, as well as which what they, as well, which they assert will quote help improve PNM's financial flexibility, resilience, and access to debt capital, and will likely lead to SP upgrading PNM's credit rating. Joint applicants assert that these financial benefits have been verified by third parties and point to the joint applicant's testimony that. PNM's customers may save an estimated $21.5 million over, rather, over in three in years from a one-notch um, improvement in PNM's credit rating. They further assert that, quote, following the announcement of the proposed transaction, SP upgraded the credit outlook for both PNMR and PNM from stable to positive. Joint applicants also note that the PRC utility division staff is in agreement that the PNM's credit metrics are likely to improve as a result of the proposed transaction um, with resulting benefits to customers in the form of better credit terms and a lower cost of debt. 
Joint applicants note that all of Avon Grid's utility subsidiaries with published credit ratings have a higher credit, excuse me, have higher credit ratings than PNM and PNMR. Joint applicants further assert that the certifications focus on the penalties and negative revenue adjustments that have been incurred by Alvin Grid's utilities in the Northeast, ignores that many of those utilities meet or exceed the vast majority of customer service metrics and reliability standards set with our customers. They argue that many of the revenue adjustments are related to performance incentive rate making methodologies adopted by other jurisdictions and do not necessarily reflect decreased or deficient levels of customer service, just as rate adjustment increases do not necessarily correlate with issues pertaining to customer service. Joint applicants further argue that the, quote, the fines or penalties that have been leveled against Avon Grid utilities in New York, Connecticut, and Maine have either been remedied by Avon Grid or are far lower than peer utilities in the region reflecting incomparably better performance. They argue that this overlooks the broader context of statewide penalties for all of the major utilities in those states, which are the result of more frequent and intense weather events in the Northeast due to climate change. Joint applicants assert that for the same storm events in New York, Consolidated Edison was fined $80 million compared to Avangrid's $10 million fine, while in Connecticut, Eversource was fined $28 million compared to Avangrid's $2 million. Joint applicants acknowledged that Central Power, Main, excuse me, Central Maine Power Company did not meet customer service expectations between 2016 and 2019, but assert Avangrid and, and CMP moved quickly to add resources, implement system changes, and promote new leaders to improve customer service. Since then, for almost two years, the evidence reflects that CMP has addressed these issues and sat has satisfied and continues to satisfy and exceed the Maine Public Utility Commission's stringent customer service metrics. Joint applicants assert Alvin Grid has been reinvesting in Cape May, me, sorry, <laughs> um, CMP's infrastructure to address performance issues and its reliability metrics are better than those of its peer utilities. Joint applicants assert it is incorrect to suggest they are purporting and providing poor service to customers. Joint applicants further argue that the regulatory commitments as revised by Appendix 2 will, quote, protect against any concern that PNM might face any pressures to divert from funds from system investments to dividend payouts because independent board members must approve any PNM dividend payments to its shareholders. Joint applicants point to the provisions in Appendix 2, um, and I will, this sort of recites them. PNM cannot pay dividends if its credit rating is too low or its capital structure is not maintained. Appendix 2, paragraphs 28 through 30, PNM must adhere to its existing plans to invest in system maintenance, upgrades, and improvements. Appendix 2, paragraph 36, PNM must maintain adequate personnel and hire new electric craftsmen as necessary, Appendix 2, paragraphs 2, 21, and 36. And PNM must meet stringent reliability metrics or face penalties. And that's Appendix 2, Attachment 1. Joint applicants also argue Avangrid's actions in Maine in investigating the Clean Energy Matters ballot initiative against Avangrid subsidiary NCEC's transmission line were not contrary to the law. They can assert the record evidence showed that Avangrid's challenge of the ballot signatures was proper, as the signatures were ultimately invalidated by the Maine Secretary of State. Joint applicants assert the certification erred in asserting that the joint applicants provided no evidence that signature gathering firm Revolutionary, excuse me, Revolution Field Strategies, RFS, had a documented history of fraud, noting that witness Mr. Kump provided letters to the Maine Ethics Commission as evidence of fraudulent activity in previous campaigns. With regard to the ongoing criminal investigation in Spain, joint applicants state no criminal charges ha have been levied against any of Rodrola executives and no charges may ever be filed. Joint applicants assert it would be inappropriate and prejudicial to draw negative inferences in this case by assuming a particular outcome or wrongdoing due to this investigation. NEE's response to exceptions argues that the exceptions essentially consist of joint applicants and signatories signaling their disagreement with the suggested additional terms set out 
in, by the hearing examiner in appendix two to the certification in the event the commission disagreed with the certification and found that the benefits of the proposed transaction outweighed the potential harms. NEE argues that the joint applicants and signatories asked this commission to overlook Alvin Grid Iberdrola's track record because of the purported strengths of Alvin Grid Iberdrola, which are experience with renewable energy and financial strength, but the evidence at the hearing demonstrated otherwise. I did not ind indicate who NEE is. NEE, if there's anyone who does not know, is New Energy Economy, uh, intervener in the case. NEE argues that the record demonstrates Iberdrola Alvin Grid cannot be trusted to comply with laws, rules, standards, and management dictates. NEE points to Iberdrola Alvin Grid's violation of discovery rules by providing incomplete responses, failing to supplement responses, and over designation of materials as confidential which led to the hearing examiner's recommendation of sanction. NEE also points to the joint application's inclusion of compromise positions in their post-hearing brief contrary to the hearing examiner's direction, which led to the hearing examiner striking a portion of the joint applicant's pleading. NEE notes that these concerns underlie the certification's concern about sig the significant effort that will be needed to enforce the terms of the proposed transaction, noting the pending criminal investigation in Spain and Avangrid's efforts to avoid regu regulatory location control review for its El Cabo wind project. NEE further points to Avangrid and its affiliates in the Northeast accumulation of $63.1 million in fines and violations over the last five years. Avangrid's formation of a pact to oppose an initiative to oppose uh, CMP's transmission line project and reliability and performance issues with Avon Grid's subsidiaries in Maine, New York, and Connecticut, resulting in regulatory actions. NEE further argues that Avon Grid Iberdrola's touted experience in renewables is restricted to wind and that joint applicants admitted that Avon Grid's lack of experience in solar. NEE argues that the joint applicants characterization of the value of the proposed benefits of the transaction in comparison to previously approved mergers, noting the size differential between the utilities in those cases. NEE notes its, dis its agreement with the hearing examiner that, quote, taken together, the promised benefits do not outweigh the potential risks and harms, and argues, quote, the reference point to determine net public benefit must take into consideration the distribution of benefits between ratepayers, uh, $1.64 per month for three years for residential rate payers. Um, senior management, golden parachutes for three PNMR, PNM executives equaling more than $29 million, far exceeds the amount of all, rather, excuse me, far exceeds the amount all residential rate payers will receive and hundreds of millions to shareholders. If the four corner divestiture required by this merger is approved by the hearing, excuse me, is approved as recommended by the hearing examiner in case 2117 UT, ratepayers will be required to pay 300 million in a non-bypassable charge on their monthly bill. And this will adversely impact ratepayers' existing rates and result in a net loss as a result of the merger. NEE further urges the commission to reject Avon Grid Iberdrola's argument that, in, that with respect to the penalties incurred in the East, they should be viewed in comparison with other major utilities in those states. NEE argues this is part of an emerging pattern. Iberdrola, quote, Iberdrola Avangrid skirt the law or rules to their own advantage, and if caught, either blame external circumstances, claim confusion by the company or the, the interrogator, um, I assume that refers to the, inter, the uh, discovery dispute, downplay the relative seriousness of the claim, and then settle or litigate. NEE argues that the joint applicants exceptions acknowledge central main power companies did not perform to Avangrid's expectations for customer service between 2016 and 19, and disagrees, rather agrees that the billing system rollout in Maine was not executed well, and that there were initially not enough customer service representatives to help with customers' questions and concerns. NEE argues the commission should reject the joint applicant's argument that Avangrid has moved quickly to add resources, implement system changes, 
and promote new leaders to improve customer service, noting that management audits continue to show quality of service deterioration, staffing instability, organizational flux, and mismanagement, leading to widespread system unreliability, customer dissatisfaction, and failure to abide by regulatory rules. Finally, NEE notes that while joint applicants assert that they would accept the provisions of Appendix 2, their exceptions show that the joint applicants don't want to abide by commission-determined reliability metrics to protect customers and argue that an independent PM board of directors isn't necessary. Um, so that is the bulk of the exceptions um, summarized to some degree and with citations to a fair amount of what was actually argued. Um, I have, uh, I think the screen that was just came up, I blocked out um, a proposed response that was drafted um, so that this could be put up on the screen um, before the, because the commission obviously has to make a determination. Um, and I do not know at this time if the commission wants to uh, entertain additional um, oral argument on the issues that were raised above uh, before making a decision or not. So that would be a threshold issue. I do have another exception um, addressed in this recommended decision, um, which is really more of a matter of law um, and that is not blocked out. And if the commission wants me to address that before it considers the other issues, I can, um, but I, I'll, just wanted to point out where we are in terms of what I've presented um, and the commission can decide that. And that legal issue is the exception that was taken by the joint applicants to the uh, imposition of sanctions for discovery violations. Um, Mr. Chair, I think Mike should just go ahead and cover that one as well because uh, it will sort of set the stage for some comments I have, uh, or some, not comments, I, yeah, comments and questions I have following this presentation. So if you could just go ahead and do that, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, well, certainly. Uh, go ahead and cover that, Mike. And what I'd like to do, commissioners, is it's a quarter to one. After Mike does that, uh, we'll take a 45 minute lunch break because uh, then we start to get into some uh, heavy and potentially contentious discussions. So um, if you're all good with that, well, uh, then maybe he should put it off until after that break. No, 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 no. Let's, let's hear it now so we've heard all the exceptions together. Or if, if you feel it's better to do it after lunch, we can do that as well, Commissioner Hall. Um, no, I, you know, I don't, it's all right. Preference. It's fine. He could go ahead and do it now then. Okay. It's all right. Either way is fine with me. If we're ready for lunch, I'm glad to do it that way. Uh, I can make it work either way. Okay, so Mike, why don't you just go through that and then we'll... Do the, do the other commissioners have a view on that? I don't know what we're talking I'm okay about. with that. Um, however, I, I'd prefer that you not only finish the exceptions, but just briefly go over the proposed order for mm -hmm. oral arguments. Um, if, if you think that that'll you can do that quickly before we break for lunch. Sure, I can do that. So, um, um, excuse me, just can, the pit, can I insert Go here? Yeah. My concern was related to whether we should hear oral arguments because New Energy Economy had uh, filed a, uh, a response to that request and uh, that I wanted to address that. Uh, so even before we get to a discussion of the uh, next step, I, this, would, this would address the um, issue of whether we should go forward with oral arguments. So it may be better to do that after lunch. I don't know, because it, it'll take some, it won't take a long time, but I think it's important to understand the arguments pro and con for proceeding with oral arguments. Other commissioner comments on this? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Uh, 
Yes, I think your recommendation is good. Um, allow Michael Smith to finish, and once we come back from lunch, we can go into the other matters. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, hey, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Uh, well, I was going to say what I can do is uh, I can go over the the um, the motion for oral argument, and then I think if we're going to break for lunch, it probably would be a good idea that the um, the commissioners should have received a copy of uh, New Energy Economy's um, response as well as the motion and my order. Um, but that response was not filed until late um, yesterday. Um, this has all been kind of on a compressed schedule because the the motion was filed on Friday night, on Friday afternoon, rather. Um, so that way everybody has an opportunity after they hear what I've said to, to review the actual pleadings and ask, pose additional questions if they have not already had a chance to review that since it was sent out uh, late. Okay. So Mr. Chair, I, I think uh, I'd like to ask Mike to be sure and send that pleading to all the commissioners during at the beginning of the break. So they do have an opportunity to see it. I didn't see it until late last night. Uh, and I just found it in my email. Uh, I had been searching in the document, in the docket for other pleadings and so forth, things that had been filed recently. And I was unable to find a number of things because I, we're not keeping up with it fast enough in the docket, I don't think. But um, in any case, uh, I think some uh, important issues are raised and I think that we should look at that. And it's probably better when we're not feeling hungry so we could pay attention and people would have an opportunity to read it during the break because it's short and to the point, but it's something that we should consider if we're going to be fair to all parties. Yeah, it's especially important because I hear that Commissioner Bird gets really grumpy if he's too hungry. No, he's not the Lone Ranger. There you go. <laughs> okay. The only Ranger. <laughs> We're, I know, we're just all city slickers to you. Uh, Mike, uh, so go ahead and um, we'll break after you're uh, done with this piece of it. Okay, so the, um, the second exception, um, and I'm just going to read what I have in here, which is joint applicants argue that Avon Grid should not be sanctioned for failing to fully answer any ease discovery requests by requiring Avangrid to pay NEE's attorney's fees, asserting that Avangrid acted in good faith in attempting to answer all discovery requests and has already been appropriately admonished by the hearing examiner for filing incomplete responses to NEE 455. 455 is the number of the interrogatory, which requested all current or pleading, in, excuse me, pending instances of non-compliance with any state, federal law, or commission rule or order by Iberdrola, Avangrid, or any of its affiliates for which the company may be liable and subject to criminal, civil or criminal penalties for the last 10 years. Joint applicants continue to argue that Avangrid properly disclosed certain additional matters not previously disclosed when responding to the hearing examiner's May 11th order, which requested a list of enforcement actions and enforcement measures in rate or other proceedings initiated or concluded by state and federal regulatory agencies since January 1st, 2016 against Avangrid Inc.'s electric and gas utility subsidiaries and the results of the actions and measures. Joint applicants argue that Avangrid's May 18th response to the hearing examiner's request and its response to NAE 455 were meant to address different questions. They further argue, quote, not all fines and penalties are assessed um, because of enforcement actions or enforcement measures, and not all enforcement, measure, enforcement actions and measures are considered to be fines or penalties. As a result, joint applicants assert Avangrid provided different sets of materials based on its interpretation of the question and which items were enforcement actions and enforcement measures. Joint applicants assert that the items the certification identifies as not having been provided in violation of discovery obligations were not the results of, quote, enforcement actions or measures. The joint applicants urge that Avangrid was not intentionally non-responsive and should not face monetary sanctions. Joint applicants further argue discovery sanctions are warranted only if a motion to compel has been granted and a party refuses to comply, 
which is not the case as Avon Grid provided the information requested by the hearing examiner and NAE as the scope of those requests became clearer. The commission response finding that I propose is that the commission finds that hearing examiners findings of discovery violations by Avon Grid and sanctions are appropriate, were appropriate is supported by the record in, as set forth in the certification and is consistent with New Mexico law governing the imposition of sanctions for discovery sanctions. The certification notes, quote, this, any e-motion asks that the joint applicants be re ordered to reimburse Mariel Nanasi, attorney for new energy economy for the time expended on any six efforts to resolve discovery disputes, including the bringing of this motion paid for by shareholder funds, quote, not to be reimbursed by ratepayers. However, the hearing examiner's June 14th, 2021 order required, quote, responsive testimony, including the amount of and support for any recovery of attorney's fees as sanctions shall be filed by July 16th, 2021. The June 14th order further required, quote, the issue of whether to order sanctions and or administrative penalties and the amount thereof shall be litigated through examination of the above testimony at the hearings scheduled to start on August 11th. The issue will be resolved in the recommendation to be issued by the hearing examiner after the hearing and the subsequent decision issued by the commission. However, the case record reflects that NEE failed to file the requisite testimony in support of its request for attorney's fees as required by the June, 15, excuse me, June 14th order. That's a, a typo. The certification concedes the issue of the appropriate sanction is made more difficult due to the failure of NEE to provide any testimony on this issue. Rule 1037A provides that, quote, the court may apportion the reasonable expenses incurred in relation to the motion it's a motion for sanctions among the parties and persons in a just manner. However, while the certification recommends that NEE be awarded attorney fees, this met recommendation must be rejected because NEE's failure to abate the June 14th order and provide testimony concerning the amount and reasonableness of such fees deprives the commission of the requisite evidentiary basis on which to make a determination of both the amount and reasonableness of the attorney's fees requested as a sanction. The June 14th order specifically required the filing of testimony on this point, set a deadline for the filing of that testimony, and provided that the issue of administrative penalties and the amount thereof would be litigated through examination of that testimony at the hearing scheduled to start on August 11, 2021. NEE's failure to submit the testimony on these points as required by the June 14th order constitutes a waiver of its demand for re reimbursement of those attorney's fees. However, to be clear, NEE's failure to support its request for attorney's fees does not affect the commission's finding that sanctions against joint applicants were warranted based on the violations of the hearing examiner's orders with regard to the discovery proceedings. In addition, an award of attorney's fees is only one of the sanctions available under Rule 1037. Many of the other sanctions available in the judicial courts, such as striking claims and defenses, are not appropriate in administrative regulatory proceedings due to the fact to the, that the commission handles matters of public import rather than private disputes. Again, however, while these other sanctions may not be appropriate, the commission finds that some form of sanction is still appropriate based on the hearing examiner's finding of the joint applicant's violations of the hearing examiner's orders and the impact of those violations on the development of evidence in this case. The hearing examiner's June 14th order placed the joint applicants on notice that administrative penalties under uh, NMSA 1978 section 62.12.4 may be obsessed. That section provides any person or corporation which violates any provision of the Public Utility Act or which fails or omits to or neglects to obey, observe, or comply with any lawful order um, or any part or provision thereof of the commission is subject to a penalty of not less than $100 nor more than $100,000 for each offense. Accordingly, the commission finds that the sanctions under section 62.12.4 are appropriate in this matter. While 62.12 provides for fines ranging from $100 to $100,000, the amount of the sanctions should be bear some relation and be proportional 
proportionate to the impact on the proceedings. The commission finds that a penalty of $10,000 is appropriate as a remedial remedy based on the disruption to the proceedings and the additional time and effort that the hearing examiner was required to devote to this issue and reviewing related pleadings, testimony, and issuing orders addressing the hearing, the joint applicant's failure to obey the orders to provide discovery. Um, so that would be the proposed finding on that fact. I mean, on that exception. I think Steve, yeah, Commissioner, I mean, Chairman. You're I'm unmuting, yeah. Thanks, Mike. And he calls me Steve when we're not in meetings, which is great. Um, the, um, is there anything else that um, commissioners need to hear before we go to break? Uh, okay. Mr. Chair, no, uh, I could, uh, I'll bring up my issues about this after we come back from break. Okay, so it is one o'clock now. Um, let's come back at 1.45 and proceed from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ashley, are you there? Yes. I was wondering if you managed to track down those numbers before we get started. Well, <clears throat> actually, I don't recall them making that claim in in the, their brief, but if you look at page eight of their exceptions, they refer to uh, uh, $200 million of economic development benefits. I think that's where the where they get to 300 million. If you total up the, if you just do the arithmetic on the numbers for the rate credits and all that, that comes out to about 124 million. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they're, they seem to be linking the 200 million to the 150 jobs that that are at issue in the stipulation, and they're claiming that that will generate uh, 105 million dollars over five years, mm -hmm. and then they're claiming that the spending that those 150 people do uh, will generate another 255 jobs, which they estimate will lead to about a hundred million dollars over eight years. Ah. You, have to, you, have to, you have to go to the, the footnote and the, and the uh, testimony that they cite there. Footnotes 36 and 37. Okay. That's where uh, Ms. Kalichi makes those estimates. So I'll, um, uh, I'll ask you to, when we restart to um, just real quickly cover that. Okay. okay. Mr. Chairman, I, it's Michael Smith. I just forwarded you a copy of that testimony with the pertinent sections, uh, not just to you, but to all the commissioners um, with the pertinent sections highlighted. Um, uh, I won't ask any more questions. We'll get underway before I do that. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Sarah. Sarah yeah. I just heard from Commissioner Hall and her computer died, so she's just getting it plugged in and she'll be a couple minutes late. Okay. I'm, I'm oh. sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I had just walked away from my computer about three minutes ago and then when I came back, it was dead. So I didn't notice I was so low on charge. No, you got it plugged in now? Yes, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay, just uh, real quickly, uh, Teresa, Joe, I see Joe, Teresa, you're here. Great. Steve. Commissioner Bird. <laughs> uh, what did they call it when cells divide? Mitosis? Yes. Anyway, you know, Commissioner Bird volunteered for tritosis mm. earlier in the meeting. But we're not going to make That's right. <laughs> We're not going to make him do it. Mr. Bird, I had no idea you were such an adventurer. <laughs> you bet, always. I mean, here I am. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, meeting's coming back to order here. When we were done, um, uh, Michael had uh, taken us through the um, sanctions issue and order. Um and at this point, we're open for discussion. And Cynthia, I think you had wanted in particular to um, talk about um, the motion for uh, additional hearing. Uh, correct. I wanted to um, just discuss the response to it. Um, or maybe that's something that Mike should present is the request for hearing uh, for oral argument. Uh, and the response to it, when I think about it, it's probably more appropriate. Um, Mike, can you do that or do you want, was that what you were planning on doing anyhow, Mike? Um, yeah. Okay. Why don't you do that? And then I'll make my comments, but I think it's probably more appropriate for general counsel to present those pleadings. Go ahead, Mike. So let me just 
sorry, I'm, I'm dealing with multiple screens here. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Mike, this is Sarah. Do you want me to put something on the screen? Um, it might be a, a might be a bit to <laughs> to keep up, but I was just going to go through. I was, I guess, I'm just going to give you the pertinent parts of the of the motion and the response. Well, um, can someone just quick uh, email this to Sarah, and then she can put it on the screen? Will that work, Sarah? I can, yes. Sorry, I'm trying to. So, um, Commissioner Hall, do you want to do that? Do you have it up there? Do I what? Do you have the document? Uh, yeah, the motion. I... We need to get the motion up there and we need to get the. Response yeah, I'm... To the I don't have. I had it in an email, which I'm trying to find. Oh, okay. so I, I, sent every, I sent everybody a copy of all three documents uh, before, right after we broke for lunch. Perfect. I just forwarded that to Sarah. Oh, I see. Perfect. Great. Oh, so Mike has it. So we're covered. Sarah okay. will try and get the okay. motion, the original motion up on the screen first. Sure. Got it. Well, and then the motion for that's the response. Mike, do you have the? No, the that's motions? the that's the motion. Yeah, I know, but well, this is the joint. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Okay, go ahead, please. So basically, I'm I'm just going to read it because so that it's clear to everybody what it says. And it says at its core, the requesting uh, excuse me, request for. Oral argument, nunc pro tunc. Um, they state that at its core, this case involves a question of whether it is in the public interest for PNMR, the parent company of PNM, to be allowed to merge and become part of Alvin Grid. This is a case of great public interest with implications for PNM's customers and for New Mexico's renewable energy and economic development future. As extensive record, an extensive record has been compiled over the year that this case has been pending and through the two week hearing process that was concluded in August. Post-hearing briefing, including exceptions, has been completed, and the Public Regulation Commission has commenced its deliberations on whether the proposed merger should be approved. On the one hand, approval of the merger will bring uh, more than 300 million in quantifiable benefits in the form of customer rate credits, funding, economic development funding, and funding for a wide array of other beneficial programs in addition to other non-quantifiable customer X, comma, economic development and environmental benefits. On the other, hand questions have been raised about whether PNM's future service quality will suffer under Avon Grid ownership and whether renewable energy competition will be adversely impacted. The commission may, must now weigh the benefits and protections in the regulatory commitments with the perceived risks in reaching its final decision on whether to approve the merger. The commission's procedural rules allow for oral argument on exceptions in the discretion of the commission. Uh, that's subject to Rule 12237D NMAC. While the exceptions filed, filed by the parties provide some explanation surrounding the issues addressed in the certification of stipulation, parties were limited to 20 pages for exceptions, which were necessarily limited to focused recommended findings being challenged by a given party and were not intended to anticipate all questions that might arise during the commission's deliberations on the proposed merger. As noted during the commission's initial deliberations on December 1st, 2021, the issues in this case are complex and the regulatory commitments are extensive. Numerous questions were raised by the commissioners about the proposed merger, the performance of Avon Grid's other utilities and the details of the regulatory commitments and the benefits and protections they provide. The questions raised by the commission with respect to the matters at issue in this case are important and deserve to be fully addressed. Although the deadline has passed for requesting oral argument under 12237D NMAC, 
the commission may still in its discretion entertain and grant a request for oral argument if it determines that such argument would assist the commission in its deliberations. The extensive uh, questions by the commissioners during their initial deliberations confirm that there are important issues to be addressed in the aid of the decision-making process and that those questions may not be adequately addressed by reference to the limited exceptions <laughs> alone. Oral argument would allow the commission to hear directly from the parties and could be a benefit to the commission's deliberations concerning the proposed merger. In this way, critical issues and questions can be addressed and further explained. The matters at stake in this case are of significant weight and interest such that the commission would benefit from having the opportunity to directly hear from and question the parties concerning these matters. Joint movements have sought the position of the other parties with respect to this request and are informed as follows. Walmart and the NMAG do not oppose. Interwest supports the motion for oral argument by parties that wish to participate, but Interwest does not request or intend to participate in the oral argument. Onward supports the motion, but does not wish to participate in the oral argument. Staff opposes. NAE objects to joint movements request as non-compliant with commission rules. Further, if the commission grants joint movements request, New Energy Economy is requesting the same amount of time as all joint movements are allotted. Sierra Club takes no position. The, uh, the response was filed yesterday, I think at three something in the afternoon. And this was after I believe I had already circulated a proposed order to the commission. Um, New energy economy responds to the motion and I will read it again. Um, as a preliminary matter, the joint motion is improperly styled and misuses the term nunc pro tunc. Wait a second. Uh, uh, can you please put that up on the screen as well so people can see it? Uh, maybe that way I'm speaking to Sarah, I guess. I'm so sorry. I thought I had it on the screen. Let me try again. Oh, I don't see it. Now do you see it? Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Commissioner. Thanks. Um, as a preliminary matter, the joint motion is improperly styled and misuses the term non pro tunc, citing to case law. Um, case law has expressly defined the purposes of non pro tunc order, um, stating non pro tunc has reference to the making of an entry now of something which was actually previously done, so as to have it effective as of a later of an earlier date. It is not to be used to supply some omitted action of the court or council, but may be utilized to supply an omission in the record of something really done, but omitted through mistake or inadvertence. In the view of the record, there is no showing of something which was actually previously done. In fact, the contrary is true. This is, that's her, the argument. Rule 12237 NMAC states, oral argument to commission after recommended decision. Any party or staff may petition the commission for oral argument after the issuance of a recommended decision. Such request may be included in a brief on exceptions or a response, but must be filed no later than the last day to file responses. The commission in its discretion may allow oral argument. If it allows oral argument, it may in its discretion conduct the argument by telephone conference call. While the commission may use its discretion to allow oral argument or not, the rule is clear that a request for oral argument must be filed either with exceptions or responses. Why? To avoid the exact situation that joint movements are attempting to cause here, to request oral argument after commission deliberations have commenced. New energy economy is not aware of any circumstance in any court of law that a judge, judges, juries, or administrative agency's determination was interrupted to entertain oral argument once those deliberations had begun, as they already have in this instance. Further, joint movements do not, did not request oral argument as requ required in Rule 12237D and seek to use a nunc pro tunc moniker to disguise what is actually a request for a variance from the non-discretionary provision of 12237D. The joint motion makes no specific request for such a variance and the commission should not grant one sua sponte. Joint movements request does not comport with the commission rules, demonstrating further disregard for commission rules and the hearing examiner's orders. As further justification for not complying with commission rules, joint movements state that they were limited in their exceptions to 20 pages. 
This assertion should carry little weight. A regular practice is for attorneys to include three words, oral argument requested on the title page of a filing, no argument necessary. The page limitation applying to all parties was not a hindrance to the joint movements. Joint movements also argue that the commission may still in its discretion entertain and grant a request for oral argument if it determines that such argument would assist the commission in its deliberations and cite two commission cases that previously granted oral argument except that in both of those cases which in which NAE participated, there was no issue as to no issue that the request was untimely or in violation of commission rules. The oral arguments referenced occurred in, in advance of commission deliberation, not in the middle of, of deliberation. Joint applicants have had plenty of opportunity to make their case. Mr. Pedro Azagra Blasquez, Chief Development Officer and member of the Executive Committee of Iberdrola SA and Mr. Robert Kump, Deputy Chief Executive Officer and the President of Avangrid Inc. have filed at least six rounds of written testimony and have provided hours long oral testimony. Over the last year, joint applicants alone have presented approximately 35 separate pre-filed direct supplemental and rebuttal testimonies, including initial direct rebuttal testimony and live testimony from numerous experts and two opportunities to direct directly address specific issues related to their performance issues in their Northeastern utilities and compliance issues with discovery and hearing orders in this case. All this evidence was admitted into the record, subjected to cross-examination, briefed and accepted upon. The commission is authorized by law to appoint a hearing examiner to preside over adjudicatory hearings such as this case. Pursuant to the rule 1229 NMAC, the commission properly designated a hearing examiner to hear this matter. Um, the hearing examiner, acting as a proxy for the commission, sorted through thousands of pages of testimony, seven days of hearing, and hundreds of pages of briefing and responses, and wrote an extensive and thorough certification of stipulation consisting of 284 pages, not including exhibits and multiple hours of presentation to fully present this case to the commission. The decision on the merger is ripe for review. In their request, joint movements argue substantive issues of their case, including improperly commenting on statements made by the commission in its December 1st, 2021 open meeting. This is consistent with joint applicants' past actions, including when they attempted to argue material outside the record in violation of commission rules and New Mexico law, and the hearing examiner struck a portion of joint applicants' brief and ruled the joint applicants' belief that there was not sufficient time to seek the reopening of the evidentiary record is not a proper basis to ignore the due process requirement reflected in the hearing examiner's August 27th order that new evidence be admitted only after an evidentiary hearing. It is not within the joint applicant's authority to make determinations and take actions that violate commission orders. The hearing examiner accordingly finds that the offending references in the joint applicant's post-hearing brief should be stricken. Given the repeated instances of joint applicants disregard for the commission rules, as evidenced again here, herein, there is a further risk that if oral argument was allowed, that the joint applicants will reference matters outside the record, devise new arguments that challenges, challengers have not had the opportunity to answer, prejudice parties, confuse matters, and create possible, possibly create error. Lastly, if this untimely request were granted, it would effectively nullify deadlines and undermine commission authority. Uh, therefore, NEE requests that the commission deny the joint movement's request is untimely and inconsistent with PRC rules and precedent. Okay, um, Commissioner Hall, I think uh, you'd wanted to make some comments um, based on this response to the motion. Um, yes, I did, Mr. Chair. And I, uh, I also noticed in this last reading of the request for uh, oral argument that it, and I don't have a copy of that myself, uh, at least that I can find immediately. I, it looked like they were suggesting that it, the discussion that they would like to have should go beyond the um, topics discussed in the exceptions. And I think that's not our practice. I think our practice is to have oral argument on the legal arguments that are made in the exceptions. So I, uh, I found these arguments pretty persuasive in New Energy Economy's um, pleading. Um, 
And I know we find ourselves in a situation where there's been a lot of public pressure and people have been saying a lot about how, well, we haven't even heard all the facts and we should at least hear them out. I think there's, you know, a lot of disinformation out there that doesn't really have to have any bearing on what we do. We need to do what I think is, you know, the right thing, which is to follow our rules and be fair. But um, uh, I, I just thought I should draw the commission's attention to these um, arguments that underpin both sides before we go ahead and try to determine whether or not we want to uh, hear oral arguments. Um, and I also couldn't help but notice the uh, similarity in the in the uh, the final item that we were talking about before lunch that had to do with NEE's failure to timely file a request for sanctions and the fact that we're also looking at a failure to timely file here. And I, I think if we're gonna deny one, we should deny the other, or if we grant the other, we should grant the other one. You know, I mean, uh, the appearance is kind of uh, right in our face there, you know? I mean, I think we need to be fair in the way we apply our rules. If we're gonna be waiving rules, that's fine. If we wanna be, you know, more liberal about how we're handling this whole case, but if we're not gonna do that, we need to be consistent in, in denying uh, waivers of our rules. So Chair, I to bring those issues up for purposes of our discussion. And I'm, I'm finished, please. Other, Commissioner Baestas, were Mr. you gonna? Chair, yeah, I, I, I don't think we should continue discussing this until Mike has presented the proposed order regarding the, the request for oral argument because we still have to act on that order, whether it's approved or denied. And so before we proceed with additional discussion, I'd feel much better if Mike presents the order itself. Certainly. Um, Mike, go ahead. So basically what my order would propose, I'll read again. Um, joint movements request oral argument with respect to the hearing exhibit. Wait, excuse me, it's not on the screen. Do you want it on the screen? Uh, the recording stopped also. Oh. <laughs> Sarah, yeah, if you Just a second, I'm working on it. Keeping Sarah busy. Okay. Um, there we go. I have too many windows open. I'm sorry, just a minute. Find the right. <clears throat> Here we go. Okay. I think you're in the wrong document. Am I? Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. I apologize for the delay. Okay. There we go. So starting at, yeah, here we go. That's good. Um, so the joint, motion, the joint movements request oral argument with respect to the hearing examiner's certification of stipulation and the exceptions filed thereto pursuant to rule 12237D. Joint movements request does not actually request that the commission take any action on a non pro tonk basis, but instead, sim instead simply requests that the commission exercise its inherent discretion in applying its rules to grant joint applicants request notwithstanding joint movement's acknowledgement that the deadline has passed for requesting oral argument under rule 12237D, which requires that requests for oral arguments be included in a brief on exceptions or a response, but must be filed no later than the last day to file responses. 
Joint movements argue such relief is appropriate to permit them to address, quote, numerous questions raised by the commissioners about the proposed merger, the performance of Avon Grid's other utilities, and the details of the regulatory commitments and the benefits and protections they provide. They assert the extensive questions by the commission during their initial deliberations confirm that there are important questions to be addressed in aid of the decision-making process and that those questions may not be adequately addressed by reference to the limited exceptions alone. Oral argument would allow the commission to hear directly from the parties and could be benefit to the commission's deliberations consist concerning the proposed mergers. Joint, app, joint movements argue that the need for oral argument is at least partially based on the fact that, quote, exceptions filed by the parties provide some explanations surrounding the issues addressed in the certification of stipulation. Parties were limited to 20 pages for exceptions, which were necessarily limited to focused recommended findings being challenged by a given party and were not intended to anticipate all questions that might arise during the commission's deliberations um, on the proposed mergers. merger. Yet the commission notes that while the current movements included parties who filed exceptions, namely MSR LAC, which is um, uh, CCAE rather, uh, WRA and the joint applicants, only those exceptions filed by the joint applicants and the responses thereto filed by NEE reached the 20 page limitation. Of the four total exception pleadings filed, only CCAE's separate exception exceeded four pages and even then only reached six pages. Moreover, while the movements assert oral argument would allow the commission to hear directly from the parties, all parties were aware of the contents of the certification and their opportunity to file exceptions. Yet only, again, yet only four exceptions pleadings were filed. Even then, the signatories, consisting of the New Mexico Attorney General, Western Resources Advocates, the International Brotherhood of Workers, Local 611, DNA Citizens Against Ruining Our Environment, Nava Education Project, San Juan Citizens Alliance, To Honi Ani, the Coalition for Clean Affordable Energy, Inner West Energy Alliance, Walmart Onward Energy Holdings, LLC, the Incorporated County of Los Alamos and MSR Public Power Agency filed a two-page pleading consisting of only 16 lines of argument. I have two alternative orders for the commission. Um, one is, accordingly, the commission does not find that granting oral argument at this late stage of the proceedings would be appropriate or that would aid the commission in its consideration of the issues which have been addressed by the hearing examiner in a detailed lengthy certification. The movements have had ample opportunity to address the analysis set forth in the certification. The other alternatives, if the commission chooses to grant oral argument, Notwithstanding, the commission will grant the movements an opportunity to present oral argument on their exceptions at the commission open meeting on December 15th, 2021. Oral argument would be is restricted to 40 minutes total. The proponents of the stipulation shall, I'm missing a word there, shall have 20 minutes to present their positions and the opponents of the stipulation shall have 20 minutes to, to respond. Consistent with the rules, commission's rules on written exceptions, there will be no rebuttal. The commission, excuse me, the parties shall determine how to allocate the 20 minute time allotment among themselves. Arguments shall be restricted to the issues raised in the written exceptions and responses to exceptions thereto filed in this docket. No new exceptions shall be permitted. So that, that's basically what I had uh, proposed. Um, I can, if there are questions about what, I, what we're proposing in this order, um, I can address that. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, Mike, can you just remind us what commission precedent is in, in granting something similar to this, uh, granting oral arguments? Uh, how is this unique or, or is it consistent with precedents that have been set by this commission? Um, well, obviously, as, as stated, the commission's rule does allow for granting oral argument um, with respect to exceptions. The inherent issue, I guess, that's, that sort of underlies this is that the 
oral arguments should be restricted. And that's what I attempted uh, to frame in uh, the alternative two, which is that the oral argument should, should focus, or rather should be an extension of the exceptions, not an opportunity for the parties to essentially re-argue matters which they have not done in exceptions. Um, I think, I think the, question, the question I have um, about the intent of what the uh, proponents of the oral argument are seeking is that they're, they're seeking to respond to questions that the commissioners essentially um, discussed back and forth between themselves with respect to what was in the certification um, that could have been addressed to the hearing examiner uh, who, as I lay out in this order, has drafted a multiple hundred page order, um, I'm rather certification, um, identifying all of these, uh, these issues. Um, and the, the hearing examiner would obviously have the ability to uh, point the commission to the correct information um, that's cited in his, in his um, uh, certification. To the extent that the parties who uh, took exception to the certif certification um, thought there were matters that were not covered by the certification um, or were missing from the information that was set forth in the certification uh, or did not accurately reflect the evidence that was, that was uh, adduced in the evidentiary uh, proceedings, the sort of, that's exactly what the, the point of the exceptions is, is to identify uh, those items at that time. Um, as I point out, there are, I think it's been repeated m multiple times that there are 20, 23 of the 24 parties support this transaction. Well, only four party, only four exceptions were filed. Um, and even then with the exception of the joint applicants themselves, nobody else took advantage of the exceptions opportunity um, to point out any of these, uh, any errors um, with the hearing examiner's certification, any deficiencies with regard to the hearing examiner's uh, certification in terms of um, the matters that really could answer the questions that the commissioners might have had with regard to that certification. Um, so I also think given the fact that we're, um, we're, ha we're basically having to deal with this at a late opportunity, um, there is obviously a significant amount of interference with the commission's ability to resolve this matter in an expedient fashion, if that's what it wants to do. Um, and given, you know, this is something we could have planned for in advance. Um, but that's essentially, that's why I, I drafted a alternative one um, denying the, the motion. Um, and again, the alternative two is intended to uh, to try and restrict the commit the parties to uh, the proper parameters of uh, oral argument if the commission were to grant it. Mr. Chair? Yes. Just to follow up, Mike, um, I think you adequately indicated the limitations on the scope of the oral arguments if if they we we approve them. The only thing I, I'm not comfortable allowing us commissioners to ask any questions because I, I, I fear that we could maybe inadvertently go into areas that are outside of the evidentiary record. Um, so can we, can we further uh, limit the format of the orals uh, just to presentations by both sides without any Q and A from commissioners? Um, the commission has the opportunity to basically conduct the format. I mean, the oral argument in, in any manner it chooses. Um, I mean, the format that's the format that's set forth there approximates that that's utilized by the Supreme Court um, when it conducts oral argument, um, except for the fact that this does not provide for rebuttal, have an opportunity for rebuttal, and that's because um, our rules for um, 
for cert, or excuse me, for exceptions does not provide for rebuttal, um, except if the commission grants it. So, I mean, obviously the commission has wide discretion in how it wants to handle this um, if it chooses to proceed on a path. Um, obviously, I think we're all aware that the U.S. Supreme Court has had justices who don't ask questions in oral argument. So, Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Meisters. Um, yeah, I, look, I, I believe we have all the information uh, we can glean from the parties, which I've thoroughly read through, and that the evidentiary record in this case is, is quite extensive. Uh, however, there seems to be a, a perception that We've, we've rushed a judgment and worse yet, not allowed for due process in this case. Uh, I believe this perception is incorrect. However, if granting this late request for oral arguments will help to dispel that perception, then I welcome the opportunity for the parties to present their positions to the commission and make their final pitch to us prior to our vote on this merger case. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Hall. Well, I uh, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Maestas's feelings. You know, I I certainly feel the the pressure uh, from the community who have been misled completely about whether we uh, even finished uh, hearing facts. But as I stated earlier, I think we should strive to be fair. And um, I think it would be patently unfair to allow the joint applicants to enjoy the benefits of a late filing, which they didn't file. They didn't file this request until after we deliberated and they heard things they didn't want to hear. And they've made it clear in their filing that they want to talk about things other than the exceptions, which will challenge us to keep monitoring whether or not they are straying from exceptions. So uh, I and I and I think Commissioner Maestas raises a concern that we ourselves could stray from the exception topics. So I think it's I think it's a risk to our the justice and fairness that we want to deliver to all parties to grant this, besides it being a demand on our time when we actually all, I, well, I don't know if we all agree, but I certainly agree with what Commissioner Maes just said, that we have been presented with a thorough presentation of all the facts from the, through the hearing and the recommended decision and everybody's filings, I, I think we've heard and seen in documents everything that really can be discussed. I think the effect of granting this would be to create an opportunity for the company to go beyond the exceptions and would capitulate in their uh, to them in their practice of um, basically uh, not conforming to our rules. So I think this is one place where, even though I'm, I'm generally pretty liberal about hearing people out, I think in the situation here, it would be the mist a mistake. And we just have to uh, suffer the, uh, you know, the infamy of our position, I guess. But I don't think... Uh, I don't think we're really perceived as badly uh, to merit having to adjust our judgment about what's fair to parties in order to um, rehabilitate our reputation in the public. Um, Mike, I have a, I guess, kind of a legal question here. Is I was really struck by... Um, the arg, the I don't know if I want to call it argument, but um, the point that was made in the response to the motion that um, essentially we're allowing um, more testimony um, 
after deliberations have begun. And my concern is that this becomes perilously close to having participants who've heard some of the deliberations um, now essentially insert themselves as participants in the deliberations. Yeah. And if we're setting that kind of precedent, I think that it could be potentially very problematic. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, from, from a, I kind of have to digest that for a moment. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not sure that they would be participants in the deliberation, I, but I, I do think, I do think the point that was raised that, um, the respondents, the respondents are, or excuse me, the movements rather are seeking, um, oral argument to address matters that are raised in the deliberation yeah. um, is definitely seems to stray from the, by, by coming so late, it does stray from the intent of the oral argument under the rule, which is to respond to the certification um, that the, that the hearing examiner has um, issued and on which all the other parties have framed their decisions on whether to file exceptions or not to file exceptions. And um, by responding instead to the, to the deliberation um, that to the issues raised in deliberation, um, that's really not con consistent with the rule. And yeah, yeah. The intent to me, the it feels like it really blurs, blurs the lines. And it seems to me that's the whole reason we have the deadline, obviously, is to be sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen. And um, while I take Commissioner Maestas's point that it it would be it would be nice to respond to uh, this red herring, what I would call a red herring issue, that somehow we've uh, not looked at all the issues or been objective, or uh, that we've prejudged the facts, all of which. Uh, you pointed out, according to the procedure we followed, is just not true. Um, while I would like to make a public gesture for that, I would hate to make a public gesture that the next time we have a case, someone says, oh, uh, you guys have been begun discussing these issues, and now we're going to request that we can, you know, again come before you after we've heard some of the deliberations. And I think that would be, uh, quite frankly, a disastrous precedent. Um, so th that would be the probably my major um, objection. Of course, the other point is um, I agree with both Commissioner Maestas and Commissioner Hall. I, I don't need further testimony. It's not going to clarify anything. I haven't seen anything in the uh, exceptions. Uh, that's a new issue that there haven't been, there aren't many facts in the record on. Uh, it's just going to be uh, their interpretations of, uh, or their spin on what's already in the record and what's already been discussed. And, you know, I don't need that either. So, but the main point for me is I think it's an awful precedent for the commission to set. So other Mr. commissioners, Mr. Commissioner Byrd. You gonna say something, Mike? Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, I, I was merely gonna say that um, with regard to when you use the term precedent, there have been, uh, and I think it was referred to in the order, there have been uh, several occasions previously in which the commission has um, granted oral argument um, in some recent cases. Oh, okay. And um, my, my, I will give you an opinion, which is that I think that oral argument played a role in um, the commission uh, deviating on basis on ba from from consideration of the of the certification um, strictly based on other issues that were sort of dropped in in the in the context of those um, those oral arguments 
and leading to some results that we're still uh, wrestling with uh, in current cases. Um, one of which one of which is going to follow this this case. Um, okay, so you feel like uh, it's had unfortunate results in the past. Is that what you're telling us? That that's would be my personal opinion. Okay, Commissioner Bird. Okay, um, so I'm going to make my statements short. I would like to move the order. Utilizing alternative one, denying the opportunity for oral argument. Second. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa! Let's give uh, <laughs> let's give <laughs> Commissioner Bassetti Iwilar a chance to to weigh in here. Well, she still can. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are disregarding the extensive long hours compiling record, compiling the evidentiary record, which was closed on August the 19th, 2021, of our hearing examiner, Ashley Schenauer. He is the only one that handled the case with all the parties. He indicated that the proponents were changing their mind, their direction of how they would like to submit their application many times. So um, that's clear, that's in the record that our hearing examiner explained to the commission. I also stand that we should deny an opportunity for an, art, an oral argument. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Bezzetti Aguilar. So we have a motion from Commissioner Byrd. Uh, Commissioner Hall? Second, I second the motion. Um, any further discussion? Okay, Mike, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Maestas. No. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. What? I'm sorry, what's... Wait. Help me understand what a no and an aye vote mean in this case. <laughs> um, Commissioner Byrd, do you want to restate your motion? Yes, my motion was to accept the order utilizing alternative one, denying the opportunity for oral argument. So a no vote would be no on that order? And an I vote would be yes for that order. That was my understanding in taking the vote, but I want to make sure we were clear on that. So I will. I've lost track. I have my I have Commissioner Maestas, no. Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Hall, okay, did so, you vote? So, Mr. Trump. So a yes, uh, so a, real quickly, a yes vote would be yes Deny. to alternative one, which Correct. denies. Yes. Right, and a no vote. Goes it's in way. favor of the motion. Right. And Commissioner Hall's vote is? To deny oral argument, choosing alternative one. So that's, okay. I, that's why yeah. I said I. Yeah, okay. that's correct. I, sorry, I just want to make sure yeah. since we got into that discussion. Yeah. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. I'm voting in favor of alternative one denying the motion. Commissioner Fish. Aye. So that's an aye vote. Uh, and I would vote aye. And Commissioner Byrd. Aye. Uh, the motion to adopt uh, alternative one denying the motion is. Uh, passed by a vote of four to one. Okay, terrific. Um, so uh, now we're on to discussion on uh, the potential order regarding the certification. And commissioners have at it. Let's 
Let's hear what we got. Uh, shouldn't Mike, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, shouldn't Mike present the order? Uh, sure, if we, we can do that. Um, I guess the question I have is whether the commission wants me to present the order or if it wants to discuss oh. this and your discussions further. Um, as I said, I've drafted an order that reflects what I understood was the commission commission's desires. Mr. Chair, I don't particularly have any further argument to make, uh, any discussion to make. Well, why don't we, I, I mean- Mr. I, Chair. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner but, but there's certainly no need to go through the exceptions, right? Because we've already done that. Right. Correct. Right. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, Mike, it probably is a good idea, even though we probably, I think all the commissioners have read it, uh, I know I have, is that um, it's not a bad idea for you to uh, go through it as Commissioner Hall suggests. Uh, that way everyone listening in knows exactly where we're coming from and uh, what we're voting on. So, Sarah, did I send you a copy of it? Yeah, I've read it, um, so I've got it. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that was directed to Sarah in terms of putting something up. Uh, yes, Michael, was that the first one that you sent me this morning? Yes. Great. Okay, I'm just pulling it up, give me a moment. So that would go to, to page 13. Yeah. And I think I botched my numbering, but um, it'll be at, after paragraph 36. There it is. Um, So the, the let me read this. The joint the excuse me the joint applicants and signatories focus their exceptions on the newly on their newly expressed willingness to accept the hearing examiner's revisions set forth in the modified stipulation included as appendix two to the certification. Significantly, those revisions impose greater impose greater protections and safeguards in the form of regulatory commitments than the provisions of the June 4th stipulation, which was the subject of the evidentiary hearing and the certifications analysis. The hearing examiner's order on post hearing filings affirmed that the certification would be based on the party's positions as expressed in their statements of position filed at the close of the evidentiary hearings. While joint applicants and signatories assert that those statements indicate continued support for the June 14th stipulation, those statements demonstrate a lack of uniform agreement over the additional regulatory commitments proposed or agreed to by the joint applicants during the hearing. Notably, the joint applicants and signatories exceptions to the certification primarily assert their belief that the certification erred in the relative weight it accords to the purported benefits of this proposed stipulation and the various matters that the regulatory commitments address. What are otherwise referred to as the potential risks of the proposed stipulation, uh, the proposed transaction. That many of the signatories recognize the need for additional enhanced regulatory commitments beyond those initially agreed to in the June 4th stipulation is evident from the continued negotiations that took place during the evidentiary hearing on the June 4th stipulation. The proponents of the proposed transaction now gloss over the potential risks of the proposed transaction based on the enhanced revisions proposed in Appendix 2 modified stipulation, which they now recast as additional enhanced benefits, rather than the revisions necessary to mitigate the very real concerns about risks of harm identified by many of those same parties in this case during the proceedings. As the certification notes, given the nature of the facts that gave rise to concerns, these provisions will not eliminate those risks, but it will instead require sustained 
and vigilant regulatory oversight to maintain. Ultimately, in evaluating the six factors the commission applies when determining whether a utility merger satisfies the public interest under uh, section 62612, the certification concludes the potential harms of the proposed transaction continue to outweigh its benefits. The certification makes clear that in the hearing examiner's estimation, this conclusion holds true even with the application of the revisions included in the proposed appendix to modified stipulation. If you can scroll that. Sorry, I was failed to move my own screen. This order does not reiterate the full analysis of the certification, which is set forth by the hearing examiner in intricate detail over several hundred pages. However, in reviewing the testimony in this case, the commission does not find fault with the certification's conclusion that the benefits cited by the joint applicants, while not insubstantial, are not as significant as they are portrayed and are insufficient to overcome the potential risks of the proposed transaction as set forth in this certification's recitation and analysis of the factual record of this case. This is especially true given that many of the most concrete financial benefits are limited to investments or expenditures of specific sums certain and regulatory commitments limited to terms of three to five years. By contrast, the concerns of risks based on the demonstrated performance and compliance history of Iberdrola Avangrid with regard to quality of service issues, including reliability, as well as risks of improper subsidization of non-utility activities will be ongoing. Even more so, the commission finds valid the con hearing examiner's concerns about Avangrid Iberdrola's qualifications in light of the ongoing criminal investigation in Spain involving high level officers and the compliance issues experienced by the hearing examiner in this proceeding, which lead to a finding of discovery violations and a recommendation of sanctions against Avangrid. Based on the record of this, in this case, the commission accepts the recommendation of the certification to reject the June 4th stipulation. Okay. Um, there was one other piece of information for perhaps before we start um, final discussion on this. Um, you'd asked the question, Commissioner Hall, about the, uh, why the dollars didn't add up to 300 million and on the uh, benefits. And Ashley, I know you've looked into it. So um, I wanted you to um, talk about that briefly for the benefit of the commission. M Mr. Chair? Yeah. Yeah, just if I may, um, Mike, were you going to cover the portion under it is therefore ordered or? Oh, I, yes, I'm sorry, I can't. Let me get back to my screen. So the, uh, the ordering paragraphs would provide the certification of stipulation, including the statement of the case discussion, findings of fact, and conclusions of law in the decretal paragraphs recommended by the hearing examiner, with the exception of decretal paragraph G, is well taken and should be adopted, approved, and accepted as the order of the commission and is incorporated herein by reference as part of this order, except to the extent expressly modified by this order. Finding of B, finding of fact and conclusion of law four and five should be, shall be combined and revised to read four, the June 4th stipulation cannot be approved because based on the signatory's testimony and statements of position, they are no longer in agreement on the terms that should be approved by the commission. And regardless of whether the signatories remain in agreement on the original terms of the June 4th stipulation, because the potential harms resulting from the pro proposed transaction outweigh its benefits. Findings of fact and conclusion of law six shall read the terms of the modified stipulation proposed by the hearing examiner, or excuse me, proposed as by the hearing examiner in appendix two as an alternative basis for the commission's approval is rejected. And I think there's a, the typo there is struck should be taken out of there. I couldn't decide whether it should be stricken or struck. So I decided to say rejected. Um, mm -hmm. As a sanction for the discovery violations discussed that herein, the joint applicants are assessed a penalty of $10,000, which some shall be payable to the commission within 30 days of the filing of this order. Any other pending motions or exceptions not expressly addressed, including the exceptions of LAC MSR are deemed resolved consistent with this order. And that's because those exceptions related to the 
um, the provisions that would have been in the uh, appendix two had the commission adopted it. Uh, it closes the case and the order is effective immediately. Okay, so with that- actually, I'm, so, I'm sorry, actually, I have an error in there. The, we should actually take out provision F uh, because this actually does not close the case. Because okay. the, the only thing that what's in front of the commission is the stipulation. So uh, I will I will change that. Looks like somebody just did. Yep. Okay. Um, does Ashley get a turn now, Mike? I, I'm Ashley's welcome, free and welcome to. <laughs> okay, Ashley, you there? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, th well, I think earlier you folks uh, uh, asked the question about uh, how the $300 million in quantifiable benefits that uh, the joint applicants referred to on page four of their exceptions, how that $300 million, uh, what that consists of. And uh, uh, that, that number really was not something that was addressed in, in anything particular in, in terms of the uh, the briefing that was done uh, uh, after the, the hearing that I did closed. But I'm just reading the rest of the, the exceptions and, and I can see that uh, the, uh, the, the quantified benefits that uh, are contained in the June 4 stipulation <clears throat> and in the additional offerings essentially that were made during the hearing, uh, total about $124 million. And uh, on page eight, though, it seems that the other $200 million is uh, page eight of the exceptions. Uh, the other $200 million is described. Uh, and, and that $200 seems to uh, <clears throat> uh, be derived from the 150 new jobs that are provided for under the stipulation. Uh, there was a, a witness, and, and this is all cited in the footnote. Uh, on uh, page eight, two footnotes, page, uh, footnotes 36 and 37. Uh, the joint applicants presented a witness <clears throat> who testified that the 150 jobs would generate uh, 100, about $105 million in wages over five years. Uh, that witness also said that the, the spending that uh, is resulting from those 150 people who have been employed would generate another 255 jobs, and that this, the wages uh, from those 255 jobs would generate $12.5 million a year. And they said that over eight years, uh, that additional spending from those additional jobs would total about $100 million. So if you add up uh, the, about the 105 million from the 150 jobs, and the 100 million from the 255 jobs, you get about $205 million. And it, it appears uh, that they are adding that $205 million to the $124 million that is uh, outlined in the, the stipulation and the uh, offerings uh, that were made during the hearing. So, um, Mr. Chair and Ashley, thank you very much. Yeah, so Ashley, um, remind me, I've forgotten what, how those 155 jobs are generated under the agreement and what those jobs are doing that wouldn't have been done anyway. It, there's a commitment in the stipulation that uh, that there will be 150 jobs, new jobs generated as a result of, of this transaction. It's not clear under the stipulation, you know, where those jobs will be generated, you know, where there will be, who those, those people will be employed by. Uh, the, uh, the recommendation that I made in, uh, as sort of the, the alternative to uh, rejecting the, the the, uh, the transaction is that they be employees of uh, the Iverdrola Avangrid group of companies, but uh, that was not something that was proposed by any of the uh, 
signatories, uh, it's, it's just not ent entirely clear okay. where those jobs will be. Thank you, that's, that's all I needed to hear. Mr. Uh, Chair. So, yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Hall. Well, I just wanted to ask Ashley, could, um, uh, this is a little tedious, I'm sure. Okay, you said 150 jobs and that was gonna generate how much money again? 124, 124,000? Mm -hmm. What did you say? The one hundred twenty-four thousand dollars is the, a year. A year, one, you mean? No, the one hundred twenty-four thousand dollars, one hundred twenty-four million dollars. I'm sorry. Million dollars. Yeah. Is the uh, the sum of the uh, the quantified benefits in the stipulation? The sixty-seven million dollars in rate credits, the ten million dollars in customer arrearage relief, all of those things, where where they actually had numbers outlined right. in the, the in the stipulation. And in the uh, and in the hearing that followed, so that's 124 million dollars. You oh, folks okay. asked, you asked how how they get to three more than 300 million. Right. Okay, well, the exceptions that uh, were filed on page eight they refer to 200 million dollars of economic development benefits. That's the part. Okay. And and there are two footnotes associated with that that claim. And if you go to the, the testimony that they are citing in those footnotes, you, you see how they came up with that uh, additional $200 million. And that $200 million is, consists of the wages that they, that they estimate that will result from the 150 jobs that are uh, provided for, that were provided for in the stipulation, mm -hmm. claim that that would generate about $21 million a year, and then uh, $105 million over five years. Then, so that's $105 million. Then they're claiming, they're estimating that, uh, that the, those people who get the 150 jobs will be spending money, and that the, the additional money that those people spend will generate another 255 jobs, and that the the salaries that those additional 255 people uh, earn will total about $12.5 million per year. And they multiply that by eight years to arrive at approximately $100 million. So you add up $100 million and $105 million, you get $205 million. You add $205 million to the $124 million that's outlined in the stipulation, there, that's how I think you develop the greater than $300 million of benefits that the, uh, the joint applicants were referring to in their exceptions. And this was on page eight of what document? Their exceptions, the joint applicants' exceptions. That's the citation is there. The testimony that they yeah. refer to was the testimony of Lisa, uh, mispronounce it, Kalichi, um, that her rebuttal testimony and at page 30 and basically what she is basing this on is the commitment to bring uh, or create 150 full-time uh, jobs to New Mexico within three years, which they commit to retain for no less than five years. Um, they purport that that purports to create four one hundred and four point six million dollars to the regional economy. Um, and they're, so they're adding the three to the five to come up with eight years, um, even though they're, they're, they're committing to bring those jobs within three years, not within one year. So I'm, there, seems to be a, a, there seems to be a lag issue there in terms of will those 150 jobs be there in year one? Will they be there in year two? Uh, they commit to have them all there by year three, but they seem to be assuming for purposes of their calculation that they're going to have the entirety of the the entirety of the 150 jobs there for the full three years which doesn't seem consistent with that seem testimony seems a little inconsistent um, likewise they're talking about the uh, effect of having those jobs will create another 255 new jobs um, and they also are calculating that on eight years I think if I'm reading this correctly. And 
that doesn't seem to account for the lag time it'll take to create those jobs since they're saying that it's going to be a result of the other jobs. So, I mean, I'm not sure that that figure is, is unassailable. Yes. It sounds like it's dependent on, you know, the vagaries of life. But, the, but this is one of the, this is one of the, um, commitments again that as i as i put in the order that they're proposing to make that would have a a three to five year you know guarantee essentially is what they're saying and after that it's not clear what happens to clear that it's a guarantee they're 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 stating a guarantee that will uh, develop uh, within a three to five year time period. Is that what you? Well, what, what I, I, I guarantees the, guarantees, I guess, is the wrong term. The term that is used in the in the uh, um, commitment stipulation is a commitment. Right. Right. But after five years, there is no commitment. Well, and then how do you measure it? You know, that's the thing. I mean, you can claim that effect, but how do you know? Um, the only Ashley, commitment go ahead. Is, is regarding the 150 jobs. There's no commitment about the dollar amount. I mean, that's an estimate of from one of the witnesses uh, about what will happen as a result of the 150 jobs. But the only commitment is the 150 jobs. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Commissioner Bird. So what matrix are they proposing that they'll be able to provide proof that they actually created the jobs. Yeah. Well, they're, they were proposing annual reports to, uh, to show that. Um, that would, you know, I, I suppose that would show the creation of the jobs. It would not show the creation of the, uh, the, the spending, of the, the dollar amount of the spending. I guess any follow up commissioner bird first. Yeah. I'm just sitting there thinking that's, that's going to be easy with all the new construction projects that are coming up over the next few years for PNM and re replacement technology for San Juan and four corners. They're going to more than exceed that 150 jobs just right there. They're just going to done that. That was an easy commitment on their part. <laughs> well, commissioner bird, I'm, interpreting what you say as being, gee, those jobs would have been there anyway. Is that what your basic point is? Well, I don't want you putting words in my mouth, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, could uh, let's say uh, you can put words in my mouth. That's my concern is that those jobs would have been there anyway. So it's kind of a hollow commitment. Right. So that's I'm not saying that's the case, but it's my concern. Correct. Thank you for adding clarity to that point. Well, Mr. Chair, I guess in connection with Commissioner Bird's statement, I thought that, uh, you know, in general, when there's going to be uh, you know, an increase in construction for renewable projects and associated infrastructure. As we uh, understood was gonna happen in the Four Corners area with the replacement resources uh, that are gonna be built there, that there is a, a boom in jobs, uh, certainly for the period of time when the projects are being built out. Uh, but as you know, we all recognize those jobs aren't there forever. They may have an effect for a decade or two. And, uh, but then once projects are built then the jobs, uh, the construction jobs move elsewhere, I guess. Um, I don't know if that has bearing on interpreting this, I'm not sure what types of jobs they were referring to, if they were talking about permanent corporate jobs in this locale, that's different. But, 
Well, the stipulation does say that they were not going to be counting construction jobs as part of this 150. Um, okay. Um, other commissioner comments on where we are in the order and your thoughts. Mr. Chair, Mr. I... Chair, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Uh, yes, I would like to ask um, Ashley when he weighed the evidence on the rule of the reason approach on customer rights, operating performance, service quality. Um, can you please um, re-emphasize your findings on those issues? Um, yeah, I, my, my findings were, um, that there was a, a real risk of uh, that uh, customer satisfaction, customer service, uh, service reliability would deteriorate, um, and that under uh, the uh, under the the acquisition, and and that was based uh, in part, in large part, on uh, the record, the uh, the record, the evidentiary record, but. More particularly, the the record of the Avangrid utilities in the Northeast, uh, where uh, there were, you know, there have been you know sixty five million dollars in in penalties and disallowances over the last five years for uh, um, customer service uh, problems, for service reliability problems, and uh, and that those uh, those occurred in large part. Uh, due to uh, resource limitations uh, directed by the upstream holding companies, uh, Avangrid and, and Iberdrola. And uh, so based on that historical record, uh, it seemed only logical and uh, that, that the same might occur here in New Mexico. And uh, so that, that's, the, uh, that's the basis for uh, my recommendation. I would like to ask a question and if you can give me your final analysis on the excessive portion of the benefit from the merger. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar, you're really breaking up and I can't understand you. I don't think Ashley can either from the expression on his face. Um, okay. That's okay. better. I'll let me now. Uh, give it a try. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Ashley, my question is the excessive portion of the benefit. From the merger, would it go to the utility shareholders? Well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, well, the would you repeat the question? I didn't quite hear it. Uh, Actually, my question. Yeah. This yes, is the your question, question that I have. Yes, that question. Could you just state it again? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it very well. I would like to ask Ashley Schenauer his final analysis on the excessive portion of the benefits from the merger. Would it go and benefit the utility shareholders? Thank you. The uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, on page thirty-eight of my certification, uh, I I cite to the the record uh, where uh, it was one of the witnesses calculated the uh, the benefit uh, of the uh, the merger in terms of the the stock prices 
uh, that uh, that shareholders would realize. And uh, I guess uh, what Mr. Garrett from uh, the uh, Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority said that shareholders would receive $391 million more than the market value of the shares of PNM stock. Uh, and I'm assuming that was calculated based on the, uh, the stock price uh, at the time of the merger. So the, uh, the increase in the stock price over the market price at the time that the merger was announced, uh, he said would uh, uh, provide uh, a benefit of $391 million. Um, Commissioner Vicente Aguilar, if you don't mind, I've got a follow up on that. Um, and yeah, go right ahead. What, yeah, what would you consider to be the uh, benefits to ratepayers out of this transaction? Just the upfront dollar benefits, not you know the long term stuff that you've commented on and that you're concerned about. Well, we just talked about that. I mean, that's uh, yeah. So, is there a dollar figure of what goes to ratepayers? Because to me, that's kind of the rate relief piece. Is that like just the sixty-seven million? Well, it depends on how you what you consider uh, ratepayer benefits to be. The, the rate credits total sixty-seven yeah. million dollars. Yeah. yeah. If you include those other amounts, uh, we could argue that it could be as high as one hundred twenty-four. I guess. Okay. As high as what? As high as 124 million. 124 million? Yeah. Over what period of time? I mean, the rate credits are for a certain period of time. Sorry for me. Sorry to not in. The rate credits are, are they're not a one-time thing. I thought they were for a period of time. Well, it's 67, $67 million uh, paid out over three years. And that came out to something like a dollar thirty a, a month or something for ratepayers for that rate credit, right? Well, it depends on how it's allocated. I mean, that's that was one of the questions. Is how right, but allocated. if it were allocated, I don't know, per capita or something, that's how it would come out. It would be a little bit more than that. I think it oh. uh, would be like maybe three dollars something a month uh, when you. Uh, Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, three dollars and fifty cents per month. If it's if the credits are allocated uh, just based on customer counts, if it was based on uh, kilowatt hours, uh, it would be a dollar sixty four per month. So what's the bill impact then, $3 a month? Well, it depends what, under my recommendation, if you, if, if you disagree with my recommendation that it be rejected, and if you uh, uh, approve it uh, under, with the conditions that I'm recommend, would be recommended, it would be three, $3.50 per month. Oh. Well. So that's, and how, what's the, uh, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I was just, oh, gonna, yeah. the, the amount that shareholders get, uh, well, there's 391 million. Uh, what does that break down to per share? If that's the figure to be used. I thought, I, th I don't think that's the right figure to use, but I thought there was a, a, uh, I thought it was like fifty dollars a share that shareholders were would enjoy from selling their shares to con so this deal could go through. Right. Yeah. 
And, and so that $391 million is the difference is between that $50 and the approximately $45 uh, that, the, that the shares were trading at the time of the merger. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, uh, other commissioner th uh, questions, comments? Well, Mr. Chair, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Bassetti Aguilar. Yes, uh, I'm sorry to speak, uh, to speak up slowly because I'm thinking of what question to ask. Um, to centralize the real-time renewable generation, the applicant, did they show ways to enhance the system reliability? Did they show high-level plan for energy development? And uh -huh. how did they, did they explain how they're going to navigate the challenges? No, that was actually one of my concerns. I mean, and we we're talking about everything except reliability in this case, at least the, the joint applicants were. And, uh, and I was concerned about reliability. <laughs> and uh, the only thing that really that was uh, said about that was that uh, they eventually agreed to uh, NM areas uh, request that uh, th that the joint applicants would continue to spend uh, the the current capital uh, budget that PNM has uh, in place. There is nothing more specific than that. Thank you, Ashley. That's all my questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are any questions, I. I'll just do a little, hopefully just two minute um, explanation of why uh, I support the proposed order. And the proposed order basically uh, denying the merger. Um, we're about to enter, in fact, we are in an incredibly important stage with our electric utilities. They're going through a major transformation as we go to um, renewable energy. Um, and it's changing things all up and down the supply chain. It's changing relationships with customers because of technologies. Um, it's putting um, extraordinary demands on utilities as well as regulators. And I am very concerned that as we're entering this really significant transformation, um, that we're kind of bringing on, a, a, this transaction brings on a new major player in helping to achieve this transition. And in, in this case, the proposed player um, has a demonstrated record of poor performance that's well documented by our hearing examiner, um, whether it's Maine or Connecticut or New York, um, and that the sweeteners that have been put in the deal and the benefits, and I'll just pick out the ratepayer credits as one, um, if the performance that they've done elsewhere, it turns out to be what happens in New Mexico, if um, all of those so-called benefits will be soaked up in reliability issues and higher rates uh, if they perform as we've seen elsewhere uh, quite rapidly. And um, we stand quite frankly, not to gain momentum in our transition, we could very well get hung up and lose momentum. And that so many of those benefits uh, could be that are purported to happen in this transaction uh, could happen through a transaction with another company that has a better operating record 
uh, that we're not taking a chance with, um, or could be handled through commission uh, or legislative policy, commission rules or legislative policy. And I know a lot of proponents present this as a one-time opportunity. And my perception is that's simply not true. Um, PNN can find another suitor and uh, that's more appropriate and we can still get uh, sweeteners on the deal or the legislature or the PRC uh, can, can adopt policies that achieve many of those goals. And this whole deal to me kind of boils down to promises versus actual performance. And it's pointed out uh, by proponents that um, all kinds of provisions have put, been put in this deal that theoretically will protect us. And my response to that is, well, they've got regulators in Maine didn't seem to protect them. Uh, why do we think we'll do better here? Um, and that being on the commission, I see the limitations of regulation. And so often, uh, and, and as, a, as a commission, I know we're trying to address this problem, but so often we don't get involved until after the fact. And uh, that's a, that's no consolation for ratepayers, customers, or the economy. And um, uh, so to me, those are all very, very problematic issues uh, that I don't think we should be foisting those risks on our ratepayers. Um, and to me, actual historical performance means a hell of a lot more than any promises you make. Um, and then finally, you know, and it's been said before, is that, you know, we look at this performance stuff and the issues around, um, it, I'll just call them uh, ethical issues or honesty issues. People are arguing whether these are true or not, or whether they're real or not. Um, whatever's going on in Spain, whatever's gone on elsewhere. And there are different perspectives that people put on the record. Uh, but I have to say what really sticks with me is we can't afford to discount those potential issues. And we can't afford to because Avangrid itself, the joint, the, the joint movements have basically amplified our need to consider those issues by their conduct during this particular docket. They've demonstrated the behaviors that we're afraid of. Um, so that takes, in my mind, these from, uh, when I see that actual behavior, I can't sit here and say, oh, well, that's just speculative or that's just someone's interpretation. We've seen it here. And, you know, maybe the other arguments, uh, the arguments pro, um, are right, but I got to say our personal experience here at the commission says, no, this appears to be um, standard operating procedure based on our working relationship with Avangrid. So anyway, you put all that together and, and I have to say, uh, uh, I, I have to decide based on actual performance and what we've seen as a commission here. And that tells me um, this is not the right partner at this critical time in our energy transition. Um, so I would uh, vote no on this merger. So those are my thoughts. And other commissioners, please feel free. Well, Mr. Chair, um, I have to say I share that view. Um, for the reasons I mentioned before, um, we see a lot in the record that indicates that um, to permit this merger would be to tie our uh, heretofore uh, well running, reasonably well running uh, utility company uh, with a very good reliability record, I believe so far, 
with a company that has proven record of um, uh, bad management uh, performance of the uh, IOUs that they own elsewhere in this in this country, and um, which also has. Uh, you know, the investigation in Spain and um, that indicates uh, a very aggressive uh, modus operandi, I guess I should say, uh, with respect to challenges it faces that have led it to uh, conduct that merits a criminal investigation uh, into practices that involve uh, deceitful behavior you know, and uh, just plain illegal behavior, bribery and uh, surveilling, uh, spying on not just other corporate entities, but members of the public uh, who oppose their objectives. Uh, and um, I, I, uh, I totally agree that we're in a, a very uh, critical time right now with the development of the um, you know, or the, the renewable energy market in our state. And I would like to see it continue to thrive. And I'm concerned that this merger would uh, really uh, complicate that course and compromise it uh, with uh, all sorts of issues, such as the corporation, such as Avangrid's opportunity for self-dealing uh, among their uh, regulated and non-regulated affiliates uh, in a way that uh, could really throw a spanner into the development of our vibrant, developing vibrant uh, renewable energy market in our state. Um, so I see that it has a lot of risks, which we can't really uh, quantify very well, but we certainly have strong red flags flying in our face and uh, benefits, some of which can be quantified, some of which cannot be quantified uh, in the merger. And, the, and my concern about the merger is that, as we've said before, the stipulating parties, um, you know, while they're somewhat diverse, they still, their constituencies do not in any way add up to uh, the interests reflected by the ratepayers of the whole state. And um, I think their agreement with the merger terms ha has to necessarily be motivated by their own organization's priorities. So I, I really don't feel the merger is something that is the best mechanism for implementing the best public policy that we can achieve. And I think there, I agree with you, there will be other opportunities and hopefully they will come to us in a, in a different way uh, to protect the public while being able to carry out our, our mandate under the Energy Transition Act and and lift our state into that new, new state of a, of a dynamic, clean grid. Um, but I don't think this is the way to do it. So I, I, uh, I also would have to uh, approve the, uh, uh, the order that denies the approval of the merger. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Mastitz. Um, before we continue with discussion that's germane to, to this case, I'd feel much better if we continue discussion after a, a motion and a second has been made. Mr. Chair, I'll move the order. <clears throat> and I will second. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> if I may, I've got a statement I'd like to read. Sure. Um, our charge here is to render a decision that's in the public interest, which is a balance of ratepayer interests and utility investor interests 
Also, the commission has a policy of favoring stipulations to avoid costly and protracted litigation and the recognition that a cooperative approach may be more effective in reconciling the interests of all the parties than would the polarization which often accompanies adversarial proceedings. <laughs> As an engineer, I'm trained to solve problems and develop solutions. And I thought there was perhaps a way forward with hearing examiner Sean Auer's recommended modifications to the June 4th stipulation as a baseline to negotiate for further concessions from the joint applicants to significantly increase benefits for PM ratepayers. Uh, when I participated in the evidentiary hearings, I asked for additional investments in grid modernization, energy efficiency deferrals, additional rate credits, and an across the board forgiveness of all COVID related arrearages. And I wanna thank the applicants for following my advice and continuing to negotiate with staff subsequent to my participation in the hearings in trying to address those concerns. If we were on a path to revising the stipulation, I would have also pushed to make the quantitative sum of the benefits in any final agreement much more than the $391 million payment over the market value of p and stock in this transaction and the millions of dollars in golden parachutes for p and executives that would have followed in the wake of the merger if it went through. With late positive developments, such as the applicants acquiescing to a majority of independent control on the board of the merged entity, which had previously been a deal breaker by the applicants, I thought that might be a step in the right direction to insulate New Mexico from the troubling aspects of the parent company, companies and its affiliates questionable conduct. The public is not privy to the sobering information regarding the criminal investigation by Spain of current and former executives with Ibidrola that we as commissioners read as part of the confidential version of the recommended decision. That only added to the other concerns regarding the proposed transaction. In the end though, it would appear that a majority of my colleagues on the commission understandably feel that the numerous commitments negotiated by a coalition of credible interveners simply are insufficient to mitigate the justifiable questions and concerns regarding the proposed transaction. Certainly now it's becoming common knowledge that the Public Regulation Commission lacks the necessary funding and resources to effectively enforce a complex transaction such as this proposed merger. Executive and legislative branches take note. I also worry that as utilities own executives have, have acknowledged, the resources available to PNM simply are also insufficient to carry New Mexico into the renewable future envisioned by the governor and the legislative leadership through their trailblazing legislation and environmental initiatives such as the Energy Transition Act and the governor's net zero emissions goals. I have full faith that my fellow commissioners have exercised their duties and their due diligence in this case. If the commission votes to deny the merger's stipulated agreement, the joint applicants still have the option to request further commission proceedings regarding their application for the merger. Our primary, as I said at the outset, our primary responsibility today is to render a decision that is in the public interest, which balances ratepayer interests with utility investors' interests which is exactly what we strive for in every case. The New Mexico Public Regulation Commission has been subjected to a key measure by the legislature. That is, percentage of cases appealed to the New Mexico Supreme Court by regulated entities or interveners and not overturned. Generally speaking, a commission decision that drastically departs from a hearing examiner's recommended decision significantly reduces its chances of being upheld before the Supreme Court upon appeal. I cannot vote yes on the agreement as it stands. The hearing examiner's modified stipulation and the agreements by the joint applicants still do not, in my eyes, rise to the level of the public interest. And without enough interest 
from my fellow commissioners to engage in further deliberations or negotiations on further modifying the agreement, the fact is that I cannot negotiate with myself. And so in the absence of further negotiations and additions to the agreement as it stands, uh, I also will cast a no vote today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Maestas. Um, oh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just to follow on, uh, there was a comment made by Commissioner Maestas, which I uh, neglect, well, I didn't neglect to mention, but I, I, I think I would have mentioned it later, but I, I, now is a good time. Uh, because you mentioned that the commission has a policy of favoring stipulated agreements. I don't know that we have a policy. We certainly don't have a policy written, uh, but um, we have heard uh, in other cases, uh, occasionally an attorney will say, uh, New Mexico law favors uh, uh, stipulated agreements or, or, you know, the commission favors stipulated agreements. But I, I, um, I actually think that stipulated agreements can be problematic uh, for our commission when we're dealing with larger cases that have significant policy issues because they're often, well, often they're black box uh, stipulated agreements. This one didn't happen to be, but that to me is um, just sort of a derogation of our duty when we have black boxes because there is no transparency, no understanding available to, to the public of what those decisions are based on. And even when it's not a black box, as we have today, we still have uh, an imperfect situation where parties who are parties to the case are not necessarily uh, motivated by the priority that the commission would be motivated by, which is uh, balancing the interests of ratepayers against the interest of utility companies. So, um, and none of them have the duty we have. So I actually uh, think that we should re-examine that statement that's been made in cases that we favor uh, stipulated agreements to see how and when, uh, if we could put some some structure around that, that concept and and try to find a way that, uh, where it actually makes sense in the realm of public policy. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get back to focusing on yeah. uh, on this. What's in front of us now? Right. Um, so Commissioner Bird and Commissioner Vicente Aguilar, um, uh, would you like to make any comments before we move to a vote? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Um, I will vote against the merger for the following reasons. I think um, the proponents gave us a view of their management conditions, which um, I cannot accept because I happen to be elected for regular people. When I say regular people, I'm talking about ratepayers, uh, people that do not have a voice in the structure. That's the reason why I would vote against the merger. The second reason is that there was pure public monopoly that was being played out and and I think it's a narrow, a narrow uh, group of people that um, expressed their opinion in support. And um, but I go beyond that because, as I always say, uh, New Mexico is the land that we love to live in. And uh, we protect the air, we protect the land. Um, as Native Americans, they've been living here forever. And um, we want to live in peace and harmony. That's the, the thought behind my, my reasoning. 
we don't we are not open to monopolies that's not my way of living and that's not my way of leadership uh it was tough we i was in my opinion i had to voice my opinion at the last open meeting because it was a must and since then i had high level of pressure and um i was able to get through it and concentrate on the meaningful governmental structure to lead for the people and lastly i think the lawsuits that were noted and especially when documentation was filed as confidential uh i think that was another reason why i stepped back and asked why should it be suppressed and uh, um and i think all the everyday people the normal people the regular people they want to know the details and um so i am here as your commissioner to speak for what is best for new mexico and i will vote against the merger thank you mr chairman thank you commissioner and commissioner bird do you have any thoughts do i thank know you, you do Chair. but any that you want to share is what i should yes say. thank you um Go ahead. <clears throat> you know, far too often we find elected officials too worried about the job they have rather than the job they were elected to do. I, for one, was elected by the people of New Mexico to do our best here at the commission in providing affordable, reliable utilities to New Mexicans. I'm a little concerned about the fact that in this order, there's a fine basically being levied against one of the companies involved. I talked to Mr. Smith briefly about that because that's not something we see every time there's a hearing that somebody be fined. And it's not that it's never happened, but the one time that we could think of that it had happened, the utility individual being fined was at best, I guess, hostile towards the PRC and, and the process, refusing to cooperate, and therefore was fined. It's interesting that there's a fine here for Avangrid, one of the concerns, and it's been mentioned by my fellow commissioners, is how is customer support, customer service going to be handled under the new uh, regime of Avangrid? And one of the things that we have to go on is, well, how are you performing now? And we look at Maine and about Four or five months ago, I did a single signature order asking for those matrixes on the Avangrid companies about how they're performing and taking care of their customers. That led to further discussions and debate and the conclusion that we weren't getting the true the complete story with the first order and more information was brought in i thought it was very telling that a state representative from another state who has no vested interest in the state of new mexico would call in and give his opinion about this they're in a place, and, and it was mentioned by Mr. Smith, where 
they're trying to see how to get rid of a problem. To me, that is very concerning. I know that the papers and, and everybody who's for this is just going to talk about the amount of money that is going to be lost to the state if this merger buyout is not allowed to happen. I realize that. And, and we've all considered it and we've talked about it. But where is that money ultimately going to come from? The money's going to come from the ratepayers, from our fellow New Mexicans. For what? For a loss in quality of service. And I don't say that somewhat objectively. I say that based on the evidence of what we're seeing. I'm somewhat perplexed. And I wonder about the employees of PM when they hear statements that, well, PM doesn't know how to run something, they don't know how to operate something, there's technologies they don't know how to deal with. I have spoke with quite a few people that work for PM. I find them quite intelligent and capable of learning. I also know that the management of PM is smart enough to know when they don't know how to do something, they hire somebody, an individual who can bring in the knowledge they need whether that's a permanent employee or consultant. So that's not a valid reason for loss of service. Should we by chance vote and not approve this order, thereby allowing the stipulation to remain, then what we're gonna see in the newspapers in the next few years is look at the cost to customers, is this really what we wanted? The headlines are starting to write themselves. But by all appearances, my colleagues are saying they will vote no. And I believe that is the right vote. And as Commissioner Maestas said, that doesn't mean we are wholly opposed to the application of the proposed merger buyout. We're proposed, we are opposed to the agreement that has been put forth and feel that it does not provide adequate protections for the people of New Mexico. And with that, I will hold my vote until I vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Byrd. Um, if everybody's talked out, what I suggest is that we take a vote and then take a break. Um, so any other comments from commissioners before we vote? Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead. I, I just wanted to recognize uh, Mike Smith and general counsel staff for really working on this. This was a, uh, a monumental task to really prepare for, for this, you know, this commission action. So uh, Mike Smith and OGC staff, thank you. Uh, Ditto. Agreed. You know, quadro, probably Quinto. Um, Mike, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Fishman. Uh, to the order, aye. Commission, Commissioner Bird. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. The order is approved five to zero. Um, and before we break, I just wanted to make a couple really quick comments. Uh, one thing that really stuck out to me is that um, there's no kind of official process in a big transaction like this where the uh, acquiring company is evaluated. And uh, if if I'm renting out an apartment, um, you know, I get a background check. And that background check includes criminal records, it includes uh, financial strength, it includes other stuff. Of course, in this case, it would need to be far more exhausting, exhaustive. And it seems to me both the PRC um, and the AG, who has the responsibility to uh, represent normal small customers, um, 
that should be part of our standard operating procedure before uh, right at the right at the front of any of these kinds of uh, decisions, a thorough uh, background check and a thorough operating check on where that company's been, what it's done, and how it's performed. And so I'd like to suggest that uh, that's something we uh, require and just make a part of any future proceedings uh, along these lines. Uh, the second thing I wanted to quick point out was I got a zillion zillion letters and we can't address uh, a lot of the issues that are raised at the commission. Those are legislative issues. But what struck me in all those letters was that uh, I can, you can tell by the way people write a letter, whether they're coming from the right side of the aisle or the left side of the aisle, uh, the way they introduce the issues just makes it a dead giveaway. Uh, but what was a common denominator between all the letters I got was number one, they didn't like this transaction, but number two, that um, all of them, as a matter of policy, want to keep our um, our major utility uh, a New Mexico utility and a local utility. Some said public, some had other ideas, but they all wanted it to stay here. And we can't address that at the commission, uh, I don't believe. Um, if a big company comes in and makes a good offer, um, we'll say yes, uh, if it's not New Mexico. But I would just encourage all those folks uh, to talk to their legislators. And uh, if that's really what you want as the public, um, go out, talk to the legislature and make it happen. So those are my two thoughts. And with that, let's take a break. And uh, we'll be back at four o'clock. Thank you.
Mr. Chair. Commissioner Hall, did I hear you? Yeah. Are, are we coming back at four or 415? No, if four. That's what I thought you said. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm a little slow here. I'm sorry. It's getting late. Yeah, I know. I'm moving slower and I'm not getting any younger. Well, all we can do is eat more food and drink more coffee or something, right? <laughs> okay, so you, want me to, you want me to look more like Jeff is what you're telling me. Oh, good grief. <laughs> you should wish. You <laughs> You know you resemble that remark. Come on. Hey. Oh, heartedly. <laughs> Love Mr. more Chairman. adorable. Don't worry. I've been catching up to you lately. It's scary. Okay. Um, commissioners, uh, we all here? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner. Myers. I just wanted to make a suggestion. I mean, it's a play it by ear suggestion, but... Um, depending on how long it, it takes for these remaining agenda items leading up to uh, the discussion on the four corners uh, here, uh, recommended decision, uh, we, we should consider recessing and reconvening in the morning because I, I see the discussion, you know, lasting a while on the four corners RD. Uh, just a suggestion if it no, I think that's a terrific suggestion because uh, that's a complicated one and it'd be nice to approach it fresh. Um, other commissioners, what are your thoughts? Mr. Chair, I have to connect, uh, consult my calendar. I, my morning looks free. I have a one to, a meeting in the afternoon from one to four. But so I, if we get together at 9.30, Tomorrow morning, yep. would that work for you? Works for me. Okay. Uh, Commissioner- 7.30 would be better. Yeah, you always do, I can do that. that. You know, you're just- uh, you're so I could smart. start earlier if you need. Yeah. No, I think Jeff is starting kind of a new social movement here. Rural smug. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Commissioner Vicente Aguilar, you okay with that? Uh, yes, uh, I, I suggest that re we should recess very soon. Um, perhaps the three or four cases that are remaining on the agenda, maybe we should continue on tomorrow morning. Okay, sounding good. So uh, uh, Commissioner Maestas, you get universal approval for your suggestion. And we'll go till five o'clock and then we'll recess and complete things tomorrow at 9.30. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, my wonderful colleagues. 
Thank you for thinking of it, Commissioner Meyer. And Commissioner Bird, you're welcome to show up at 7.30 and wait for the rest of us. That's usually what happens. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're on to item 20, double lot 237 UT, uh, the matter of public service company of New Mexico's application for approval of its 2022 and 23 transportation electrification program. And Michael, please lead us through it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, um, this is here on a motion for rehearing that was filed on November 19th by Prosperity Works and the Coalition for Clean Affordable Energy, uh, seeking rehearing of the commission's final order, which adopted the recommended decision uh, dated November um, 10th, 2021. Um, the motion seeks rehearing of that portion of the final order, which rejected the uh, Prosperity Works exception to the recommended decisions recommendation that the commission approve PNM's uh, transportation electrification plan requirement that all residential customers receiving incentives under the TEP must connect their EV chargers to Wi-Fi or cellular service. Um, the incentive that's at issue is um, the 3,000 rebates for up to $500 for the purchase of a residential level two charger. Um, that's a rebate that was, uh, um, in, I guess, um, made part of the plan in connection with a uh, additional supplemental rebate uh, for up to $2,000 for the installation cost of a qualified residential charger, um, which would be available only for up to 150 low to middle income uh, customers um, that self-identify, excuse me, as income qualified. They're, those low income customers um, are required, uh, lower middle income customers are required to take advantage of the residential rebate, charger rebate in order to qualify for the supplemental inst installation incentive. So those two, uh, those two rebates are tied, at, tied together for LMI customers. Um, the final order considered uh, Prosperity Works exception, which at that time argued that, quote, it's an unjust and unreasonable for the commission, excuse me, for PNM to exclude certain customers, many of whom are low income from these programs only because the customers cannot afford home Wi Fi or an additional cellular bill. PNM has not demonstrated that it needs every participant to pay for Wi-Fi or cellular connection in order to evaluate the effectiveness, effectiveness of its residential program. Therefore, Prosperity Works and CCAE urge the commission to remove this eligibility requirement. Um, the final order uh, rejected the exception um, finding um, based rather on PNM's rationale for the data sharing requirement. Uh, which said that data, data collected initially can be very important to the foundation of future TEPs, future PNM, further rather, PNM must have sufficient and reliable data from all various types of participants in order to be able to validate, charge, change, or eliminate programs as necessary, especially when the payment of the TEP expenses is by PNM customers. Um, the final order agreed that at this early stage, the collection of data from all customers is necessary for planning the successful implementation of future TEPs and should take priority over attempting to incentivize universal participation. Uh, Prosperity Works and CCA now argue that the final order does not provide a reasonable justification for approving PNM's proposed requirement that participants in its residential charging programs provide Wi Fi or cellular service for their chargers. It erroneously finds that PNM's data collection should take priority over modifications that will make its program more equitable and accessible to low-income customers. Uh, Prosperity Works CCAE argue that the legislature did not order the commission to prioritize data collection, but rather section 62812 specifically commands the commission to consider whether a utility's transportation electrification program will advance the legislature's priority of increasing access to EV charging. Prosperity Works and the CCAE again propose that the commission modify the internet connection requirement so that it only applies to customers who have Wi-Fi, asserting that this approach meets the legislature's equity goals for expanding transportation to LMI New Mexicans. 
Um, they continue to argue rejecting this common sense alternative does nothing to further uh, PNM's data collection goals. That is, PNM would collect the exact same data under both of the following scenarios. One, PNM excludes customers who lack Wi Fi from program participation as the final order authorizes. And two, PNM helps customers install home chargers regardless of whether they have Wi Fi uh, and collects data from customers who have Wi Fi. Either way, PNM does not obtain charging data from those customers who lack Wi Fi. The only difference is whether the customers without Wi Fi have the opportunity to participate in the program they pay for through their electric bills. Um, they argue that the commission's decision to condition participation on PNM's residential charger and installation programs on the, excuse me, the commission's decision to condition participation on PNM's residential charger and installation programs on a customer's ability to connect their charger to the internet is unjust, unreasonable, and contrary to the legislature's intent and Tension that the commission expand access to EV charging for low-income customers. Um, PNM's response uh, argues that data con connectivity for electric vehicle chargers is reasonable and a necessary requirement of PNM's inaugural transportation electrification program. PNM notes that if a customer does not have home Wi-Fi, they can obtain a dedicated cellular connection for their EV charger. PNM argues that as it developed its TEP, PNM sought to ensure that L, uh, low and moderate income customers and communities have the opportunity to participate in transportation electrification, and that it has given significant consideration to increasing access to low income customers because of the multiple elements of the transportation electrification plan that focus on low and moderate income customers and communities. PNM points out many other elements of PNM's TEP that aim to ensure low and moderate in income customers are included. It notes that T its TEP allows low and moderate income customers to receive a $500 rebate for installation of an EV charger, and that this rebate is available to all qualifying customers regardless of income. PNM also points out that its TEP allows low and moderate income customers to receive an additional $2,000 incentive for the costs that may be required to upgrade the customer's electric panel and targets low and moderate income multifamily housing by including a specific budget for the installation of EV charging infrastructure at multifamily housing units. It also reserves 20% of the budget for public and workplace level two charging for the installation of EV charging infrastructure in low and moderate income communities and it requires that mass transit charging incentives be tied to transit routes that include stops located directly in low and income, excuse me, moderate income communities. And finally, that it reserves a portion of the marketing and outreach budget for a contract with a community-based organization with the specific goal of targeting outreach to low and moderate income cu customers. PNM argues also that it has ensured that there is a low barrier to low and moderate income customers as they apply for residential programs. Customers can simply self-identify that they meet the statutory definition of low income and there is no documentation required or other barrier. PNM points to the language of section 62812B and argues that consideration for low and income uh, low-income customers, while important, is only a secondary component of the six main criteria of the transportation electrification statute. It is not an independent criterion. Um, and that the language they point to is 62812B, um, which it has the language that states that the commission is to consider whether the utilities proposed investments Incentives, programs, and expenditures are too reasonably expected to increase access to the use of electricity as a transportation fuel with consideration given for increasing access, such access to a low to low income users and users in underserved communities. PNM argues that the point of the data collection and its program design is to understand the way PNM customers begin to use EV charging and the potential effect of the whole house excuse me, whole home electric vehicle rate. P 
PNM points to testimony that by missing the opportunity to install network charging infrastructure at the outset of the TEP, PNM would be negatively impacting the future adoption of any proposed managed charging programs. Also, PNM is not requiring any submetering for the residential infrastructure at the, in the WEV rate, so there's no way to see exactly what load is coming excuse me, is from the home versus what is the EV charging load. Access to the data collected by the network charger will assist in analyzing the data, data to better inform rates in the future. PNM also argues that Prosperity Works and CCAE offer no evidence in support of their assertion that the internet connectivity requirement will prevent, quote, a significant portion of low-income customers from participating. PNM notes that at the, at the hearing in this matter, Prosperity Wit Works witness Ona Porter acknowledged that she, quote, she had no, quote, specific information about the level of Wi-Fi availability among people at 200% or below of the federal poverty level. PNM also points out that PN Prosperity Works was unable to provide evidence at the hearing in support of its testimony that obtaining a cellular connection was prohibitively expensive. Um, in its final order, the commission noted on this issue that at this initial state development stage of PNM's TEP, considerations such as data, data collection that are reasonably um, considerations rather such as data collection that are reasonably intended to facilitate and achieve the ultimate purpose of achieving universal EV usage may take precedence over attempting to incentivize universal participation immediately even including LMI customers. Um, as PNM notes, its TEP has a number of provisions designed to incentivize EV usage among LMI users and users in underserved communities. PNM's $2,000 charger installation incentive is by its terms already focused on removing financial barriers to participation by LMI users because it is intended, limited rather, to identify those as LM, identify to those, sorry, to those who identify as LMI. The TE statute requires that consideration be given to increasing access to LMI users. It does not require that to be reasonable, a program remove all possible barriers to full participation by LMI customers. While Prosperity Works and CCAE point to the Commission's decision on the SPS and EPETEP -E plans, those plans did not propose to prioritize the collection of user data through network um, community. The choices of other utilities to prioritize increased consumer choices in electric vehicles charging at the expense of data collection does not necessarily render PNM's focus on the collection of user data unreasonable at this stage and based on the presenting the evidence presented. In the event that the commission chooses um, to accommodate Prosperity Works um, position, I do have language that provides, should the commission choose to go that route um, and grant the uh, motion for rehearing and the relief requested, um, a provision that says, and it's highlighted in your form of the order, that notwithstanding this, the commission recognizes there is some room for flexibility in accommodating both priorities. While Prosperity Works and CCAE appear to take a more rigid stance on rehearing that the Wi-Fi cellular connection requirement be eliminated for all residential customers to avoid its impact on LMI users, its original exception included a more focused proposal that the commission could make the Wi-Fi cellular connection requirement optional for only the 150 LMI customers who received the $2,000 supplemental installation rebate. PNM would collect data from the remaining 2,850 participants in the residential program and likely a portion of the LMI customers as well. Just as it was reasonable to accommodate the ability of existing EV owners to take service under the WHEV rate, by increasing participation opportunities, there should be room to accommodate a portion of LMI users for whom the necessary Wi-Fi or cellular connection may be a barrier. Um, so that's essentially language that provides that if the commission wants to 
maintain its original position, uh, it can do so. And if it chooses to um, grant the motion for rehearing, um, there would be a basis to uh, do so without removing the uh, Wi-Fi um, uh, cellular connection requirement from the entirety of consumers who choose to participate uh, in that rebate program. I stand for questions. Commissioners. I think we're tired, but I have a question. Um, in order to adopt uh, this amendment to our original order, um, which seems to me uh, balanced and sensible, um, do we, is it required that we do a hearing? Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, uh, no, it would be a uh, motion for rehearing is a um, sort of a term of art, I guess, in, in the sense that it's frequently uh, referred to by many people when they're filing their motions as a motion for reconsideration. Okay. Um, so the commission could do a, a hearing. It could choose just to go on the basis of uh, reconsidera reconsidering its original decision. Um, reopening a hearing is uh, a rather a motion to reopen would re if the commission does it, that requires reopening an, an evidentiary hearing. Okay, that, that clarifies for me. At any rate, I'll just make a comment. It seems like a sensible middle ground um, that everybody gets most of what they need. So I'll just open it up for commissioner discussion. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, I, I agree. I think, I mean, I'd rather arrive at some sort of compromise that helps both sides achieve most of their goal or parts of their goal anyhow. So uh, I think it would be fine to do that. Um, other commissioner thoughts? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I think we can go ahead and um, recommend what uh, Mr. Smith has put on the table. Thank you. Um, so I will make a motion. Do I have a second? A motion to approve the order? Yes, second. Second. Well, we have to pick denied or granted. Well, it's, oh, granted, yes. Okay. Actually, if the, that's, um, sorry, Commissioner uh, Hall is correct. It, this is set forth as alternatives for the commission. Right. So there should so, be a motion. The motion should specify which. So, um, so, um, I move. Uh, I move that we. Um, I don't have it in front of me. What is it? One or two that's that enacts the um, change. Um, I actually did not. I did not number it the way I did on the other case. But it, if the the motion would be either to deny the motion for rehearing or to grant the motion for rehearing, um, and if you grant the motion for rehearing, it would be that compromise. Okay, so I move to grant the motion for rehearing. And I will second that um, motion. And, and just to just to clarify, the if the commission goes that route, the ordering paragraph would provide that the November tenth, twenty twenty one final order is revised to provide that the requirement that users connect their EV chargers to a Wi Fi or cellular connection to be eligible for the $500 rebate for the purchase of a qualified residential level two charger shall be modified to make the Wi-Fi cellular connection requirement optional for only the 150 LMI customers who receive the $2,000 supplemental installation rebate. Correct. That sounds fine, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Okay, Michael, it sounds like we're ready to take the roll. Commissioner Bird. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. Aye. And the order. Uh, go ahead. The order is approved by a vote of five to zero. Uh, thank you, Michael, for ferreting out that. Compromise, appreciate it. Um, on to item, yeah, there we go. <laughs> item 10, 18 double 214 UT, the matter of an order to show cause 
as to why Santa Rosa, why Rosa Joint Ventures, excuse me, the New Mexico Partnership should not be found in violation of the Public Utility Act and commission rules. And Russell, this one is yours. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'll make this quick. Uh, the commission is very familiar with this case. Uh, back in uh, August, uh, well, I'll go back to a little further. In June of this last year, the commission approved um, a stipulated order um, uh, that involved transferring uh, Rosa Joint Venture uh, waste water and wastewater system to uh, Sambrito Mutual Domestic. Um, and the agreement uh, uh, cont contemplated an August 16th closing date, a 60 day closing period to get all the transfers done and also to get approvals that were needed from San Juan County uh, with regard to, I think they needed a, an amended subdivision map and uh, the office of the state engineer to identify um, whether there were sufficient uh, water rights and then uh, owned by RJV uh, to Rosa Joint Venture to uh, transfer to San Brito and uh, to accomplish that. Um, as the commission will recall, uh, uh, the commission uh, ended up imposing uh, penalties, which are ongoing, uh, in the amount of $100 per business day, uh, accruing penalties, uh, because it was clear from the record that uh, RGV and San Brito did little or nothing during the 60-day period to uh, accomplish the things that needed to be accomplished for the closing. Um, the commission issued uh, its August uh, 18th order uh, after the August 16th a deadline had been missed, uh, the transfer hadn't closed, um, and uh, then began to, uh, the, uh, the order included penalties that would start accruing the next Monday. Um, and then we saw uh, with uh, reporting that started to come in from the two, uh, RJB and San Brito, that they were de just then taking the initial steps to get the, uh, the permissions they needed from the county and from uh, and from uh, the Office of the State Engineer. Um, so those uh, fines began to accrue in the amount of $100 per business day. Starting on August 23rd, they continue uh, to accrue. Um, we've been receiving reports uh, from RGV and San Brito. Um, there's, there is progress. They continue to work with the county and the Office of the State Engineer, uh, but you know the transfer still hasn't closed. Um, so uh, the parties filed a uh, joint motion to tr uh, extend the closing date um, uh, to January 31st of next year. Um, and staff does not oppose the motion. Uh, staff has the same uh, view of the motion as, as I have described in the memo and as, as I would specifically include in the order, which is that granting this extension really won't, uh, I mean, the, the order that I uh, proposed order I've drafted would grant the extension, but it notes that this isn't really, it doesn't change much for, for RGV and San Brito because the penalties will continue to accrue uh, at the end, the amount of hundred dollars per business day, uh, uh, despite the extension. This is, this doesn't forgive penalties. It doesn't say that the extended date is now you know, we understand why you missed the other dates or something like that. It just it just gives them an extended deadline for whatever purposes that may help them for. It may help them possibly with dealing with, uh, you know, the county and the office of state engineer if they have an actual deadline they're trying to meet. It sometimes just helps people to have a deadline to get everyone motivated for that date. So that makes sense. But the, really, the these penalties that continue to accrue are the message there is get this done as soon as possible. If you can get it done next week, please do. Uh, this isn't a, a sort of forgiveness of, of, of time or, a, or a, you know, a reprieve from penalties. Get it done as fast as possible because it's clearly in the best interest of the public and the ratepayers to get it done because there is money waiting. There's money waiting for the mutual domestic to do necessary repairs and improvements and maintenance of the system um, there was a legislative uh, uh, apportionment for this specific project. I guess the legislature actually lists water projects um, in the budget, and this is one of them. The, we just need this transaction to happen for the money to be released. And for uh, NMED, then I think has additional funds for uh, getting a certified operator. 
So this just needs to happen as soon as possible. It's clearly in everyone's best interest. So the granting this motion, um, you know, would just give a, a new target for them, but obviously the target is to just get it done as fast as possible. So that's all that the, my proposed order would do. Uh, but uh, Commissioner Fishman uh, has a, an alternative proposal that would do the same thing, but would also uh, state that as of February 1st of next year, if it has, if the um, transaction didn't close as of the extended, um, the extended closing date of January 31st, then uh, the penalty will be raised to $300 per business day um, and continue to accrue thereafter, which makes perfect sense. My proposed order simply was silent on what would happen. I didn't say one way or the other uh, uh, if that date is missed. So I think either proposed order would work uh, perfectly well. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. Um, so um, Russell, uh, just a quick comment on why I made that one change is um, you noted that when we instituted the initial penalty, that was the first time we got any action uh, from the parties on this. And exactly. they've just been sitting on it. And the fact that it's taking so long, uh, even after we've um, instigated that penalty, uh, kind of as an indication of how little groundwork was done. Um, and my thought in putting that $300 there was just a way to say, hey, <laughs> we made it. We're giving you two more months. Um, take us seriously. It's We're not going to just sit on it and you're you can keep asking for more extensions because that's been the history of this thing. And it's now been three years. Um, so uh, anyway, that was my reasoning behind making that one change. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, and as the, the, the order notes, again, that, that this has been going for before the, the June 15th order approving the stipulation. I mean, the, the proceeding was almost three years old at that point. So when it was before the hearing examiner, I mean, the hearing was, uh, was uh, postponed multiple times uh, to give the parties more time to negotiate. And that, to some extent, that's expected in a water case like this. But I mean, it's really been a tremendous amount of unjustifiable delay. Um, so with that, commissioners, uh, discussion, thoughts, motions? Mr. Chair? I'd like to make a motion to approve your uh, uh, alternative order that goes to three hundred dollars next spring. Sometime, what was that? February. Or March? February first. Too much. Money. Okay. I'll second. Um, and any other discussion? Okay, my uh, Michael, please take the roll. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Berg. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. Order passes five to zero. Okay. Um, thank you, Russell. And uh, we're on to item 11, 21, double lot 242 in the matter of EPE's integrated resource plan for 2021 to 2040. Russell, this one is yours. The floor stays with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, I've drafted a proposed order that would adopt uh, staff's recommendation uh, to accept uh, EPE's IRP uh, on the condition of the correction of, of uh, one deficiency that I'll describe. Um, staff's recommendation largely uh, rejects the, um, the uh, recommendations and proposals that were made uh, by the two uh, commenters in this matter, uh, which were the city of Las Cruces and uh, Mary Lee Souls. Uh, mostly rejects them as going beyond um, what's required of the company by the current version of the IRP rule. Of course, there's a rulemaking proceeding that's pending. Um, I'm not going to go through every single issue. I'll go through some of the major issues because I think you know we do want to finish this up today and um, possibly. Uh, I mean, we do have another week. There's another week if the commission would like to consider it. Uh, it obviously, you can consider it tomorrow as well as um, next week, but I'll try to keep this brief. 
and then just uh, open it up for questions. Um, so this, this IRP will be the first IRP that EP has that, it, that addresses the, um, the ETA's requirements, the, um, the um, <clears throat> Energy Transition Act's requirements for 80% renewable uh, uh, as measured by retail sales uh, in New Mexico uh, by 2040 and then totally carbon free as of 2045. Um, so EP really had to make a lot of changes in its planning uh, based on that. And one thing I wanna note to begin with is that uh, even though uh, the two commenters, the city of Las Cruces, the Marilee Souls, do uh, have a number of issues with the uh, IRP, they actually do both agree uh, with EPE, uh, EP's uh, adoption of a particular portfolio type. Um, I think there were three or four portfolios that were tested under their modeling. And so there is some significant agreement um, with the, the commenters. Um, this option that was chosen by um, EPE, you know, addresses how to uh, comply with the, the increased um, uh, renewable portfolio standards uh, under the ETA uh, in light of the fact that most of EPE's business is in Texas. They have 80% uh, of their jurisdiction, uh, on a jurisdictional basis, 80% of their business, their customers are in Texas and New Mexico has 20%. So the question was uh, really how to deal with that. And as I said, EPE uh, arrived at this portfolio that they call least cost plus REA resources, least cost plus resources to meet the New Mexico Renewable Energy Act standards. Um, under that option, all new resources are allocated on a jurisdictional basis. In other words, 80-20, uh, except for new gas plants, which are 100% allocated to Texas which is consistent with, um, with the renewable portfolio standards. And it's also consistent with the commission's decision to uh, deny a CCN for the Newman Unit, uh, uh, Newman Unit 6 uh, gas plant um, due to the, the portfolio requirements. So, um, and as I said, there's, there's uh, both Marilee Souls and uh, the city agree with that. Um, let me just get into a little bit of where they disagree. Uh, here. Bear with me. I get a memo. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, the major issues that were raised by the city, um, they had different categories. The city raised different categories of issues uh, with the IRP. And I think the most important was to, I've addressed them in detail in the memo and the order does as well. But uh, the major ones uh, were under this category that uh, the city called, um, uh, let me see why they come, sorry. So I just have to get the part of my memo here. Um, that the city referred to as, I'm sorry, I'm, pardon me. I'm sorry, I just have the wrong memo in front of me. Here we go. The city referred to as um, uh, four broad areas of deficiency. The first is that uh, the city states that the IRP makes no mention of the New Mexico Community Solar Act, which will obviously be um, uh, a major part of the the picture, the resource picture, and the. Uh, and the um, trans transmission issue picture and distribution picture going forward. Um, uh, the second broad area of deficiency identified by the city concerns uh, planned retirements of generating units. The commission may recall that this has been an issue uh, between uh, the commission between EPE and its you know, the interveners. In various cases, there's even a there's a pending case for abandonment of the. Um, uh, Rio Grande uh, Unit 6 uh, plant um, uh, that's ongoing right now. The city argues that EPE's claimed need for resource additions is premised largely on planned retirements of existing gas fire generating units, uh, even though um, there's only one abandonment case that's been uh, filed and pending. Uh, the city states that there's a lack of, um, and the city also takes issue with the way those resources are represented on EPE's loads and resources tables. Uh, the city's point is that um, 
this uh, these uh, these uh, planned retirements uh, mentioned the IRP. Uh, I think the city believes they artificially create additional uh, demand for capacity uh, that may not actually be needed. Um, the third broad area of deficiency identified by the city is a lack of clarity as to how EPE plans to comply with the portfolio standards of the, the amended REA, uh, uh, the Renewable Energy Act. The city argues that the IRP does not make clear how renewable energy, gas, and nuclear generation are being credited toward those requirements. And uh, this gets into some issues of how RECs will be used, um, et cetera, but I, I won't get into all that detail. Um, and let me just, uh, a little out of the fourth. The fourth broad area of deficiency uh, identified by the city is that EPE's 2021 IRP uh, action plan, there's a four-year action plan, of course, that accompanies a, an IRP, uh, they say is cursory at best and mainly recites what's already been in other findings by the commission. Um, and then the city also mentions that there, uh, they actually sort of accuses the EPE of failing to disclose the fact that the company issued a request for, uh, for uh, proposals, an RFP, for New Mexico resources on August 10th of this year. The city describes the RFP as referring to short-term short capacity needs, uh, 40 megawatts relating to EPE's termination of use of the Palo Verde uh, Nuclear Unit 3 um, as per the recent rate case. Rate case. Um, and that the RFP specifies that uh, along with the capacity need, EPE requires a long-term resource of approximately 175,000 megawatt hours of additional renewable energy uh, resources online by December 2024. Uh, that's the description of this RFP that the city is stating that EPE hasn't described in its RFP. Um, this gets into an issue of uh, what level of detail is needed in IRPs. Uh, I think that as the commission is well aware, there's an IRP rulemaking process uh, that's going on uh, where the commission may consider uh, including more specific requirements with regard to uh, requests for proposals, but currently in the IRP, uh, it's, it's a more general um, modeling based on types of resources, and then the RFPs generally are, um, are not addressed in detail as to exactly what the specifications will be, um, which is one reason why uh, staff rejects some of the uh, some of the city's arguments based about based upon uh, its its issues with the RFPs and that uh, the city says uh, or the staff says that those issues really go to whether it's a, to what to include in a new rule because the rule currently doesn't require that kind of specificity and doesn't really provide the opportunity for uh, the commission. Um, to interject on those issues as, as much, the specific design of an RFP. Um, so let me I'll just quickly talk, uh, discuss EPE's um, responses to the city's uh, four areas of broad concern or four broad areas of deficiency. Um, let's see. Um, concerning the issue of uh, the IRP's assumption of, of generation unit retirements, I think mostly gas, gas uh, unit retirements, EPE counters that neither the IRP rule nor any commission order prevents a utility from including in modeling a planned unit retirement that has not yet been approved by the commission. Uh, EPE states that it will file for abandonment uh, approval prior to removing any unit from, ser from service consistent with the statute and with EPE's uh, uh, currently ongoing pending case before the commission 20 and 20 194 UT, that's of the Rio Grande Unit 6 abandonment. So basically, the EPE is saying we can include these planned retirements in our, uh, in our plan. This is a 20 year plan uh, without you know, having a, a pending uh, abandonment case, which I, I think makes sense. Um, with regard to the city's contention that the IRP lacks a, a clear statement with regard to its assumption, the EPE's assumptions about an approach to compliance with the RPS requirements. Um, EPA actually go, goes through a number of clear statements, what they call clear statements from the IRP. Um, this goes into, again, like I said, I won't go into detail here about how RECs would be used um, and how certain assumptions um, and, ex and exceptions and exemptions that are provided in the ETA with regard to um, existing, existing 
gas units, existing non-compliant units, how they, how exactly those will be dealt with. Um, uh, EPA basically is saying we've we've required we've uh, have made some clear statements to the extent that they can uh, given um, you know the twenty year a twenty year outlook. Um, EP goes on to address the city's argument that EP should be required to explain why separate jurisdictional RFPs are in the public interest. Um, as I said, both the city and Merrily Souls uh, actually agree with the, the portfolio, this system wide uh, allocation, except for um, uh, you know, the 80 20 allocation for any new resources, except for any new gas resources. They agree with that. But uh, the city has um, problems with how the EP wants to carry that out in terms of RFPs. And uh, uh, especially that EP plans to do separate RFPs for Texas and New Mexico to, uh, to arrive at that portfolio. EP states that recent New Mexico requests for system resource approval have been opposed and denied by the PRC. Oh, I'm sorry, EPE states that. EPE further states that because EPE must also comply with the Texas resource procurement requirements, a separate RFP process allows EPE to meet regulatory requirements in both jurisdictions. Um, EPE adds that importantly, the recommended approach will separate jurisdictional RFPs uh, with, with separate jurisdictional RFPs still assumes a system-wide optimal dispatch as modeled in the particular preferred scenario, the least cost uh, plus REA uh, compliance scenario. Um, so those will be available the resources will be available uh, to both jurisdictions, but there'll be separate, separate RFPs to ensure um, that the, uh, so that each RFP can be tailored to the requirements of each jurisdiction. So Russell, um, this yes. is Steve. Um, you know, I, uh, if you want to optimize system-wide, I don't know, it, it, I, it seems to me the argument that the city and Mary Lee Souls are making makes sense. I don't think we have to resolve it as part of this RFP, um, but maybe we could um, note as a commission that um, we'll study the issue a little bit further um, to find out if you really truly can optimize, because um, I, I see where they're coming from and the logic of the argument, um, but there might be counter arguments that I'm not aware of. So it, it's just worth more explore, exploration. Uh, and Mr. Chair, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, would you want to include uh, language in the proposed order that uh, specifically refers to that, or do you just want to raise? Well, I think it? we could, you know, put in the specific order. Yeah, you, know, uh, you know, I think the idea of the uh, um, community solar not being included in there, um, we can just ask for, you know, a plan update a year from now, um, once we have the uh, rule in place for community solar. Um, where they can just do an update. And even under the current rule, where there are changes in circumstances, they're supposed to be updating the IRP, I believe. Am I correct in that? Yes. Yeah. So maybe we can just under that, and that way we're not turning it into a huge burdensome thing. Um, and we're not spending a lot of time litigating an RFP where uh, we have a pending rule change in place. And uh, we should you know, do our litigating after that's in place, not now. Okay. Um, oh, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the the uh, community solar issue because um, the EP did have a response to that. They say that they uh, that their that the IRP does not disregard uh, community solar. That let me just find a precise answer here. Um, that they actually take it into account. Let me just find where they take it into account. Uh, sorry about that. I just have to find this in the order. I have a lot of things in this memo that I'm not addressing just because I wanted to stay on the main points. So, yep. uh, well, I don't, I'm not finding exactly the part, but I recall that uh, this, the um, EP stated that in their planning and their modeling, they actually included uh, what, we, what they expect, what they anticipate will be the allocation of the overall 200 megawatt cap for the state uh, mm -hmm. for community solar. Their allocation, I think they expect it to be 20 or 30 based on, I mean, obviously the rule hasn't, hasn't been adopted yet, so it's unknown at this point, but 
um, based on uh, the allocation, I think in the proposed rule, there's 20 or 30, uh, whichever number that is, they've actually did include that in their modeling, they say. Oh, okay. uh, so even, there, even though there isn't express, it isn't a discussion of it, they say they actually haven't have modeled that. Okay, um, so the one piece there would be that it might be an update to their short-term action plan. Yes, I think a year so. from now. So that's what I'm thinking. And again, this is not asking for, you know, reams of stuff. It's just asking for a little more detail as things unfold. Yes. Um, yes. And I think and, it should be written that way to be sure, because I'm, I'm not trying to create work here. I just want to be sure that the bases were covered. That makes perfect sense, especially since we'll, we will, of course, have a rule in place by then. I actually found in my memo where it discusses it. EPE states that acting upon an assumption that 30 megawatts of community solar project nameplate capacity of the, total, total, of the statewide total cap of 200 megawatts will be allocated to EPE, the IRP incorporates 30 megawatts of distributed energy, of DG, and the IRP's high DG saturation sensitivity. <laughs> so as part of the modeling. So, yeah. um, so it does, a, they did express that. So, and then just getting to staff's recommendation, like I said, staff um, mostly found that, that what, what um, the city and, and, and Ms. Uh, Marilee Souls were asking for were things that are not specifically required by the IRP rule as it currently stands. And so they didn't find those to be deficiencies. The IR, uh, staff did find a deficiency with regard to um, uh, something they were unable to locate, which is uh, capital cost information for existing resources. Uh, that's something that's specifically required by 17.7.3.9 C4 of the IRP rule. And so that was the only difference <coughs> the staff found. And my proposed order would state, um, would uh, adopt that and would provide... Um, uh, it would accept the IR, they would have the commission accept the IRP on the condition that EPE file an amendment or supplement to the IRP, correcting that deficiency on or before January 7th. It gives them a month. So it seems like a sufficient amount of time for this particular deficiency, which doesn't seem, doesn't require different planning or something like that. Just an identification of the, of the portion of costs of uh, existing resources that are considered capital costs as opposed to expenses. So, um, and then uh, Mr. Chairman, if you want the, to discuss the specific language to add, uh, we're talking about uh, planned, uh, setting a date for a planned update. Um, and then was there a particular language you wanted to include about the Community Solar uh, Act and also the, um, the uh, RFP issue or? Um, yeah, just to uh, include um, a, uh, and you can do the wordsmithing and if, if the rest of the commission is okay with it, okay. Uh, just run it by me uh, tomorrow, send me a note for approval. Uh, but basically that it should include uh, a little more analysis of the RFP issue, what indeed is the best way to do it, and um, uh, an update on the community solar um, projects and that's not due till the end of next year. Okay. Till stuff, you know, till stuff develops. And again, it's not to create a lot of work. It's just to keep the commission informed. Okay. And I, and I wanted to say that um, hearing from folks down there who participated in the IRP process, um, that's been famously contentious in the past. Uh, this time around with the new um, CEO in place, uh, there were complaints from the community about the process and they responded and brought E3 on board. And um, the folks who participated in the plan were very happy with EP and the way they participated. So I wanted to thank EPE for the steps forward they're making in terms of working with the community on the IRP. It's certainly going in the right direction. And uh, I just wanted to say, uh, at least for me, it's much appreciated. Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner Hall. Well, that sounds like a good development. I'm glad to hear that. I wanted to ask a little bit more. What What's the issue? What was the language or the, what was their concern about the um, RFP that you wanted some more language about? I mean, I, I guess they're talking, you were, it was the issue of having to issue two different RFPs for two different jurisdictions. 
Yeah, because, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of ways to look at it. But if you do, if you really want to optimize across the whole system, you want to model the whole system. And um, True. so True. if you're issuing separate RFPs, um, there are a whole bunch of questions occur. Um, are those RFPs um, different in form because of the different jurisdictions? Does that confuse how you evaluated the different responses to the RFP? Um, if you've divided it in two, have you predetermined resources when maybe you should be doing an all source? Um, how's all that stuff get impacted? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think it's rocket science. I just think people need to discuss it a little further and be sure they're all, we're all comfortable with it. Oh, I don't either. Um, but I, I was just curious about what your thoughts were more in detail, but you just told me, so it's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, I understand, I get it. It does seem, I mean, it, it seems to raise a lot of questions really. Uh, it makes me wonder how, how they operate their system, uh, but whatever, we can talk about it another day. Yeah. So. It, it's worth spending a few hours on to be sure that we get it right and people are right. Ready. Right. Okay. Well, I don't have anything to add. So uh, if, if there are any other questions, I'll I can answer questions. But um, that's all I had. So, Mr. Chair, do you intend for Russell to bring this back to us tomorrow morning, then, or what? What's uh, we can take a vote now if we like. Well, and I think um, uh, Commissioner Hall. Uh, you could, as part of this, uh, if someone wants to make a motion to adopt this with that change, it could be that uh, you delegate uh, the authority to Commissioner Fishman just for this one portion of the of the order about you know, what the contents of, of an update, a one year update will be. And then uh, that would just be part of the vote. And then I could then it would just be resolved with Commissioner Fishman tomorrow. Well, it's yeah. And it's two sentences and I just run it by the commissioners. At the same time, I run it by Russell, so everyone would see it. Well, fine. I'll make that motion. I move to approve the order with the um, addition of the provisions that Commissioner Fishman has described. Second. I'll second. If there's no further discussion, let's get this off our list. Mike, please take the roll. Commissioner Hall. Hi. Commissioner Byrd. Aye. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Commissioner Vicente Aguilar. Aye. Commissioner Fishman. Aye. And I want to say thank you to El Paso Electric once again. It's a real step forward. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. I'd like to make a motion to go into recess and reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.30. I'll second that. <laughs> I'll second. Everybody at once. I think you already got the vote. You got a motion in four seconds. Mike, please take the roll. Uh, just for, for strict purposes, this is a motion to reconvene um, pursuant to section 1015.1G um, of the Open Meetings Act. Um, I'll take the vote, Commissioner. And it's uh, to reconvene at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Um, Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Bessenti Aguilar. Aye. Commissioner Bird. Nay. <laughs> You're just a contrarian. Commissioner Fisher. One at seven thirty. Okay, you do that. Yeah, you know. Make the coffee. I'm, I'm going to go nay just to give Jeff some company. Sometimes he needs it. Let's go. More votes. Commissioner Maestas. Aye. Okay, three to two. <laughs> and thank, thanks to Mr. Maderos. For your patience. Poor guy's been waiting. To... Yeah, and thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Maderos, for, for rescheduling his oh. day tomorrow for us as yeah. well. That was his day. Well, he had a bit of a heads up. And a final thank you to, um, uh, uh, to uh, hearing examiner Shanauer who just exhibited uh, lots of independence and courage and thoughtful analysis. And we really appreciate it. Um, all that the HEs do for this agency 
They are terrific. Ditto there. Uh, okay. Agreed. Agreed. Saved ours. That was good. Okay. Good night, all. Good night. See you in the morning. Good night. Yeah, that'll be fine.